Well, Mike, 21 Q and A's. Hard to believe. You. So I know you, I say that every time, yeah, but it's you, true. <laughs> you got your thinking cap on. I hope you ready. Yeah. 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 Let's, let's jump in here and take a whack at it. All right. Sounds good. Well, our first one's actually going to come from Pastor John in Florida at the Calvary Chapel oh, okay. side. So his question is, do you think Reuben, Gad, and a half of Manasseh have gotten a bad rap by the Bible teachers when in fact they were fulfilling what God wanted done, occupying land from the divine council rebels? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, this, I, I, I would agree. And for, for listeners, this, the context of this kind of question is going to be, you know, well, they they were doing conquest stuff on the other side of the Jordan, what academically we call the Trans Jordan, so not Canaan proper. And so there there is some discussion, and you know, the, the the tribes do sort of get beat up on by certain you know Bible teachers for either either wanting land on the other side or you know engaging in conquest on the other side. But you know, God clearly. Uh, helps them in the conquest. I mean, they 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 get approval from God. You know, God never steps in and says, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" You know, wait a minute. You know, you're not you're not supposed to be doing this. And you know, I'm I'm not going to bless you. I'm going to let you you know get destroyed. You know, kind of like the the incident at at I or AI as we like to say it. I mean, there's nothing like that that ever happens. Uh, so I think yeah, they they do get a bad rap. There's clearly a purpose in it. You know, the elimination of the Rephaim, the Anakim, and you know. That actually isn't new. I mean, if you go back and read Deuteronomy 2 and 3, it's very clear that Israel's relatives, Jacob's relatives, and, and therefore, guess what? Abraham's relatives have been uh, eliminating the giant clans in the Transjordan long before the conquest, you know, long before Joshua and Moses ever get there. I mean, you, you read about that with the Amim and the, the Zamzumim and you know, some of the other names for the giant clans. They're in the Transjordan, and, and the text very clearly says that you know, the descendants of Esau and, you know, of course, Lot, and the, the Moabites and the Ammonites, they, they've been, you know, ridding the land of, of these bloodlines, these, um, these descendants of the Nephilim for a long time. So, you know, what Israel's doing, what, you know, the, the Jacobites or the Israelites, when they finally get there, they're, they're doing the same thing. And, and, you know, God says in Deuteronomy 2 and 3 that he was behind the elimination of the giant clans earlier by other relatives of Israel and, and therefore Abraham. So it's actually, you know, pretty, pretty consistent to me that alone. Again, what, what we read in Deuteronomy two, two and three, that alone settles the question. You know, God wouldn't have had this agenda. He wouldn't have given them victory if they were doing something wrong. Um, uh, we should say something though about geography. This really sort of gets us into the problem. The issue might be a better way to say it of, what are the boundaries of the promised land? And I've, I've commented before on other episodes that the, the descriptions of the boundaries of the land are not consistent uh, in, in the Torah and in other places too. You, you'll, you'll get what's promised described in slightly different ways. And in some passages, you'll actually get descriptions that could be read in more than one way. And I think that's actually a, a factor here. I mean, most people assume the descriptions of the land forbid any part of the Transjordan from being included. That that really isn't the case. You know, Moses and Joshua are told by God, you know, not to harass, you know, certain regions uh, in the Transjordan, south of the northern part, but you know, south of Bashan, where where Moses and you know ends up with with Og and Sihon, the the two Amorite kings there. So there, you know, Moses and Joshua were told, you know, hey, hey, you go over the Transjordan, don't harass the people in Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Uh, Edom already belonged to Jacob's brother, you know, the Esau and, and his people, which means it had been given by God to Abraham's seed, because Esau, because he's a brother, you know, of Jacob, is part of Abraham's seed. I mean, he he's not part of the line of promise, but he's still descended from Abraham. Remember, God had promised Abraham and his seed a land in Genesis 12.1. And if you go back to Genesis 12.1, there's no boundaries. There are no boundaries given there. It, it just says, now the Lord you know, said to Abram, go from your country, you know, get out of here, you and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Well, again, it's kind of open-ended. And when you get to Genesis 15, the conversation you know, sort of narrows to Jacob's line, you know, to the 
the quote unquote line of promise because there's a reference in Genesis 15 when the, the land is described. I might, I might as well just direct people there. Genesis 15, 18 says, on, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And, you know, we, we get some, you know, some, some dimensions there, but that conversation, you know, had been prefaced earlier, like in verse 13, where the Lord you know, says to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojour- sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. Again, it's a reference to Egypt. So, so we know in Genesis 15, we're talking about the descendants of Jacob, the, you know, the, the Israelites proper, the, the promised line. But earlier, again, it was, you didn't have that, that restriction. It's just Abraham's seed, generally. Is going to have a land. And here in Genesis 15, it narrows it a little bit. That's the kind of thing you're dealing with. Like, like when, when you get these statements about the land, you know, what, what group of Abraham's seed are we talking about? How do we understand the dimensions of the land? Um, the whole region is going to be possessed by Abraham's seed broadly. And so we might need to rethink what we, what we mean by promised land in that sense. In other words, do we restrict promised land to just Jacob's line, the, the Israel, Israel's line, or do we widen promised land to Abraham's descendants, just you know, generally? So that, that's an issue there. And, and again, it, it gets complicated because, you know, like with Esau, they settle in the Transjordan, and of course, later on, you know, you, you, have, you bring the Ishmael thing into here, and and those people are are settling in the in the same region, but historically, again, that region becomes populated by by people who adopt different religions, like like Islam. Okay, going they they want to go back to to Ishmael as as the uh, descendants of Abraham. It, it it I don't want to get too far afield in this, but it's not it's not so neat because Islam is a religion; it's not an ethnic group. So you, you've got a, a difficulty there in, in kind of parsing how to think about the land and who possesses it and, and Abraham's seed and all this sort of thing. But the reality is that Abraham's seed is the original touch point of the promise about land. It's not just in Genesis 12. It's not narrowed to a specific part, a specific portion of those who would descend from Abraham. Later on, it, it, it does, and it is. Let, let's talk a little bit before we leave this about the, some of the passages and how, how we even understand the parameters. You know, somebody might say, well, you know, the Israelites in the conquest are Jacob's seed. That's, that's how we should think about this. And so they shouldn't have taken the northern Transjordan anyway because of the parameters of Genesis 15, 18. This is where the discussion is going to go. But you have to look at what the verse says. Genesis fifteen eighteen. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, "To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates." And then it's the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites. Oh, wait a minute, boy! You know, if, if you're getting the Hittites in there and the Kenites again, depending on where you put them, the Perizzites and the Rephaim. Wait a minute, holy! You know, now now we've got Rephaim. You know, in the Transjordan, we've got the the Kenites. You know, also can be put in the Transjordan. We've got the Hittites that are really, really far north, you know? I mean, what do we do with this? It's not as neat of a picture as people, you know, critics of the Transjordanian tribal conquest paint. It just isn't. You know, if you look at the verse, it, it, it sounds like, you know, river of Egypt, great river, the river Euphrates, those are essentially northern and southern boundary points. But again, the Hittites, I mean, that's going to put you up into Anatolia. That's actually, you know, wider or, or further north than, than the Euphrates. So what do we do with that? You know, oh, is it Hittites living somewhere else? Again, it's just not so neat. And, you know, and we tend to read these passages with a preconceived notion based on the tribal allotments. But again, you know, does that really help? Because the tribal allotments include the Transjordan. I mean, how, how, do, we, how do we know we're, we're looking clearly at what was intended? There's there's a wild card here. If you read Deuteronomy 11:24, okay, if you go to Deuteronomy 11:24, it says this, every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Again, this is this is the Mosaic era, you know, the, the, what what the context is here. 
every place on which the sole of your foot, you know, Moses, the Israelites, you, you know, every place that the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your territory shall be from the wilderness, which is, again, of course, in the south, to the Lebanon, which again is the north, and from the river, apparently this river in Egypt back in Genesis 15, and the river Euphrates to the western sea. Now, now the last, the, the, the kicker here, the wild card is that last part. The wilderness to Lebanon, that's a north-south set of parameters, very obviously. And then the river, again, you know, is that Egypt or not? Well, if, if you take the river, comma, like some English translations have, the river Euphrates, okay, then we're not dealing with the river of Egypt. Then we're talking about the river Euphrates. And then it says to the Western Sea. Well, if the other two things, the wilderness and the Lebanon, are north and south, that means that the Euphrates and the Western Sea are east and west boundaries. That means that the Euphrates is not maybe or exclusively to be read as a northern boundary, but rather an eastern boundary. And if that's the case, the Transjordan is obviously included. Okay, so what I'm getting at here is this picture that people think, you know, people think they know what the land of the promise is and, and, and the conquest parameters are supposed to be. And they think this is a neat picture. It is not. It just isn't. There's really no other way to say it. You know, it, it could very well easily, based on Deuteronomy 11.24, the Euphrates could be a, a, an eastern boundary, and maybe it's supposed to be a northern and an eastern boundary. But then, what, again, what do you do with the Hittites? What about the Kenites and, and when it comes to the southern part of it? it, it it's just not a neat picture. So I think it's wrong-headed generally, you know, just to criticize these, these tribes in the Transjordan. And people who do so, I think, do so naively. I mean, if, if I could just, just say it that way, because— there are inherent ambiguities and interpretive difficulties here when it comes to the geographical parameters of the land. And I'd, I'd also, I'm not going to go into it, but I'd also say I think Genesis 13, 14 is a factor here too. You know, the Lord said to Abram, I'll just read the verse, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. You know, in other words, that's, that's going to be your land. Well, are we really supposed to assume, again, like we know where he's standing, Let's say he's standing again near the the Dead Sea or something like that. You know that because Genesis 14 is going to take us into that area when when Abraham has to confront you know the the confederation you know when Lot gets kidnapped. So in other words, in other words, when he looked north, he he was looking straight up the Jordan River and only looking to the left. He wasn't you know he couldn't see or he refused to look at the Transjordan. That's just absurd. It's just absurd. You know, then the question, well, how far east could he see? You know, in other words, what, what does the verse like that really mean? How does it factor into how we think about the promised land? Again, just, just to wrap up this question, this is not a neat picture. And so criticisms levied at the tribes based upon what people think is a neat picture are just not good criticisms. All right, Chris has two questions, and his first one is, is there a middle place besides the idea of purgatory for those who never heard the gospel? Yeah, boy, I, I'm not quite sure what's intended besides the idea of purgatory. In other words, as a substitute for purgatory or in addition to purgatory. I don't, I don't really know how to how to read this question, but I'll I'll just throw something out here. I, you know, I, I don't believe that there's biblical evidence for purgatory if what's in view of that is the Roman Catholic idea. In other words, this place where you go where the dead go before the final, you know, resurrection and judgment so that they can kind of work off or become more deserving, you know, get their sins taken care of and you get, get they, they, they're, there's some sort of temporary punishment for sins that, that will, the result of which will enable you to have eternal life. I, I think that's a bogus idea that's contrary to the gospel. Um, the go- the sin, your sins were judged at the cross, period. Um, you know, this idea of purgation, as, as part of a process to wind up in heaven, I think is inherently unbiblical. So if that's what we're talking about, then, you know, okay, then, you know, I, I guess my answer in part is no. But if, if, what, if what we're talking about, if, if the question means, is there a place where the dead go before the final resurrection and judgment that could be either positive or negative, just generally, and it has nothing to do with purgation to, to get you more fitted for heaven, 
then I would think, yeah, you know, that, that idea is, is found in scripture. You know, you have like Luke 16, I mean, whether it's a parable or not, the, 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 the content of the parable is this, this intermediate state, Abraham's bosom, you know, and there, then there are other phrases, you know, that, that go with, you know, when you, when you die, you go to, you know, someplace you go to, you know, you, you cross over to the, 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 the supernatural, the spiritual realm where you are, you know, until, you know, the final judgment. And, and we, if we looked at Luke 16, and again, we don't have to restrict our discussion, Luke 16, in the, in the second temple period, there's a lot of this kind of talk where there's this, there's this intermediate place. There's this place in the spiritual world where the righteous go and the unrighteous go. And then at the end, everybody's resurrected and, and the situation is more or less made permanent. Okay. If that's what we're talking about, well, again, I think there's, there's some scriptural, you know, justification for some sort of intermediate state. Um, so I, I, you know, the, the, I think, I think there was part of the question about what about those who've never heard the gospel? Is that correct? That's part of the question. No, the next one is in the beginning of Romans, what is Paul okay. expecting people to understand from what nature reveals? And in what way does this understanding lead to salvation for those to whom the gospel was never preached? Oh, okay. Well, I, I, well, we'll we'll take that now. And it, it does relate to this purgatory idea because of, of where you end up when you die, you know that sort of thing. Paul never says that what he describes in Romans one is sufficient for salvation. He never makes that claim. It, it, it's not sufficient. It, it, he's talking about knowledge about God and, of course, God's nature. Of course, part of God's nature is you know you both judgment and also mercy. I mean, you, you learn things about God, you know, from the creation, but. What you don't learn is the is the plan of salvation. Now, I would say though, with this question, and then you know, really any question about you know what happens, you know, when when people die, and specifically, what if they never heard the gospel? My my view of this is that we need to look to the Old Testament for for some precedent here in in terms of what might be the case, you know, what might be the possibility. For instance, you know, you have. You have people in the Old Testament who are accepted by God and considered examples of faith that don't know the first thing about the cross, because the cross hadn't happened yet. And some of those people are Gentiles and pagans who have no knowledge of the Torah, you know, the law, the, the Jewish festivals, the sacrificial system. They, don't, they, don't, they not only don't have knowledge of that, they have no access to it, but they're still considered Again, examples of faith by Jesus himself. I think Jesus is a good authority here. Um, what I'm talking about, I don't know if, I'm trying to remember, was this posted in Facebook or something? A couple of weeks ago, I actually was was asked, I wanted, I wanted to say aloud, <laughs> but I was actually asked, you know, to, to be pulpit fill, you know, at my church. It's the second time I've spoken on a Sunday morning since 2004. Um, ho- hopefully, if, if people watch the video, they didn't conclude by that. Well, we can see why. Um, but I, my my sermon, my message was on Naaman, uh, specifically, you know, the Naaman story. But we are we're familiar with that story because of unseen realm stuff. And I didn't do cosmic geography. I wanted to focus on on him as a person because Naaman is referenced in the New Testament one time. And it's the it's connected to the incident where you know Jesus goes into the synagogue at Nazareth and reads and and whatnot at the beginning of his ministry and he actually uses again to to cut to the chase here people can can uh, you know look for the uh, for the sermon I, I think it was posted in Facebook uh, if not we'll we'll say something about it again or I'll I'll put something on the blog about it because I didn't post on the blog about it at all but Naaman is referenced by Jesus along with the widow of Zarephath as examples of faith. In other words, he gets into this conversation with the Pharisees and the Pharisees are like, yeah, show us some spectacular stuff. Do some miracles here, dude. And it's the, Jesus marvels at their unbelief and basically says, well, that's not going to happen here because of your unbelief. And then he says, Hey, you know, there was, there was only one widow, you know, in all Israel among all those other, you know, widows that, that actually, was blessed by God, and, and and you know it's the widow of Zarephath, and, and only Naaman, you know the Syrian, you know, same thing. And what these two individuals have in common is that they the, the the reason why Jesus holds them out to contrast them with the Pharisees who who are unbelieving and who lack faith is because of what they do. You go back to the Naaman story, and he says, you know, after he's cleansed, he he goes, now I know that there's. You know the true God is right here in Israel. I'm not going to sacrifice to any other deity. 
I got to go back to Syria, but I'm going to, I'm going to take some dirt with me, you know, and, and he's going to build his own little altar and he's going to do his, what, whatever he imagines in his head that he's supposed to do to sacrifice to Yahweh. It's very clear that his believing loyalty is aligned to Yahweh and no other. But that is, that is the entirety of what he knows and what he responds to. He will never be circumcised. He will never observe the Sabbath. He'll never read the Torah. He'll never participate in a Jewish ritual you know, on the calendar. He won't do anything. He brings nothing to the table except his simple belief that Yahweh is the God of all gods, and he will worship no other. The widow at Zarephath is held up as an example. Why? Because she believes the word of the prophet you know, about making the little cake, you know, and, and, and the oil never runs out and all that. She believes. She believes in a very simple thing that, that, that this is God's prophet and God will do what he said through the prophet. She believes. And she's held up by Jesus as an example with Naaman of the faith. Zarephath is in, you know, Phoenician territory. These are both pagans. They have no connection to the law. They have no knowledge. They have no theology. The only thing they have is their faith in the God of Israel, period. Now, if Jesus accepts them and Jesus holds them out as examples of what he'd like to see among the people, I would suggest to you that they are, quote, believers. Okay, they're, they're accepted by God. We're going to meet them in heaven. But they don't know, they not only don't know anything about the cross, they, don't, they basically know almost nothing. But yet, and here's the key, and here's why I bring up the, the Old Testament precedent, they respond correctly to the information that God gave them. And so when it comes to this whole question about, you know, what happens to people who've never heard the gospel? Well, the short answer is we don't really know because we don't really know the entire circumstance. Maybe the Spirit of God or God or, you know, through some other intervention actually gave them revelation of something. Maybe it was, maybe it was as simple as Romans 1, which, which isn't the gospel. But God knows if they responded in faith the way he wanted them to respond. And if he accepted individuals in the Old Testament period on that basis, I see no reason to conclude that he can't do it again and won't do it again and hasn't done it since then. So there are people who are considered believers who will be in heaven, who, who have never heard the gospel. This is up to God to decide. The, the one thing that they, are, are, they all are going to have in common is they, their believing loyalty is aligned to the correct God, to the true God, and no other. And, you know, and they're not also choosing to have no God at all, you know, the, the, the whole atheist thing. I mean, that's what, that's what everybody's going to have in heaven. So I, I think we need to, to think about this question in the context of Old Testament precedent and leave it up to God. So that, that's how I approach you know, that whole set of ideas there. David in the UK is curious as to the ESV's use of the word host in Exodus. In Mike's opinion, does this refer to simply Israel as an army? Yeah, I mean, Tzava, host, um, can refer to multitudes of several things, multitudes of humans, multitudes of animals, multitudes of divine beings, you know, the heavenly host, that sort of thing. It really depends on context. You know, the, the, the context is going to dictate which host you're talking about. And in, in Exodus 6, you know, 6, 7, 12, I think it's pretty clear that we're talking about hosts of people. For instance, in Exodus 6.26, these are the Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their hosts. Okay, it's their hosts. It's the people of Israel's hosts. It's not the Lord's hosts. You, you get the idea. You know, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, and the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. So, he doesn't say, and that's Exodus 7, 4, it doesn't say that my hosts will be the catalyst to bringing out the people, like there's going to be some cosmic battle here that, you know, you have angelic hosts, you know, pouring down out of the skies, you know, so that Israel can escape out of Egypt. No, it says, he's going to bring my hosts, my people, and the children of Israel. I mean, these are, these are three concatenated uh, phrases that refer to the same thing, out of the land, 
bringing my hosts out of the land. Well, what hosts were brought out of the land? Well, that was the people. So I, I think we just need to to look at the context uh, in which the term occurs and and make our judgments from there. You know, words words don't mean anything in and of themselves. Words have meaning based on used to, usage in context. Heath is wondering what Mike's thoughts are on the eternal sonship doctrine. Yeah, I think the best way to answer this is I don't believe in adoptionist Christology. So, you know, Godhead thinking is clear to me uh, in the Old Testament. You know, you have the binatarian thing. Once you understand binatarianism, you're going to see places where the spirit is brought into the discussion. You're going to see the spirit talked about in similar ways that the second Yahweh figure is talked about. And if we have a Godhead, that means you have three persons who are co-eternal. So I would be in the the e- eternal you know, sonship. I'm trying to remember what the terminology was here exactly, eternal sonship, because eternal sonship is related to but not the same as the eternal subordination, you know, subordinationism or not. So without you know, going down too many rabbit trails here, I think the best way to just answer this question is I don't believe in adoptionist Christology. Uh, Godhead thinking is clear to me in the Old Testament. And if that's the case, you know, when it gets carried over to the New Testament where Jesus is the second Yahweh figure and then the Spirit is but isn't Jesus, there you have your three, you have Trinitarianism. You don't need an adoptionist model in the New Testament if you have Godhead thinking go all the way back into the Old Testament. Heath's second question is, if a binatarian accepts the Orthodox Trinitarian's view of the Father and Son, but differs on the personality of the Holy Spirit, would a Trinitarian still be able to view that binatarian as a brother in Christ? Well, I'm going to assume here that when he says differs on the personality of the Holy Spirit, that what he means is doesn't think the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead. That, that's, a, that's actually a different question than whether the Holy Spirit is a person or not. But I think that's probably what the question intends. Um, so let, let's say, can, can a person who's binatarian and not Trinitarian, uh, Trinitarian you know, still be considered a, a brother in Christ or something like that? that that's what I'm hearing in the question. Uh, I, I would say, um, I think that failure to see the three in one in Scripture is just that. It's a failure. You know, again, once you understand binatarianism, Trinitarianism derives from two trajectories, essentially. You know, you've got two powers language applied to the spirit. In other words, the spirit is brought into the discussion and again, not made precisely and, and totally distinct from the other two, but the spirit is talked about in the same ways in particular as the second Yahweh figure gets talked about, minus the embodiment. But there's this blurring of the spirit. The spirit is brought into the conversation, as it, as it were, with the invisible Yahweh and the visible Yahweh, you know, the anthropomorphized Yahweh, and they are interchanged. I mean, that, that's one trajectory. And then second, seeing how Jesus is the second Yahweh figure, the second person, and then noting how the New Testament identifies the spirit with him, with Jesus in certain passages. You know, and, and I talk about this in un, Unseen Realm a lot, where at least, at least I spent a couple pages on it. You have passages where the Spirit of God, the phrase the Spirit of God, occurs in tandem with the Spirit of Jesus or the Spirit of Christ. Okay, it's, it's, it's the same person. You have Paul say on two occasions he refers to Jesus as the Lord, who is the Spirit. So you have this sense that, that just as Jesus is but isn't God, okay, he's the Son, he's not the Father, but but they're still the same. You know, it, Again, th- this whole... Godhead talk that we're used to that is also, again, used to be part of Judaism because of the two powers issue. So Jesus is God, but he also isn't the Father. Well, the Spirit is but isn't Jesus. And 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 once you see how you know Jesus is the focal point for both the Father and the Spirit, that's where actually where Trinitarianism derives from. So I I think the failure to see that is just you know, kind of not knowing your Bible well enough, or, or or maybe not knowing what you're looking at might be a better way to put it, because the, typically the way Trinitarianism is talked about, it, it's proof texted. And I think we, we're much better off, you know, to go beyond proof texting. But again, having said all that, if people can't see that, they aren't damned, okay? 
since salvation isn't about the ability to articulate theology. Not, not just theology of the Trinity, but theology on a whole, a whole bunch of things. Romans 5.8 doesn't say that Christ died for us while we were articulating Trinitarianism correctly, or on the condition that we successfully articulated a Trinitarian theology. It doesn't say that at all. John 3.16 doesn't say, whosoever believes, or it, it, says, it, it says, whosoever believes in Christ, again, the one God gave to be the Savior of the world, you know, will be saved. It, it, it doesn't say you know, that whosoever understands how to navigate adoptionism, eternal sonship, subordination. It, it doesn't say any of that. You know, brother in Christ, which was part of the question, is a phrase used to believers, those who put their entire hope of eternal life and forgiveness of sin, integrating no merit of their own on the work of Christ on the cross. That, that's what makes you a believer. And, and it's, it's, an, it's an exclusive thing. There are no multiple roads to salvation. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You know, no one comes to the Father except through me. You know, he, he, he doesn't say, you can get through me once I, I hear you successfully articulate Trinitarian theology. It, it, it just doesn't say that. You can get lots of doctrines wrong and still believe that there is no other means of salvation. In other words, you can believe the correct object of salvation, and you can, and you, you can believe the necessity of of believing in that object of salvation and still not be able to articulate very well how it all works or why we need the incarnation or, or, or why there is a Godhead. You, th- those are related, but distinct things. Okay. They're, they're not, you, you can't exchange understanding of the Trinity with belief in the gospel th- that you can't swap those in and out and have the same result. You can, have, you can have someone who can articulate Trinitarianism perfectly, and if they don't believe that Christ is the lone you know, way of salvation and put their trust and faith in him, they're not a believer. They're a good theologian, but they're not a believer. These are not one-to-one exchangeable things. So, you know, they're not damned. I, I would say, you know, if you go back, you can find references to the Arians, again, back at the Nicene controversy, the losers, and they denied the eternality of the Son. You know, they believed there was a time when the Son was not. You know, they, so they didn't see Jesus as fully God, but nevertheless, they did see Jesus as the sole means of salvation, and they get referred to as brethren. I mean, there are places where that where that happens. They're they're not they're not considered non-believers. They're considered to have aberrant theology by the decision of the council. And I think we need to you know remember this and, and apply it to our own situations. Now, uh, you know, somebody might think of of you know First John. You know, John's talk about unbelievers not believing, quote, that Christ had come in the flesh. Okay, well, that, that really isn't about successfully articulating Trinitarianism. It's really about rejecting that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. Okay, the Messiah come, you know, uh, you know to, to deliver Israel. Um, if you look at 1 John 4, for instance, verses 2 and 3, you know, think about what, what this says. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Notice the two polar opposites. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Okay? Then how do you wind up being not from God? It doesn't say that every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not from God. That isn't what the verse says. It says every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. So this, this, you know, John's idea about Christ coming in the flesh is, is, is really about and ultimately about accepting that Jesus was the Messiah. Again, the Savior, the ones who, you know, who is, was sacrificed, who was given by God to take away the sins of the world, John 3, 16. If you reject that, okay, then that's not from God. You know, many Christians who would embrace the exclusivity of the gospel today wouldn't have a prayer of successfully articulating the subtleties of adoptionism, subordinationism, eternal sonship, et cetera. Hey, when I became a Christian, I didn't know about any of that. I wouldn't have had a prayer to, to have an intelligent discussion about any of that, but I understood what the gospel was and why I needed it, and that there was no other way of salvation. And I, I just think we, we need to, to keep some of these things in perspective. So no, they're not damned. You know, I think, I think they're incorrect in their theology, but these Trinitarianism is not one to one interchangeable with embracing the gospel. It just isn't.
So that, that would be the way I approach that, that whole question. Kevin in Cambodia wants to know what is the best way to answer those using verses primarily in the Old Testament to support the doctrine of soul sleep. Yeah, I, I would say passages in any testament, but of course you're going to have this in the old, that describe interaction, interactions of the dead with other dead or with the living. That, that's what you need to, you know, to, to find and, and, and sort of, at, at least I think initially, you know, focus on uh, the, the frequent descriptions. I mean, just think about it. You know, the, I, I would ask this question, you know, to be kind of blunt about it. What ancient Near Eastern culture has anything like soul sleep? I don't know of any. You know, Mesopotamia didn't, Egypt didn't. You know, the, the, this is not, this belief, this position is not part of the ancient Near Eastern world. It just isn't. And the Bible is part of that world. So, and this is why, you know, the, the, this belief that, that when, when you die, you have some sort of conscious existence with other people, other dead, and that you can interact with the living. This is common. This is ubiquitous in the ancient Near Eastern world. For example, in, in the, let's just go through some things randomly here in the Old Testament. You have frequent descriptions of dying as being gathered to one's people. Okay, or being gathered to your fathers. You know, you do get a few, you know, slept with the fathers, but that means you, again, it, it's a common idea that because of, of what you look at at a dead body, it's got its eyes closed, it looks like it's sleeping, so it was referred to as sleep. But you would bury people with things they would use or that, that you thought that they would, would need in the afterlife. And they were going to go to be with their fathers, with their ancestors. Any culture that buries anyone with things of use in life does so because it's expected that they will be using those things in the afterlife. And you're not using anything if you're asleep, is the point. This, this idea is foreign to the ancient Near East. And again, Israel is part of that. You know, Jacob tells his sons, I'm being gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron and the Hittite. Uh, you, you have this, this notion of, I'm expecting to be with my loved ones after I die. What, you're all going to be like asleep together? How would you even know that you're with your loved ones? And if, if you sort of intellectually figured, well, I'll be with my loved ones, but we're all going to be asleep. Well, really? Is that really what we're talking about here? Archaeological you know, discoveries contradict it quite a bit. Israel is like any of these other cultures. People are buried with things to use and to enjoy in the afterlife. That alone tells you that they don't believe in soul sleep. And it's ubiquitous in the ancient Near Eastern world. You get, you get other passages, Isaiah 14. Again, this is the, the Hillel passage. But if the, 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 the person who's described here, let, let's just, let me just go there. I'll just go to Isaiah 14 here. And let's go here to, oh, I don't know. Okay, verse 9. Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. It rouses the shades to meet you. Okay, well, those, those are just the non-human spirits. Really? Well, it, it continues. All who were leaders of the earth, it raises from their thrones. All who were kings of the nations. In other words, this, this diatribe that, again, you know, has a divine rebellion as the backdrop of it. This is why the king of Babylon is getting painted with his brush, you know, because of his arrogance. But basically, the prophet's saying, hey, king, you know, you're going to wind up in shield, and the other kings are going to be there, too. They're going to greet you. All of them will answer and say to you, oh, you're like one of us now. In other words, they're having a conversation in Sheol. Again, you don't do that when you're asleep. You know, you got Luke 16. There's a conversation in the after. I realize that's a New Testament one, but you, you get the same idea. Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah show up. What, did God just wake them up and say, hey, you know, wake up, guys. You got to show up on the mountain here. Then you can go back to sleep. No, it, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. How about contact with the dead being forbidden in the Old Testament? You know, and I realize that, you know, a lot of Christians, well, oh, that's just, you know, demons and spirits. No, actually, there is a difference in vocabulary. There, there, there are different terms for the human dead and the non-human dead. And you were not supposed to contact either, but specifically when, think of it this way, it can't be talking about contacting spirits because spirits don't die. When you are forbidden to contact the dead, you are forb forbidden from contacting the human dead. And prohibitions are not in the Old Testament for things you can't do. 
They're there for things that you can do and God doesn't want you to do. That's what Old Testament laws are about. Don't do this thing. And I, again, I have a whole paper about you know Old Testament divination and you know why these laws are, exist and so on and so forth. It's not that you know there, there, there are good reasons for them. God isn't just the cosmic killjoy here. I mean, you, when you contact something in the spirit world, okay, First Samuel twenty-eight, it, it's Samuel. What, the, the passage doesn't say. You know, Samuel says, "Why have you disturbed me?" He doesn't say, "Why did you wake me up?" It's an entirely different vocabulary term. Disturbed means just irritated me. You're irritating me, Saul. What, what, what's up? It doesn't say, hey, you woke me up, I was sleeping just fine. It, it, this whole idea of contacting the dead is not a reference to non-human spirits because non-human spirits aren't dead. They didn't die. Okay, Humans die and become part of the afterlife world, the spiritual world. So if you can contact the human dead – and you're not, you know, and we know that, that that you can because again, there's a whole range of other, you know, words here. You know, knowings, you know, those who know things, knowing spirits. You know, the, again, there's. I'm not going to go through the whole range of vocabulary here, but you're prohibited from doing this because you could do it. You, you know, you. There, there was some, you know, s- some solicitation going on here that you shouldn't do. That was forbidden by God. God is not in the, in the habit of of forbidding you from doing things that are impossible. That's what's called an absurdity. So in view of this worldview, I ask the question again, where in the ancient Near East do we have soul sleep? Then that's your context for the Old Testament. I'll throw in one wild card here. In, in the Anchor Bible Dictionary, there's a, uh, Ted Lewis has um, part of his article on the dead. Oh, actually, it's in diction, DDD, Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible. Uh, Ted, Ted is an, an Old Testament scholar. He teaches at Johns Hopkins now. And he he's in the evangelical tradition. I don't know where you know what what part of the spectrum he he would put himself on. But again, I've met Ted a few times. He does a lot of good work. His specialty is on the realm of the dead and, and stuff like that. In DDD, in his entry on the dead, he gets into the question of whether there were sacrifices to the dead or for the dead in Israel. I'm going to just read you part of of his uh, his article, and we'll, we'll talk about a few verses as we go. Because there are, there are certain indications in the Hebrew Bible that people, Israelites, did bring offerings for the dead. And, and it, we're not talking about idolatry here. We're talking about bringing the dead certain things that, that the belief was that they would enjoy you know, in the afterlife. Okay? And, and that wouldn't make any sense if everybody thought they were asleep. So here we go with, with what uh, Ted writes in, in part of his article. Was there a cult of the dead in ancient Israel? The Deuteronomistic legal material in the Hebrew Bible reveals restrictions against consulting the dead. That's Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 11. And against consulting the dead, presumably presenting offerings to the dead. Again, that's a little, little more ambiguous. He, he cites here Deuteronomy 26, 14. It says, I have not eaten of the tithe while I was mourning or removed any of it while I was unclean or offered any of it to the dead. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord my God. I have done according to all that you have commanded me. So it's, a, it's apparently a, a known practice, bringing you know, offerings to the dead. And part of Deuteronomy says, no, nah, you, know, you, re- you really shouldn't do that. There are going to be other passages that aren't quite so negative. But for our purposes here, there's a law here that alludes to the practice of presenting an offering to the dead. You don't do that if you think they're asleep. Ted continues. Deuteronomistic legal material also, again, presumably is opposed to engaging in certain practices associated with death rituals, such as self-laceration, Deuteronomy 14, Jeremiah 16, which seem to have been typical of Canaanite death cult practice. The Holiness Code in the Torah also contains categorical prohibitions against people who turn to necromancy and demands the death penalty for any mediums or necromancers, Leviticus 20, verse 6, and verse 27. From such laws, we may safely infer that cults of the dead existed and flourished in ancient Palestine to the extent that they were considered a threat to what eventually emerged as normative Yahwism. This seems to be supported by references to Manasseh's necromancy, 2 Kings 21, and Josiah's eradication of it, 2 Kings 23. However, the Deuteronomist may be using stereotypical lists or catalogs of sin and reforms. Again, 
Uh, let's skip down here. Two passages in the Hebrew Bible confirm the existence of the well-known Marzeach banquet. In Amos 6-7, the Marzeach banquet is described as revelry without any ties to death cult practices. Yet in Jeremiah 16-5, the Marzeach has clear funerary connections. The context is one of mourning and bereavement. As with the Ugaritic Marzeach, some scholars see the reason for it being is to be a banquet with the dead. Other scholars describe its primary function to be that of a drinking banquet, which could on occasion be associated with funerary feasts. Another subject to debate is whether post-interment funerary offerings were presented to the dead in ancient Israel. This is a little more neutral here. Most scholars see hints of long-term offerings of some kind between passages such as Deuteronomy 26.14. Again, we're the person says, I have not offered any of it, any, any of the sacred food, any of the offering to the dead. So that, again, implies that this was a normative practice. Psalm 106.28, let me just go there, says this. They yoked, this is speaking of Israel, they yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and ate sacrifices offered to the dead. Again, here's the question. Are they condemned for sacrificing to the dead or not? If they're not condemned for sacrificing to the dead, are they condemned for just eating the sacrifices? In other words, which is the crime here? Offering, you know, giving sacrifices to the dead or eating the sacrifices, like taking what shouldn't belong to you. It should belong to the dead. Don't eat that stuff. You know, you gave it to the, to your, you know, deceased ancestors. It's for them. Don't, don't eat it. I mean, wh which is, what's the penalty here? What, what, what's the problem? It's not quite clear. I mean, Isaiah 57, 6 and 8, even to them, the dead, you have poured out libations and brought offerings. Does this indicate regret? This might be a little clearer in my head than, than to readers. Let me just pick up with the whole, with the context here. Let's go to Isaiah 56, 8. The, the, Isaiah is talking about, you know, a bunch of stuff that they shouldn't do. <laughs> it says, you know, and again, talking about idolatry here. And it's in, in this context, it's going to be, there's going to be a reference to child sacrifice. So let's pick up in verse 5. You who burn with lust among the oaks, again, the, you know, these Asherah trees, these terebinths, and we talked about this in Ezekiel, under every green tree, you who slaughter your children in the valleys under the clefts of the rocks, among the smooth stones of the valley is your portion. They, they are your lot. To them you have poured out a drink offering. You have brought a grain offering. Shall I relent for these things? Again, what, what, what's the point here? in a moment. On a high and lofty mountain, you have set your bed. There you went up to offer sacrifice. Behold, or behind the door and the doorpost, you have set up your memorial. For deserting me, you have uncovered your bed. You have gone up to it. You have made it wide. You have made a covenant for yourself with them. You have loved their bed. You looked on their nakedness. So it's clearly an idolatrous context. But then you get this, this thing about you, you, you're slaughtering your children on the rocks. And then there's this, there's this line about Oh, you've poured out a drink offering, you know, to them, you know, the, the children that you've slaughtered, you've poured out a drink offering, you've brought a grain offering. And God asks, should I relent for these things? In other words, should I look at that and then say, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to destroy you now, Israel. The point is, should God look at these acts as though the people who sacrifice their children actually still love them, or they regret what they did, or they want their children to have a positive afterlife? Should God care that, that, that people you know, have this, that emotional response? God says, I'm not going to care about that. I'm still going to destroy you because this is idolatry. But again, the, the, the point is, whether it's an idolatrous situation or something that might not be idolatrous, again, just some sort of memorial kind of thing, something a little more neutral, it really doesn't matter for this question or for our discussion. People did this. Funerary offerings of food and, and libations of, of wine and, and, and such are well attested in the archaeological data in Israel. And here you have hints of it in the biblical text. People did this, and if they're doing it, it tells you that they're not thinking that everybody's asleep over there. It tells you that they believe, that Israelites believed, that the dead had an awake animate existence. So that's the kind of thing that I would bring up to someone who talked about soul sleep. I want to see the ancient Near Eastern material for this idea. I want, to see, I want an explanation for why people don't think they're asleep. 
Okay, because they're doing all this stuff. I want it, I want an explanation for why we should have prohibitions against contacting the human dead. Again, to contact the dead means they have to be dead. And non-human spirits don't die. So we're talking about the human dead. I want an explanation for that. And ultimately that means I need an explanation for why would God why God would put a command in there that can't be done for me to be thinking seriously about adopting a position like soul sleep. I just don't see it. I just don't see it. All right. Ian from Northern Ireland has two questions. And his first one is, could Mike speak further on the least talked about aspect of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit? What role did the Holy Spirit play in the Old Testament? Particularly, what role did the Holy Spirit play in the divine council and the fallout from Genesis 6 and Deuteronomy 32? Uh, what, what role did the Holy Spirit play? In the, there are whole books on the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. So this is not something that I can just you know, rattle off in a Q and a, um, uh, I'll tell you though, I, I will post something. I'll give, you know, Trey something to post on the episode site. That is a broad survey of the Holy spirit in the old Testament. But like I said, there are whole books written on this. So this is not a, an inconsequential question. It's just far too much for a Q and a, um, if you, if you're, if listeners are interested in some books, the Christopher Wright has one, uh, I think it's called Knowing the Holy Spirit through the Old Testament. There's another guy named uh, Hildebrandt has a book called um, Old Testament Theology of the Spirit of God. I have that one. I don't have rights, but, but I have this other one. Um, a Systematic Theology usually has a section on the, you know, the ministry, the role of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament in its section about the Holy Spirit. And Systematic Theologies will get you there too. Um, when it comes to Genesis 6, Deuteronomy 32, on, on one hand, it kind of depends what, what the questioner sort of wants here or means. We aren't told anything specific about the role of the Holy Spirit in the divine council or in the actual episode of Genesis 6 or in the actual episode of Deuteronomy 32. But, again, you know, even though we have, there's, there's just nothing there, but more obliquely, if you're thinking about the reversal of Genesis 6 and the reversal of Deuteronomy 32, then we have a different story. Then we can talk about that. Remember, I, I've, I know I've said it on the podcast a few times, but this whole idea, if you asked the average Christian, you know, why is the world so messed up? You get one answer, Genesis 3, the fall. If you asked an Israelite or a Jew, first century Jew, the same question, you'd get three answers. It wouldn't be Genesis 3. Genesis 3 would be the first of three reasons why humanity is so depraved and why the world is the way it is, alienated from God and hostile to God. You'd get Genesis 3, you'd get Genesis 6, and you'd get the, you know, the, the Babel event, Deuteronomy 32 worldview. So the Messiah was supposed to reverse all three instead of just one. Again, most Christians are fixated on the Messiah being the solution for the fall. Well, he certainly is, but he's also the solution in biblical thinking for the other two. So if you're thinking that way, then the role of the Holy Spirit ought to be clear. Because what's the solution to those things? You know, the Genesis 6 problem is about the, the proliferation, the acceleration of human depravity. And of course, the, the Deuteronomy 32, the Babel event, is about the alienation of the nations out of, away from um, the people of God. They're, they're outsiders. So the solution to, to both those things is the gospel, it, you know, it, it's the kingdom of God. It's being a member of the kingdom of God, because when someone you know, believes in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells them. The Holy Spirit, of course, enables you know, them to, you know, opens their eyes, you know, do all, all the things that we're, we're used to hearing about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament apply to Genesis 6 and Deuteronomy 32. Well, I shouldn't say all of them, but practically all of them apply to to Genesis 6 and Deuteronomy 32. Just because they're found in the New Testament doesn't mean they don't apply to the Old Testament situation. So the, the Spirit has, you know, does lots of things. It's his work in drawing people to the gospel. It's his work in illuminating their understanding. He's the one who regenerates, he seals, he sanctifies, so on and so forth. So the solution to human depravity is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And to prompt love for God, prompt faith and obedience, and so on and so forth. The solution for reclaiming the nations is also, again, the Holy Spirit. Why? Because that the answer to that is belief in the gospel by Gentiles who are then grafted into the people of God, and the Holy Spirit does all that. You know, the bat, 
you get baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. That's actually what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, by the way. You know, 1 Corinthians, I think it's 12, 13, you know, where you're put into the body of Christ. That's the Holy Spirit. You're sealed. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's involved in all of this. So if you're looking for, hey, what the Holy Spirit do at the Genesis 6 event, at the Babel event, I don't know. We're not told, and I'm not going to make something up. If your question is, what's his role in rectifying those things? Oh, there's a lot that the Holy Spirit is, is doing. Here, again, I just gave you the overview. But I'll, I'll post something a little more broad, just you know, generally about the, what the Holy Spirit does in the Old Testament. Uh, we'll post that on the page for this episode. Because, again, that, that's, that's such a vast subject that you can't really treat it on a podcast. Ian, second question and the last question of the episode is, in a related matter, there is Matthew 12. Jesus' comment concerning the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. The comment sprang from the Pharisees questioning Jesus' ability to drive out demons. Are the two related? Why is blaspheming the Holy Spirit beyond forgiveness? Well, let me let me begin this by two sort of summary thoughts or summary ideas, and then I'll I'll unpack these a little bit. In the Gospels, the exorcism of demons, the casting out of demons, is also associated. They're 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 two sides of the same coin, with the presence and the advance of the kingdom of God. You know, notice. In, let's just go to. Matthew 12 in verse 28, you have this, this link specifically noted. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So that's actually a common idea in the Gospels when Jesus is casting out demons. It has something to do with the kingdom of God being present or taking form or advancing. Again, with, there's a lot of ways to describe that. The second summative thought is that blaspheming the Holy Spirit is assigning the works of God to Satan. Again, that's pretty clear from the passage. That is, by implication, a rejection of the kingdom of God. If you're, if you're assigning the works of God to Satan, then you're assigning God's kingdom to Satan. You're, you're rejecting the kingdom of God. So th- those are two sort of things to have in your head you know, as we discuss this. Now, for this one, let me just open up what's probably my favorite commentary on, on uh, Matthew by R.T. France. And he says, he says, the saying about an unforgivable sin has often been inappropriately and sometimes disastrously applied to contexts which have little to do with its original setting. As it appears here in Matthew, it is specifically concerned with what the Pharisees have just said. In Matthew 9, 3, the, fa- the scribes had accused Jesus of blasphemy. Now the charge returns. The opening in verse 31, therefore, and I'll just read you the verse, therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. So back to France. The opening, therefore, indicates that in this context, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is to be understood in terms of the Pharisees' charge in verse 24, attributing what is in fact the work of God's Spirit to his ultimate enemy, Satan. It is thus a complete perversion of spiritual values, revealing a decisive choice of the wrong side in the battle between good and evil, between God and Satan. It is this which has shown these Pharisees to be decisively against Jesus. That's verse 30. And it is this diametrical opposition to the good purpose of God which is ultimately unforgivable. It is beside the point to question whether any worse sin could be imagined. The point is that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit stands out from the run of quote-unquote ordinary sins as being uniquely serious. It is to declare oneself against God. It is to call evil good and good evil. Now, just getting away from France a little bit, I think it might be helpful to think about this issue in terms of an illustration, or a couple of illustrations that come from the Old Testament, and what I have in mind here is the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, and I think importantly, Old Testament laws where there was no provision for forgiveness in the sacrificial system for certain offenses. Now, we went through Leviticus, and you know that, again, depending on the translation, some of them, it's rendered in different ways, but there are these sins that are committed with a high hand. Or again, these these intentional sins. One of them was actually blasphemy against God. Now, 
there were no sacrifices to take care of these sorts of sins. There was just the death penalty. In other words, there, there was nothing you could do to sort of make this go away. If you remember back in our series on Leviticus, there, there were certain sins like this. So I think that needs to be part of the backdrop with this, this passage and this whole issue. Because, again, if you're thinking about the Old Testament, this, the language used here, now think about the language that's used, will not be forgiven, will not be forgiven. That is the same phrase, except it's negated, that you'll find in the Old Testament about being forgiven. In other words, when the offer would bring a, a sacrifice, Leviticus says, you know, 10, roughly a dozen, but 10 times or so, that he shall be forgiven. He shall be forgiven. Well, here it's the same phrase is negated in this Matthew 12 passage. So if you're someone like the Pharisees, and again, the initial readers here of Matthew, and again, Matthew is, quote unquote, the most Jewish gospel, and it is, and there are good reasons for saying that. When you hear this phrase, I think your mind and their mind certainly, because basically the Pharisees have, have the whole Torah memorized, their mind is going to be taken back to these passages about sacrifices and forgiveness, and also the fact that there were certain sins that just didn't have a remedy. It, there was, it was a death penalty offense. In other words, if you commit this, this sin, you're done. If this is what you did. You're done. You know, you're, you're not gonna, there, there's nothing to do here. It, the effect of it's going to be eternal because you're going to be dead. Now, I would say, having said all that, the idea in Matthew 12 with the unpardonable sin is kind of, sort of threefold. I'll, let, me, let me give you three thoughts. The phrase, will not be forgiven, draws on Old Testament language about forgiveness in the sacrificial system. All right. Secondly, when you negate that idea, that is, a, is to be understood as a reference to the high-handed willful sin. In this instance, again, it, it's going to be equatable to the blasphemy against God himself, but in, in Matthew 12 specifically, it's rejecting the Messiah, of course, who is God incarnate, and that means it's rejecting the salvation of being a member of the kingdom of God. You reject it by saying, this person in front of me is empowered by Satan, and the kingdom he's talking about is the kingdom of Satan. And third, if this is where a person's heart is, then there's really no sacrifice or atonement for that person. He has been hardened, akin to the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Now, I would say the end of verse 32 is worth noting here. It says, whosoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. I'm going to go back to France here and pick up one, one statement he has toward the end of, of his little treatment here. He says, this age and the age to come are Jewish terms which apply primarily to the contrast between this life and the next rather than to successive phases of life on earth here. In this instance, then, the consequences of the unforgivable sin apply not only to this life, but also to the life to come, when judgment shall have been fully given. Now, this is me talking now. In other words, if you are determined not to believe to the point where you'll call God's kingdom Satan's kingdom and the power of the Spirit the activity of Satan, then your fate is sealed. This is the sin that seals one's fate, not some moral violation. In other words, what's being described here is the full-on rejection of the person of Christ and, of course, therefore, the gospel. Think of it this way. If you reject the gospel, well, where else do you think you're going to go? What else do you think is going to happen? If you reject the gospel, then you're going to wind up in this life, because this is your state of mind, and in the next life, you will be in this status of being unforgiven. You will be alienated, separated from God forever. Now, the way I've, I've articulated that is sort of akin to Hebrews 6, this idea of there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. You know, if someone lapses into unbelief or doesn't believe the gospel. In other words, there's no alternative. There's no alternative solution. If someone rejects the work of Christ, there's no other means of salvation. So we're done. Now, that doesn't preclude, and I think this is part of the, the, the lurking issue behind the question, this doesn't preclude a change of heart. If one repents and turns to the only means of salvation, realizing there's no other sacrifice for sin, then you're in the status of agreeing with God. 
you're in the status of accepting God's solution. But since there were Pharisees in the New Testament who later believed, according to the book of Acts, it seems pretty reasonable to me that this is the way to read the language of Matthew 12. You know, and, and I'll admit, we can't know for sure that the Pharisees who believe later on were present in this scene. But at one point, you know, the Pharisees were at the crucifixion, in a way, pretty, pretty much in lockstep, uh, rejecting the gospel rejecting this person as as you know being the messiah so if one you know later on has a change of heart well then scripture testifies to the fact that they could have a change of heart if one later denies that the kingdom of god was the kingdom of satan if you deny that later on and then therefore you affirm that jesus was the son of god and he cast out demons through the holy spirit in other words he was what he said he was then you're actually embracing his messiahship which means you're embracing the gospel, which means you're agreeing with God, which means you have come to salvation. But if you're at this level of hardening, there is nothing else God will present to you for forgiveness. So if you're in this scene in Matthew 12, and you're looking at Jesus, and you're saying, look, you're, you're, you're basically like another Satan. You know, you're empowered by Satan. Your kingdom is Satan's kingdom. If that's where you're at, where, where you're at, and, and this person that you're assigning satanic status to is in fact the only way of salvation. You have to be a member of the kingdom of God, this kingdom you're rejecting, this kingdom that you're associating with Satan. If that's the, if that's the situation, if that's the case, if you're at this level of hardening, there's nothing else that, that, that you can look to for forgiveness. There is nothing else God will pre- present to you for forgiveness. And that's going to have eternal ramifications. So unless you com- do a complete 180, Unless you come to agree with God, if this is where you're at, there's just no other alternative. Your fate is sealed. Your destiny is sealed. And and it's in this life because this is your present attitude. And if you don't come to agree with God, because again, remember, there's no other thing to do. There's nothing else that will rectify this situation spiritually other than for you to agree with God that this is his Messiah, and that this is God's kingdom that he's representing. And it it is by the power of of God's spirit that he's doing these things. Unless you come to that point, you will not have eternal life. there, There is no other, there's nothing else there. And so it's categorical. It has ramifications both for where you're at in this life, in your mind, and if that situation is never rectified, if you never come to agree with God, then it's also going to be sealed. Your fate is sealed in the life, you know, life to come and the age to come. So I, I think we need to we need to be thinking about Matthew 12, sort of try to hear it the way the Pharisees would have heard it. Um, again, taking their minds back to the language of forgiveness in the in their own sacrificial system and then negating it, which would in turn bring their minds back to the fact that, oh yeah, you know, there 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 were unpardonable sins, or, or at least that there there that's using our language. There were sins in the Old Testament that had no solution. You know, you were damned uh, if you did this. And, and, and so if, if you're thinking like that and you're hearing, you know, what Jesus is saying, that is the ultimatum. Either you believe in this guy and that he is empowered by the Spirit of God, and this is, in fact, the kingdom of God, membership in the kingdom of God being presented to you. If you reject that, you're done. There's nothing else God can do or will do for you. Well, our first one is from Mike, and he has an issue. Uh, Pretty much all literature about Christ was written by Roman scholars and others of a Roman nature, with the exception of later writers that may have taken literature from the Roman authors writing about Christ. If Rome, a.k.a. up until now the Vatican, might be the false prophet, then what other source of material is out there that shows there was a Messiah. I need something to grab onto that shows me Jesus really existed. Well, I, boy, you know, I mean, I, I guess I, well, sort of understand the, the, the thrust of the question. Um, I think that you're being too affected by this notion that Rome is the false prophet, you know, that, that sort of thing, that that's coloring your perception of, of history. Uh, you know, Romans, you know, could uh, very well and and did thousands and thousands of times record things about people that they didn't like or agree with. So I don't 
I don't know that there's any reason not to like a Roman historian because we get lots of information from them. So I don't, I don't buy into the uh, sort of the conspiratorial tack of the question. I think it's probably coming from stuff like Hislop's two Babylons or whatever, or, or maybe some, I don't know, kind of off the wall approach to biblical prophecy. But anyway, if we just go with the sources, um, there's there are a number of, of good books that, that you can get, you know, secondary literature that will take you into the primary literature of the period, and you know, not just Roman stuff, if if that matters. Uh, I, I'll just recommend a few few things and just talk about them here. Um, Bart Ehrman has a good book, "Did Jesus Exist: uh, The Historical Argument for Jesus of Nazareth," and I think that's a good book because Bart is basically an atheist, you know, but he's not he's not going to say something stupid like Jesus didn't exist because he knows better. Um, so it's actually a really good book. It, it actually got Bart into, into some hot water with his own constituency, you know, because you know, he has people in, in that constituency that are going to be Jesus mythers. You know, they want to argue that Jesus never existed. And, you know, Bart certainly is no friend to, you know, evangelical uh, Christianity. But Bart's book basically said this idea that Jesus did, never existed is nonsense. So I think it's a, a book you could really benefit from. Schaefer's book, that's S-C-H-A-F-E-R, Peter Schaefer. Jesus in the Talmud, uh, this certainly isn't Roman. Again, I, I'm not saying that matters. But for the sake of the question, uh, the, the references to Jesus in the Talmud are interesting because on the one hand, they they don't say very nice things about Jesus. They say really insulting things about Jesus. They refer to him as a sorcerer and, and whatnot, you know, conjurer, occultist, you know, you know, again, because of the, of the miraculous stuff that Jesus does. And that's interesting in and of itself, because here you have a, you know, an audience, uh, a, a writer, writers, you know, when it comes to Jewish material in the rabbinic period, you know, living century or so, you know, after Jesus or in you know, late antiquity, just generally. And it would have been really easy for them to say, what's all this Jesus talk? You know, the guy never existed. So, you know, who, who cares? You know, don't, don't, don't pay any attention to this. This is nonsense. But they don't do that, again, because they're not idiots. What they do do is they say, we don't want you following Jesus because he's all these bad things, you know, to the Jewish community. And when they reference him as a sorcerer or whatnot, again, it, it tells you that they took these stories about what Jesus did pretty seriously because they have to attribute them to a source. And a bad one, of course, because they don't want people following Jesus. So Jesus in the Talmud, I think, is is worth uh, having. Uh, Pitre's book, P-I-T-R-E, The Case for Jesus, The Biblical and Historical Evidence for Christ, is is a good one. Uh, Pitre, we, we've mentioned his work before here on the podcast. He's a New Testament scholar and, and a good one. Uh, he, he's a Catholic, you know, so I don't agree with his theological you know predilections on certain things. But he's a he's a really good scholar. You know, has done really important work in the Gospels. So he has a, a, a very readable, uh, short book on, again, the evidence for Jesus. Uh, Greg Boyd and Paul Eddy have a book that's a little older than some of these other ones, The Jesus Legend, A Case for the Historical Reliability of the Synoptic Jesus Tradition. I think that's an important book because both of them interact with Jesus mither stuff uh, pretty extensively. Again, the idea that that Jesus didn't exist or the zeitgeist nonsense, you know, they they interact with that a good bit on a, on a scholarly academic level. Uh, and, and in the same vein, Maurice Casey, uh, who again is, I don't, I don't know where, he might be an atheist too or an agnostic or something. He's certainly not an evangelical Christian. Uh, Casey's book, Jesus, Evidence and Argument or Mythicist Myths. Okay. He again is kind of like a Bart Ehrman guy, but he, he doesn't. I think he's a little more blunt uh, than Bart. Uh, he has some really um, unfavorable things to say about uh, sources out there on the internet. He's actually spent a good deal of time, you know, doing doing research on on internet writers like Acaria S. and the people who peddle this Jesus mythicist idea. And Casey is a New Testament scholar uh, of of you know high repute. Uh, he's an Aramaic specialist, to be even more specific. But uh, his book is very useful again for making the point that. The idea that Jesus didn't exist is is pretty much nonsense. Uh, there there are good reasons, you know, good sources, good reasons, you know, to to think that basically what the world has thought <laughs> up until, you know, quite recently, maybe huh, maybe nineteenth century, and you get a few people you know that 
sort of, you know, go out on a limb and try to make these these really odd, you know, sort of arguments and and frankly abuse primary sources to to do that task. But these are all good scholars uh, that are going to, you know, respond to that that kind of thing. If you wanted something more fun, you could go to my website, you know, drmsh.com, and go up to the resources tab uh, where we I have the link for recommended reading. If you get if you land on that page, uh, click on the part of the sources about Jesus myth or Jesus mythicists that that sort of thing those, those sort of resources. I have links there to some uh, some interaction with the Bayes theorem argument. Again, this is it's a it's an argument from math basically statistics about you know Jesus existence or non existence and, and it's it's something that gets ex- uh, discussed on the internet. You know, oh, we applied the Bayes theorem to Jesus, and we found out that you know his statistical likelihood that he didn't exist. Well, what's fun about some of the references I have here is there are people who apply Bayes theorem to the people who write the other the other posts, asking if the the authors who wrote the other internet stuff actually exist according to the Bayes theorem. You know, in other words, they turn the whole thing on its head. It's it's actually quite funny. Um, but again. You know, just just showing how the Bayes theorem uh, approach really isn't that helpful because you have to presume certain things along the way and plug certain assumptions. You know, you know, basically come up with numbers to plug into the equation at certain points, and you can more or less manipulate it to find, discover, lo and behold, that the person who wrote this post over here on the internet about Jesus not existing—he doesn't exist either, according to the Bayes theorem. So again, it's kind of kind of fun. But I would say, you know, your academic sources there, I just gave you a short list. There's no, they don't have a particular bias. Boyd and Eddie are the only evangelicals in the bunch. Everybody else is something else, Jewish, agnostic, atheist, and they're all saying the same thing. You know, Jesus certainly existed. All right. Our next question is from Larry and his Bible study group, shout out, but also Mark and a few others kind of have sent me some emails, track it on the same question. So uh, Mm -hmm. we're going to kill a bunch of birds with some stone, one stone here. And uh, Larry and his Bible study group uh, have spent a couple of hours discussing God's spirit. Mm -hmm. We all agree that God's spirit is within us and that it is unique to each one of us individually. So when do each of us receive God's spirit? Some of us feel that you only have God's spirit from repentance forward. While some of us feel it is from baptism forward, and others feel that the Spirit is with us from conception and throughout life. Yeah, I, I'm going to assume that repentance here means conversion, salvation, uh, for the sake of the discussion here. Uh, the, the, the baptism thing, I think, is probably, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not applying any intention here to anybody in, in the Bible study group, but I think that largely derived from a misreading of the book of Acts. You know, when you get certain people groups, they get baptized and they receive the Spirit. You know, I'll, the best thing I can tell you is go listen to the series on on the book of Acts, and you'll find out why that pattern exists. The pattern exists for a very specific reason. And it's not, you know, something that, you know, beyond a certain point, you know, would have, you know, beyond the period of incarnation, beyond the, the, the period of the early church, when uh, the reason for the pattern no longer exists. It, you know, it, it's not the way to think about either baptism or the reception of the Spirit. But anyway, the Spirit's indwelling you know, ultimately is linked to regeneration, new life. Again, so I'm, I'm going to link it you know, to you know, someone being placed in Christ because, frankly, that's where Scripture puts it. Um, and so I'm going to be—that's why I said I'm going to re- define repentance as—or this, this conversion, or repentance as conversion, or you know, coming to Christ, that sort of thing. So— there's a link between you know the indwelling reception of the spirit and the new life. You, you get this from passages like Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. You got to be in Christ to be a new creation. They're part of the reason why you're a new creation. This is again Old Testament new covenant language again, the, which is associated with the Holy Spirit. So there's going to be a connection there. John chapter three, Jesus. Uh, you know, when he's having the conversation with Nicodemus that we're all familiar with, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born anew or born from above. So again, it, it links conversion, uh, links alignment, you know, with, with Christ as Messiah, you know, conversion, with the enlivening, the reception of the spirit. 
and ultimately you can see where the spirit this this language about being born of the spirit being born from above is connected to belief to faith in John chapter 3 so the very same chapter if you go to verse 9 for instance Nicodemus said to him you know he's talking to Jesus he says how can these things be you know this whole thing about you know new birth born from above all this kind of stuff Jesus answered him are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not know, not understand these things Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I had told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The point here is that when Jesus says back in verses 6 and 7, hey, don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born anew. Okay, you, you know, th- this whole thing about being born of the Spirit, being born anew. Nicodemus gets a little confused, and then Jesus goes into this discussion that I just read. And this being born anew Jesus says, well, the whole point of this is that the Son of Man is going to be lifted up and you need to believe in him so that you have eternal life. This is what God so loved the world. This is why all this is happening. So there, it's a conceptual link, again, between belief and conversion in that sense, having a change of, change of heart about Jesus, about, about the Messiah, again, having, you know, aligning yourself with him as, as opposed to rejecting him or you know, aligning yourself with something else or nothing at all. So again, the change of heart idea there. 1 Corinthians 12 is, is sort of the linchpin you know, passage to this discussion. Paul writes, this is verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the, one of, all the, members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, or you could translate that for by one spirit, either way, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free and all are made to drink of one spirit. So here's the question. Would we be placed into the body of Christ and not have the spirit? Well, not according to 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. If you're in Christ, you you were put there by the spirit. Would we have the spirit and be alienated from Christ, not part of his body? No. You know, so these two things are, are linked. Just think of it that way. How could you be in the body of Christ and not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you? And then conversely, if you had the Spirit, how could you not be in the body of Christ? These two things are related. And so this is why the, you know, Scripture creates this link between having the Holy Spirit. Okay, the Holy Spirit has taken up residence, has sealed you know, you know, under the day of redemption, you know, all, all this stuff that's said by the Spirit. When that, when that happens, again, it's linked to belief. You're put into the body of Christ. And just, just you know, explore the metaphor a little bit. You know, the body of Christ is... You know, linked to the person of Christ, and Jesus is, but isn't the Spirit. According, you know, again, if you go back to Unseen Realm and read that little section on on how Paul, in four or five places, uh, parallels the Spirit of God with the Spirit of Jesus, and twice he says, "The Lord who is the Spirit." Now, the, the 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 point is not to deny Trinitarianism. Oh, there's no Holy Spirit now; it's all just Jesus and God. No, the point is just as Jesus is, but isn't the Father, so the Spirit is but isn't Jesus, and Jesus is, but isn't the Spirit. They're linked and related, and there's three, there's three characters there, God, Jesus, and the Spirit. That's actually where Trinitarianism comes from, but the three are inseparable is the point. And so if you're in Christ, you are, by definition, united with the Spirit as well, and the Spirit is in you as well. There's no like chronology of this kind of thing. So being put into the body of Christ is union with Christ, and union with Christ is salvation, Baptism of the Spirit into the body of Christ is closely related to salvation. They're really inseparable. Um, I'll just read another little little passage here about the interchangeability of Christ and the Spirit. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. In other words, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, you're, you're not in the flesh, you're in the Spirit, and you're also in the body of Christ, the Lord who is the Spirit. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Again, to be resurrected, you have to be in Christ. And if you're in Christ, you have the spirit. 
so all these ideas are interconnected and that that's how i would answer the question that you you get the spirit you're united to christ you're you, you know you're, you're you're part of the body of christ in its union with with christ and the spirit the spirit is in you the spirit is is unified you know with christ they're not separate you know he doesn't show up later and leave you know at some other time i mean it, it, it's all one package and that is linked again by jesus to believing in the one that god has sent and being born from above, which again in our parlance would be that conversion. Our next one is from Fern S. I think that's Fernando, not Fern and Audrey. So from Fern S. Okay. What does Mike think of Balaam's error, especially the geographical context? Yeah, I'm I'm not quite sure of um of what either Fern or Fernando uh, means by the, the geographical context, but I'll I'll say a few things. I don't know if I'll hit the mark here or not. You know, on just generally Balaam's error, on one hand, you know, we, of course, presume that Balaam, again, if we read the story, the the biblical account of the story, that he sounds like he kind of didn't intend, you know, to curse Israel or, you know, there might be a little ambiguity there from, from what person, certain passages say he at least tried to curse Israel. Maybe that's a better way to put it. You know, he's asked by Balak, you know, to go out and, and curse the Israelites, and Balak hires this prophet Balaam, you know, and he comes out, you know, comes over and says, "Hey, you know, I'm, I'm only going to, you know, speak what the Lord, you know, tells me to speak." And then he goes out and he, and he tries, you know, to to utter a curse, but of course God doesn't let him do that, and he winds up, you know, speaking an endorsement and blessing, and you know, we know the story. You read the story though, and you wonder, well, what was Balaam's error then? Okay. Because the outcome of his attempts to curse Israel, he's not he's never allowed to do that. So so you know, how, how does he become a bad guy? Well, in terms of uh, you know, Deuteronomy, uh, let, let's just go to Deuteronomy and pick up some of these thoughts here. You have an explicit charge that Balaam did set out to curse Israel. So De- Deuteronomy twenty three, six, the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you, for the Lord your God loves you. Again, speaking about Balaam in context there. So apparently Balaam tried and God reversed it. The opinion of Balaam, uh, what did he actually do? It, it's really the, the sin that he gets blamed for isn't really part of the Numbers 22 and 20 through 24 story where he's trying to curse Israel but is prevented from doing so. It actually comes from Numbers 31, 15, and 16. And it's pretty self-explanatory. I'll just read the two verses. Balaam after he wasn't able to curse Israel, he advised Balak on what to do in the absence of the cursing in context. So verses 15 and 16 here from Numbers 31, Moses said to them, have you let all the women live? Okay, this is part of the, the, the Baal of Peor incident. Behold, these on Balaam's advice caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident, incident of Peor. And so the plague came among the congregation of the Lord. So Moses, in this passage, this is Numbers 31, this isn't Numbers 22 through 24 when Balaam's trying to curse the people, he's, and he's not allowed to do that by God. So at some point after that, he advised the enemies of Israel to come up with a different way to get Israel again to act treacherously against the Lord. And if you read Numbers 31, it involves you know the women from Moab and, and again, the intermarriage, and, and you know one of them. One of them brings one of the women, you know, that they're not supposed to marry, and of course that means you know, have sexual relations with. It brings them right to the to the either either the door of the tabernacle, or, and some would argue that that you actually they actually cross sort of the threshold there, and it apparently starts to do it with this woman in the presence of everybody there, just to flaunt it. And then Phineas, you know, comes over and he, he impales both of them with a spear, which you know suggests that one was on top of the other. So this is the incident, and, and, and when Moses is commenting on it, all of this happened, this, this, this treachery, because of, of a piece of advice that Balaam gave. So that's what Balaam gets blamed for. So you don't really pick it up in the, in the Balaam story primary. You have to read a little bit further in the book of Numbers to get it. Uh, it's kind of interesting, though, that Balaam, the view of Balaam in the Old Testament isn't entirely negative. Micah 6, 5, uh, you, you read this verse, my people remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted against you and how Balaam, son of Beor, responded to him. So, you know, it, it's it, it's kind of a, a little nod to the fact that 
well, you know, Balaam was true to his word. You know, God gave him a message of blessing, and he didn't he didn't chicken out. I mean, he you know, he blessed the people of Israel right right there when Balak was there, and you know, he took some risk there. Balak could have just you know took his head off or something. You know, so it, it, it it's acknowledging that Balaam did speak what God gave him to speak, even though he tried, you know, to, to do what he was hired to do and curse Israel and couldn't. But obviously he gets blamed, you know, for what, what happens in Numbers 31. Now beyond that, you know, I'd need to know what the question really means by the geography. This is connected with Moab. So maybe that's, that's the issue. And again, we, we get the Moabite women in Numbers 31. Moab, of course, was on the other side of the Jordan, the Transjordan. So is the questioner referring to the to where it happened, the connection with Moab generally, the order of events? I don't know. I can't tell from the question. Uh, I, I could throw this in. The Israelites, when, when this stuff happens, are camped on the borders of Moab. And if the reconstructed Deir Allah inscription, they're, they're, it's a famous inscription. It dates to roughly 900 to 600 BC. Uh, it was found in the Jordan Valley. If, if that's reliable... There was El worship in Moab. Okay, and El is one of the, the words for the God of Israel. So, do we have aberrant El worship going on in Moab? Is that a possibility? Well, maybe. If you actually read the Deir Allah inscription, there is mention of El by name. There's mention of the Divine Council, the Council of El. There's also mention of the Shaddaiin, who are called Elohim. This is, again, probably an Aramaic a dialect. That would be the word for Elohim in Aramaic. So you have a, a group of gods in the council, the Shadayin, who appear again as part of the council of El, and they decide to send a drought of the land in, in this inscription there. They, they, they do things that are going to hurt the people here. So that term, Shadayin, occurs only in this inscription at this site. It might be related to the divine name found in Genesis, El Shaddai. Nobody really knows if that's the case or not. So the picture here, you know, if, if we want to take this inscription with the biblical material, and, and Balaam didn't write this inscription, but Balaam is actually mentioned in this inscription, um, the son of Beor. Um, you know, maybe there was aberrant El worship going on in, in Moab in the Transjordan. The inscription and Balaam himself, according to the biblical text, is familiar with El. Baal, Balaam actually uses the divine name, Yahweh. He refers to God as Elohim, and he refers to God as El. Uh, four or five times in Numbers 20, 23, and 24. So uh, he also uses the word Shaddai uh, in, in this that section. So maybe, you know, Balaam, you know, he was either a sort of a, a prophet of God that goes astray, you know, and it becomes a prophet for hire. According to this inscription, maybe he his his theology wasn't quite, you know, what you would consider the, the orthodox theology of one of the biblical writers. I mean, who knows? It's, it's all guesswork at this point. But Balaam apparently knows of Israel's God. That, that much is, is sure. He, he might even have worshipped him. Did he worship him correctly or not? Uh, who knows? Uh, even people in Canaan proper didn't do that well you know, all the time or even most of the time. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to tell either way. But his sin against Israel, again, would seem to indicate he might have had divided loyalty. You know, was he wholehearted with the Lord or did, 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 did he just say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak what the Lord tells me. And then when the Lord showed up, you know, it's like, okay, I, you know, I, I, I better say what this deity says to me or else I'm going to be in big trouble. Is that it? Or was Balaam sort of a, a, a faithful but theologically aberrant Yahweh worshiper? We, we just don't know. We don't really know exactly what the context is. So if, if that's you know, what's lurking behind the question, again, that gives you a little bit of an introduction to that particular inscription, which is known because it does mention Balaam uh, by name. But beyond that, I, I, I can't be more specific because I'd have to know exactly what, you know, what the, the trajectory of the question was. All right. Aaron's got a couple of questions. And his first mm -hmm. one is, I've been doing a study on the archangels and I've found Jewish studies that claim that there was 70 archangels which would mm -hmm. correspond to the 70 sons of God. What do you think of this? Well, I, again, I'd have to know what the studies are. Is this rabbinic material? Is it something else? Because it, that's, you know, there's a, cr a chronological issue there. In other words, was it written after the biblical material or contemporaneous with it or, or before? Or, 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 you know, what, what exactly are we talking about? I mean, there, there's, no, there's no biblical, you know, teaching on there being 70 archangels. The number is quite a bit less. 
So without knowing what text he's thinking of, I can't really be that helpful other than to say, you know, it's, it's certainly not a biblical idea. Aaron also wants to know what's your thoughts on theosis. This Theosis. Yeah. We, I mean, I would refer to uh, listeners to, and, and maybe even uh, Aaron here to the podcast episode we did on, uh, you know, even the, the recent one, we, we got into this with the, uh, the relationship of Genesis 15 with the stars. Again, uh, David Burnett's, you know, previous podcast about uh, the way um, Paul, you know, works with Genesis 15 uh, about the seed of Abraham being as the stars in the sky. Since stars were conceived of as uh, divinities or divine beings, or there, there was some connection there. Again, it, it, the opinion actually varied. Uh, there was a spectrum of opinion, in other words. But since that's the case, it's a it, it suggests that part of the covenantal promise was to have the seed of Abraham made divine. Okay, and that's theosis. And that evangelicals typically use the word glorification uh, instead of theosis. Theosis tends to be a, a term that's associated with Eastern Orthodoxy, but generally uh, the the subject matter is is about the same thing it's about the believer's destiny to be made like christ you know what what that actually means uh, it, it's not like we're going to become little yahwehs but we're going to become you know as, as much like jesus as as we can and still be human still be contingent beings um so what what does that all involve so we we did a, an episode about the the resurrection body with david burnett uh there was a five or six well, it might have been six part series on my blog uh where david basically condensed his uh, thesis material into a series of blog posts for you know the the naked bible blog and it's specifically about theosis about the deification traditions so i would invite uh, aaron to read that as well but Generally, you know, the theosis is a biblical idea being made, you know, divine. We're already, according to Peter, partakers of the divine nature. Uh, so that's a process of, of sanctification that will result again in, in glorification or deification or theosis. Again, it doesn't really matter what term you use. So it's a it's a biblical idea, and I think the discussion of it needs to be biblically rooted as opposed to being rooted in other texts. But certain it's certainly true that other texts help us to understand the concepts and some of the biblical language um, you know, in, in a pretty transparent way. All right, our next one is from Evan, and his question is, I'm on board with Genesis 1 through 11 being polemic. I have heard you talk about how the creation account does not need to be a literal six-day event because it is polemic. However, you discuss the Genesis 6 Watcher's account as a literal event. How do you parse which polemic stories in Genesis 1 through 11 are literal, literal events and which ones are not? Well, I, I wouldn't say that, that we, we don't I, – I wouldn't say that I don't believe Genesis 1 and 2 are teaching science because of polemic. I think polemic is one reason for that. Basically, when, when – the Old Testament or, or the New Testament makes non-scientific statements in other places, that tells me immediately that, that God didn't intend to give us science in these texts because God, if that was his intention, that's what he would have accomplished because God does know science pretty well. So if God wanted a writer to give us that information, science that would satisfy a 21st century person and beyond, he could have certainly picked somebody to do that, dropped it in their heads, and it would have come out on paper, as it were. That is not what we get. So that tells me that that isn't what God was up to. So it, it's, it's a lot simpler than polemic for me. But polemic is, is part of the picture. Uh, I've actually answered this question many times. Um, I've added it you know, to my FAQ page. So for listeners, if you go up to drmsh.com, you look at about, go to frequently asked questions. Uh, it, it's, it's on the bottom, I think, because it was recently added. That will give you more detail than what I'll summarize here. So briefly, I would say in this whole thing about what creation, what about these stories about watchers, you know, supernatural beings and whatnot, one issue falls under the province of what is discoverable by human experience and, and human interaction, basically with, you know, with our five senses and our experience of the natural world. So, so one of these things, namely the, the, the creation stuff, is testable and knowable and experienceable, if that's even a word, by virtue of our knowledge of the natural world, which we acquire through our five senses and our own discovery. 
because it's the world we live in. It's the natural world. The other issue, what goes on in the supernatural world, does not fall in that category. It can't, by definition. It's a different world. So you can have divine actions that occur in our world, and you know we, we get you know, stories to that effect. But when it comes to knowing, you know, I should say, when it comes to parsing or, or, or working with, judging, assessing information about the divine world, we have no way to judge that. We don't. The, the, the tools of science, by definition, do not apply. They don't work. They're no good. When it comes to claims about creation, well, they're very good because that's what science is. We discover how the natural world ticks. Now, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave that part of the discussion you know, right there. I would just add this for the sake of, of the podcast. And again, people can go up to the FAQ and get you know, a long, much longer answer with a lot more detail. I would say a non-literal view of how to read Genesis 1 and 2 uh, that account of creation is not a non-literal view of creation. Let me say that again. A non-literal reading of Genesis 1 and 2 is not a non-literal view of creation. God created, period. Punctuate the sentence, okay? How, the, how he did it is the issue of disagreement. Uh, his creative acts are, therefore, literal. They happened in real time. They occurred. The Genesis 1 and 2 description of those acts, again, is something different. That's, that, that's describing you know, you know, God's you know, creative act in a, in a certain way or in lots of different ways. Do we realize, for instance, that the Old Testament uh, creation accounts aren't just in Genesis? You get one in Psalm 74, it doesn't look a whole lot like, like Genesis 1. looks a little bit like it, but there are other things about like slaying a dragon, bringing order out of chaos. You know, it, it's quite different. Uh, Creation texts with an S on the end exist in the Bible. It's not just Genesis 1 and 2. And we have to come to grips with that. We have to recognize it and understand it. So creation, how God did something, and, and the thing that he did create occurred in real time to me. It's a literal event. We're here. The world's here. Everything's here. So that's not non-literal. But how it's described in the Bible, again, is, is a different thing. We have to look at you know, the way things are described, and again, ask ourselves, well, if God was trying to communicate science, why did God mess up here and there and, and other places? You know, that, that, that kind of thing, you know, how, how do we deal with that? And, and people, again, try to reconcile, you know, the, the, the findings of science that satisfy a 21st century audience with the language of Genesis. I think that that effort, though admirable, is pointless. I think if God wanted to give us that information, he, we wouldn't have had to guess and make passages stand on their head to get there. I think it would have been much clearer. But frankly, this is this is the wisdom of God. I would argue that, that God prompted the writer to inform readers that he was the creator, which is a literal truth. The means to that end, how the writer conveyed the reality of God's creative work, shouldn't be conflated with the end itself, the fact of creation. God let the writers write according to their knowledge, using whatever literary devices or techniques that their readers would understand. Why did he do that? Well, because God wanted the original readers to grasp the truth of who the creator was. We undermine that, we in modern people undermine that, and we make the Bible vulnerable to criticism when we impose modern questions and modern science on Genesis 1 and 2. We set the Bible up for a fall, to be blunt about it. We, 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 we make the text contain thoughts that the writer, the original writer, and the original readers would never have had in their heads. You know, we, 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 we change the enterprise because we think we have to protect Genesis 1 and 2 from science. You know, why, would, why is it wise for God to not prompt the biblical writers to try to make scientific statements in Genesis 1 and 2. Because if God prompted someone today to write Genesis 1 and 2, a thousand years from now, people would be looking at what the person today wrote, and they'd snicker at it. They'd say, can you believe that they believed this stuff back a thousand years ago? Boy, this is really bad science. We know so much more now, and this just isn't accurate. If the enterprise is not to produce science content from the beginning, if it's just designed to, to teach us about who we are, who created us, who created everything. Okay, if that's the goal, you don't need to be talking science 
And it's very wise because when you don't talk science in Genesis 1 and 2, you produce something that transcends science. You produce something that is not subject to criticism today or a thousand years from now. Because to defeat that enterprise, you would have to prove that there is no creator, that creation never happened. That's the only way you can overturn and undermine, do away with Genesis 1 and 2. You have to, you have to show that hey, there really was spontaneous generation of matter. There, there really was no Big Bang. There really was no beginning. There, there, you know, it just always was here. You know, there is no need for a creator. You have to dispense with the need for a creator. And you have to dispense with a creation event. That's the only way you can actually undermine Genesis 1 and 2. But if you want to you know, argue that, well, it actually teaches a science, you set it up for criticism. You, you make it vulnerable. If you divorce it from science talk, it is not subject to those criticisms. It transcends science. That's why I think God was very wise to just essentially prompt the original writers, you know, look, here's what we want to do. We want to make sure that anybody who reads this knows who the true God is, who the creator God is. It's not, it's me. It's not some flunky. It's not some, you know, one of these gods of Egypt. It's not one of these gods from the Sumerians or the Mesopotamia. You know, we, we want to know, want to know who, the, who the true God is. We want, to, we want credit for the existence of humanity, the existence of everything. And that means that God is Lord over those things, which means those things are accountable to their creator. And God has a specific reason for creating them. He has a destiny in mind. We want those thoughts communicated. And you poor piddly person living in the second millennium BC, you are perfectly capable of communicating those ideas now go get that done and use whatever language you have at your disposal. Whatever knowledge that's rattling around in your pointed little head, you know, what, 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 whatever, however you're able to communicate those ideas so that your readers understand them, go get it done. He doesn't say, now, you know, hold, hold still because I'm going to dump, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity and then, you know, add some quantum stuff in there that will make Einstein uncomfortable. And then we're going to add this, that, and the other things so that People reading this 10,000 years from now will think it's good science. That's just ridiculous. Okay? It's, it's not what we see in the text. It just isn't. And I think God was very wise to do it the way he did it. So creation is literal for me. How it gets communicated is a different story. And how the writers tell the story, they want to accomplish certain things. And one of them is polemic. There are other reasons, but one of them is polemic. All right, Mike, our last question is from Slash, and he wants to know if Adam and Eve produced urine or fecal matter while in the Garden of Eden. Now, he asked this because in church yeah. a few weeks ago, uh, they were teaching that out of every transaction of energy, there is waste, and we have to articulate that waste, understand it, and deal with it. What that means is that in the Garden, when Adam originally was living in the presence of God before he sinned, he could eat anything in the garden, and 100% of what he ate would be transferred into <laughs> energy with no waste. Since the fall, there is waste, and we have a world full of it. We have to constantly account for it. So to sum up, Mike, did Adam and Eve poop? You know, th this, this now has risen to the top, maybe I should say the bottom, <laughs> of the strangest questions I've ever gotten. <laughs> Oh boy, does this take my mind in some other places? I don't, I don't know if I should mention it or not. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna entertain the audience here for a little bit. Please do. I remember, I remember when I was. I'm not gonna name the place. I remember teaching at a Bible college one time, and we had a music professor at this place, and he actually taught people. Now, this is this is a fundamentalist context, okay. I, I taught at a fundamentalist school one time, and, and, and I was hired because they were trying to take the, the school more mainstream and get accredited and just honestly be more reasonable. But we had a guy in the music faculty that taught his class because he wanted to teach against rock and roll, you know, anything with a beat in it, that there are the, 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 the tones of – see, I don't even know anything about music, so I'm, I'm probably going to get this wrong – but that the, the vibrations – that go with the tones of rock and roll were the same set of vibrations that happen when people have sex. And that's why we should avoid rock and roll. So somebody came into my Bible class and told me that and asked me what I thought. 
<laughs> and I looked at him and I said, I just have one question. I want to know who held the microphone for that study. You know, and of course everybody cracks up. They're like like people are following, you know, you know, holding microphones around when people are having sex to, to establish this relation. It's just it's ridiculous. Okay, so now this question has probably moved into the stratosphere of of uh, ridiculous things I've heard. Did Adam and Eve poop? Of course they pooped. Okay, their bodies would have worked the way they were created to work. Everything functioned the way it should have functioned. You know, this I, – I, I don't want you to read it again. <laughs> I don't to try to expunge it from my head. But this sounds – what you read sounds to me like something I'd hear in New Age circles or theosophy. You know, there's this whole thing about, you know, energy and, you know, perfect energy at the beginning and you could eat anything and there was no way. That's just ridiculous. I don't know. I don't know how you could ever get that from the biblical text. Uh, so whoever, wherever this comes from, I'd say the source for that is he's sucking it out of his thumb. You know, if, if it's something to do with death, you know, because of waste, death, maybe it, maybe it's linked to Romans 5 or something. And maybe he's equating death of, of plants because you know, they're only eating plants in the beginning. Is he equating death of plants with waste? Well, why would you do that? You know, wh- why would you equate death of plants with 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 waste and say it's bad? What else are they supposed to eat? Okay, and and, and how would you get from Romans five this idea that you don't need to expel anything? Isn't that the way the body is supposed to work? Uh, I, you know, I don't. Uh, let me let me look go at it this way. Here's here's why I'm 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 on this trajectory. It is New Age theosophical occult mythology to think that Adam was more than human. He's human. If Adam's in the garden and him and Eve are making breakfast, and an elephant you know starts trotting through the camp, okay, and he trips and he falls on Adam. When he rolls over, Adam isn't going to get up and say. Well, boy, I'm glad that's over. That tickled. No, he's crushed. Okay, he's a normal human being. The fact that he hasn't fallen yet is not going to prevent him from being crushed by an elephant that falls on him. If he cuts himself, guess what's going to happen? He'll bleed. If he cuts himself badly enough, guess what's going to happen? He'll lose enough blood that he'll die. Okay, Adam is not a a a more than a, he's not an ubermensch okay he's not this superman that you know he if he's impervious to pain or harm or anything like that now we know that didn't happen because of the circumstances of the garden but the point is that we 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 turn adam into some sort of alien you know some sort of non-human or more than human thing. He's just human. And this is the way occultists talk about biblical characters. I mean, honestly, they do. And I, I you know, you know, if, if this comes from, you know, some quote unquote, you know, famous or reliable source, whatever, that is I mean, that's exactly the way that Adam gets talked about. These bizarre theories about Adam and Eve and whatnot, that they 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 were human, but they really weren't human. No, I'm sorry. They were human. That's what they were. Adam was no more transcendent of humanity than Jesus was. Jesus was 100% man, not 100% man, another 50% of something else added on to it, plus God. You know, it, 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 he's human. He's the second Adam. He could die. He could bleed. Okay, Adam was not superior to Christ in his humanity. I'm sorry, but he wasn't. And it's this kind of talk that I think really potentially, you know, can, can mislead people into sort of mixing these kinds of, and I'll, I'll use the word again, occult ideas uh, in their theology. So that, that's what I think of it. <laughs> Just off the top of my head. Well, uh, I think Mike, it's nonsense. Mike, the real question is, did Adam use toilet paper? I mean, let's get serious here. We need to know <laughs> the details, if you don't mind. What went oh, on I'm, back sure he, I'm sure he didn't need it. right i'm sure he never he never made him he never had to clean himself just there's so many jokes in there very hard for me to reframe right now he probably never never perspired 
you it's know, weird. and even if he did, he wouldn't have needed deodorant because that would he would have smelled, you know, like roses. This is the kind of this is the kind of stupidity that passes for deep thinking in, in these areas. And I, I I just see it all the time again in this new age theosophical occult kind of literature. It just doesn't have any place in biblical thinking. Adam and Eve were human beings. Their bodies functioned optimally the way they were supposed to function. It, it, it's not a complicated thing. They could have died. They didn't. God prevented them from having any kind of circumstance you know, that, they, that they would have died. They, they're not eternal. They have contingent immortality. Their immortality depends on two things. They don't sin so that they're not cast out of the garden and they'll begin to age and die. They'll be divorced from the tree of life and the presence of God and all this stuff. Okay, It's contingent on that and B, doing anything dumb. Okay, like getting in the way of an elephant or cutting themselves, you know, cutting their wrist with a knife, you know, or, you know, falling into a creek and their head hits a rock. You know, Adam doesn't wake up, you know, an hour later and say, well, that, that was refreshing. No, he's dead because he needs oxygen. See, there's another one. Well, if, if Adam and Eve didn't poop, maybe they didn't need oxygen either. Isn't that energy? Isn't the act of breathing, you know, using energy? You know, it, it's just ridiculous. It's just, it's utter nonsense. But it's the kind of thing, again, it's the kind of stupidity that passes for deep thinking in these sorts of circles. And it just doesn't have any place in biblical theology. Still not going to stop me from creating a naked Bible poop spray. So be looking forward to that <laughs> soon to order online. But You um, know, I don't, I don't really look forward to any of your ideas. <laughs> what? <laughs> that is a lie, folks. That is a lie. Oh, come on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all right, Mike. Well, we're done just like any that. Of, any of your public ideas? Uh, pl- please. Behind closed uh, doors, he loves it. He loves oh, it. Oh, yeah. You know you're going to yeah, get you a, I'm, a 12 I'm pack of the poop spray. I'm signing up for that one. <laughs> yeah. I'm signing up for that one. Oh, yeah, exactly. Let's uh, let's make that, put the label on and send it you know, to, the, to where, whatever the source of that material was. Let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> Our first question is going to be from Ryan. And his question is, if oral traditions are the norm, why are the dates of written documents important? Couldn't the stories have been known among the people already? When Mike and others use the dates of written documents, the conclusion appears to be the biblical text comes after. Is that a conclusion about the final edited form or the whole history of the story? I realize the original oral traditions are certainly more difficult to track down, but why do scholars tend to agree on the perceived order of the stories? Doesn't evidence exist that the stories share enough differences to indicate that each people had its own background and the final result may indicate later editing? If so, how do we apply inspiration to this scenario? And are all versions inspired or only the final version we now have? Mm-hmm. Well, let me hit the last part of that uh, first. Uh, inspiration uh, is really about the final form of the text. In other words, when what, that point at which God's providential oversight of the process, his, his oversight of the human hands forming the text was completed. And that has to be the case because that's what we have. I mean, we don't, we don't have uh, the Bible in stages, like to be able to look back at some earlier stage prior to the final form of the text, you know, the, the text as we have it, we can't just go look at look it up like, oh, let, let's go check the edits out. It's not like in Microsoft Word where you can review a document and see all the, the editorial changes. We don't have anything like that. Um, so inspiration, again, properly talked about, really refers to the, the final product of the providential process. So to speak of inspiration applying to text that we don't have doesn't make any sense. So that's kind of the way it has to be. Now, you know, back to the beginning, this whole thing about oral tradition and dates of documents. Um, if you're talking about when Ryan mentions dates, if he's talking about the relative chronology of, say, some Mesopotamian source versus, uh, you know, the, the biblical version of some story. Well, in, in many cases, those can be dated quite well and quite easily. 
So if, if it's a comparison between biblical material and Egyptian material or Mesopotamian material or Sumerian material, uh, that, that isn't difficult to do. What, what we need to remember, though, is that some of that stuff, like Mesopotamian material, Mesopotamia has a long literary history. So you might have a flood story written in Sumerian that is older than the biblical material by a couple thousand years. But you could also have a flood story that's in the Mesopotamian group, the corpus there, that is contemporaneous with the biblical, the Israelite material. But yet, even though they're contemporaneous, that Mesopotamian text might actually borrow from the much earlier version of the Sumerian text. So this, this is where the whole dating issue gets a little fuzzy, because it, it's not like versions are produced that have no relationship to the earlier material when it comes to Mesopotamia. There are lots of flood stories that come from different eras uh, of Mesopotamian history and literary output. A lot of it predates the biblical material. Some of it is contemporary. But even the contemporary stuff, again, is going to be drawing on much older material than the biblical stuff. Now, the Marduk, let, let's just say that the flood story where, where Marduk is the centerpiece. Well, Marduk was the high god during the, the Babylonian era, and that's going to be contemporaneous with biblical material. So what's if you're a Mesopotamian you know, Babylonian scribe, and you're creating your own version of of your flood story or your creation story to elevate Marduk. Yeah, you're you're going to be using earlier material, but you're also going to be doing uh, contemporary tweaks. That again, if it's if it's quote unquote new stuff, or or really repurposing that that really sort of telegraphs to the reader, or in this case, the scholar that hey this this line here or this idea here uh, you know was was evidently you know composed in, in the you know during the time of Nebuchadnezzar we'll say well you know then then you then you can talk about a you know sort of contemporary sources for the story biblical and mesopotamian it's just not a neat picture where where you know things don't get repurposed and don't get reused but it, just if you're talking about the civilizations yeah the, the the Mesopotamian material and a lot of Egyptian material, you know, lots of this stuff uh, are going to predate uh, the biblical period because we, in terms of manuscripts, the oldest manuscripts we have of the Hebrew Bible are the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they go back to 200, maybe 300 BC. Uh, the oldest Hebrew anything, anything written in Hebrew, anything that can, that can be called Hebrew, and scholars would call it epigraphic Hebrew because these are like stone inscriptions. Epigraphic Hebrew is, goes, goes back to the 10th century. That, that's still, by biblical chronology, 500 years after Moses. If you're talking about the alphabet, well, then you're, you know, you're pushing back into the biblical period, you know, when you have the Semitic alphabet invented. But there just isn't a lot of inscriptional material in, in the Semitic language we would call Hebrew that exists, you know, the 10th century, just think of 1000 BC, that, that's where you're at. And it's not biblical stuff. It's, it's different kinds of inscriptions. When it comes to the biblical material, you know, we're, we're dealing with the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it's really easy to look at the primary source data, the manuscripts we have, and, and say, in terms of literary output, what comes first? Okay, that, that, that's an easy call. It's an easy question. Ryan brought up the whole issue of oral tradition. Having said all that about the literary stuff, Israelites would have had, in, in their experience, in their hearing, they would have had, you know, again, I believe, and I don't think it's a stretch at all, they would have had knowledge about, about the stories that wind up in the Bible, including Genesis 1 through 11. They would have been told stories about how, you know, the God of Israel created everything and created you know, mankind, and, and they would have had stories about a flood, you know, and, and the, the confusion of the languages, the Tower of the Babel, the division of the nation. They, they would have had stories about this that get passed on, along with oral tradition about their own existence as a people. Now, the way biblical scholars typically look at this kind of thing is they'll, they'll say something like, well, at some point, you know, and it's it's an imprecise science to, to know at what point any particular part of this process would have been, you know, would have happened. But at some point, the oral tradition of, of the Israelites as a people, in other words, Abraham forward, 
because that's when Israel becomes a people. That is something that that the average slave in Egypt would have would have heard. There's stories that they their parents and their grandparents would have taught them. It's completely unreasonable to think that Israelites would have no origin story. And if they did, that they never would have talked about it. It's absurd. No culture in the history of the world does that. So that they're, they're, they're going to be talking about you know, where they came from as a people and who their ancestors were and what their ancestors did. And you're going to get stories about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and you know, encountering God and you know, covenants and all this sort of thing. They're going to have that knowledge, but it's not going to be codified. It's not going to be written down until much later. And that's where we get essentially Genesis 12 onward come from, you know, from those, those oral traditions uh, all the way up into, again, the Mosaic period. And then, you know, you start to, to be dealing with more contemporary events and, and whatnot. Genesis 1 through 11 is a bit of a different issue. I, again, I personally think, and I think you know, if you're listening, you just heard me say this, that the, the core uh, events, you know, of, of Genesis 1 through 11 – Israelites are going to have stories, again, about creation, about a flood, about this or that, because, frankly, every culture in the ancient Near East had these things. They have, they have you know, we, we like to say they have collective memories or, or a sort of institutional memory about these things. And they have, again, their own – other cultures are going to have their own beliefs about creation, obviously, but you're going to have certain events like a flood, you know, that, that – you know, just become part of the institutional memory, the, the the civilization memory of people. So Israelites are going to have that too. When it comes down to to writing about that stuff, again, there's a lot in Genesis one through eleven that specifically responds to theologically not only the the theological religious claims and beliefs of Babylonians and other Mesopotamians, and, and Egyptians for that matter. And, you know, you even get some stuff thrown in there that targets Canaanites, you know, the wider beliefs in Canaan. You're going to have a, a collection of chapters, you know, what we call Genesis 1 through 11, that I think, again, my view is that most of that is, is going to be composed later while Israel is in Babylon, specifically the outcome being a theological polemic against the gods of the nations and against the other, you know, religions, the the, the other uh, you know belief systems of the wider ancient Near East. You know, to do that, we're not just talking about oh, they all had similar stories, and then Israel gets to, to sort of put right right their own. In Genesis one to eleven, you have specific connections in again the the, the Hebrew text of Genesis one through eleven into literary stuff in, into the into the actual documents of Mesopotamia and Egypt. There are specific connection points, speci- specific things that scribes you know, are trying to draw attention to and critique or attack or, uh, again, respond to in some way. But you're also going to have you know, some overlap because of worldview, you know, common, common way of looking at, at the, the created world and, and life and so on and so forth. So it's going to be a mix. But the point is Genesis 1 through 11 has some really specific literary connections. And to do that, you've got to have the literature. And the only place you're going to have that, again, is, is you're, going to, you're going to be living in a place where the literature is. And it's very logical that, you know, again, during, during the exile, you're going to have these texts available to you as a scribe, you know, someone who could read the material and interact with it, as opposed to, you know, M- Moses didn't drag around a portable library of, of clay tablets you know, through the desert, you know, he didn't do that. Now you you could say, well, is it conceivable that, you know, in Egypt they would have had, you know, some of this stuff? Sure, some of it. I think it's conceivable that they might have had exposure to maybe the epic, you know, epics of Mesopotamia. We we don't really know that. There's there's not necessarily a a lot of evidence for that. There is evidence that that they could, uh, that the, you know, Egyptian scribes, and you would assume if you were Egyptian royalty, again, like, like Moses was, brought up in Pharaoh's household that you could read some Akkadian because you, you know, you want to be able to do that for international correspondence. You don't want to get duped, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so there, there could have been limited exposure to, to that sort of thing. So it's not completely off the table that someone like Moses might've been able to, to work in Akkadian. Sure. But again, for what we're talking about goes beyond that. It, it, there are very specific things in Genesis one through 11 that, 
since you have somebody sitting on this side of, of everything and, and has access to these languages and these, these texts can look at the whole mass and say, okay, this writer is targeting this because he lifts this line or this phrase or uses this word. He, he brings a Sumerian word or something into, you know, the, the, the Hebrew language here. He, he borrows it again to, to, you know, for the purpose of, this, of telling the story to get, you know, that detail, you know, right or, or whatever the reason was. There are just things like that in, in Genesis 1 and 11 that have a heavy um, component uh, from this other material. And so that, that's why scholars tend to look at Genesis 1 through 11 a little differently than they look at Genesis 12 from, from uh, you know, beyond. The, the whole point of the larger you know, question is, do we believe that God was capable of picking people, many of whose names we will never know, of assembling this thing we call the Bible, the Torah in this case, or even the book of Genesis, whatever. Is God capable of equipping people for this task, providentially having them do this task, putting together through a combination of sources, polemic, and oral tradition, this thing we call the Torah? Is God capable of doing that or not? Again, the, the this is why I always say we need to let the Bible be what it is. Uh, it, it is a useless, counterproductive, and, and you know, honestly, it makes the doctrine of inspiration vulnerable if we look at the Bible as the product of a cosmic mind dump or a paranormal event, because that is not what is reflected in the text itself. If we believe that the text is inspired, we look at the text. How was the text put together? Why do we need named authors? We don't. We need a, a, a God who is capable. We need a high view of providence. We need, again, some very simple, coherent theological ideas like this. Again, that they'll all extend from theism, God's existence and his ability to get something done, to, to prompt people to do things. That, that's, that's what we need. That, that's what scripture is. You know, so back to the original, you know, the point, point where the question began, what about dates and all this stuff? Well, sometimes we can get a relative chronology. You know, where that, that looks like odds are it, things happen in this order. Sometimes you can do that. Sometimes you can do it with a, with a high level of certainty. Other times, you know, you can't. And to be honest with you, at the end of the day, does it really matter? Well, in most cases, it really doesn't matter. And, and my preference is, you know, if, when you, in graduate school, you know, have all these different fields of criticism, source criticism, you know, again, trying to chop scripture up into the original source documents. Well, the fact of the matter is those those documents that scholars create are guesses. They're speculations. Same thing for, you know, historical, you know, historical criticism. What were the historical circumstances that led to all the pieces and led to the, to the composition of the pieces? What was going on? Where did this idea come from? What's the history of this idea? They're speculation. What's not speculation is the thing that's sitting in front of you on the table. Okay, the, or, or the manuscripts or whatever. We have manuscripts. You know, think of them as artifacts. They are things that exist in real time that can be looked at and handled and read and translated and so on and so forth. So my preference was always, I don't really care about spending my life on speculating how this thing in front of me came to being, you know, came, you know, came, came into, in, into being, you know, how it was put together. I don't really care. I know something happened. And a combination of all these things. What I care about is now that I have it, now that I have this thing called, you know, the Bible, called, you know, the, the Tanakh, whatever it is, whatever portion or the whole, now that I have that in front of me, what does it mean? Okay, what, what, what does it say? What, what were the writers who put this thing together? What were they trying to communicate? I want to study the, the, the text as artifact, if you will the final form of the text, because I believe that, you know, again, God was responsible ultimately for putting this thing together. It wasn't a cosmic mind dump. He used lots of people to produce this thing. Uh, they, they come from a specific culture, specific time periods. You know, there are things going on there. They may leave, you know, clues, you know, to cr chronology like that. They may not. But what, all I know is I have this thing in front of me now. So let's try the best that we can to read it as an ancient person would have been thinking because an ancient person is the one who produced the thing or the ones who produced the thing. So that, that's why I tend 
you know, academically where I tended to land where I did, I wanted to be working in the final form of the text and, and try not to, to essentially spend every day speculating about where something came from. I'd rather deal with the thing that, that we have right here in front of us. And I don't think that it's contrary uh, in any way you know, to inspiration. Inspiration is a process, not an event. All right. Our next question is from Scott, a Minnesotan in China, Thailand. And his question is, in the New Testament, when Jesus enters a room and says, peace be with you, we know he is really speaking Aramaic and saying shalom or the Aramaic equivalent. And then it is rendered in Greek as the gospel writers recount the event. How much of the New Testament can we think of this way? Well, I would say, if to be honest, we really don't know uh, if Jesus was speaking Aramaic. I mean, it it depends on, on who's in the room. <laughs> you know, if Jesus walked into a room of Hellenistic Jews or a room with a mixed composition, Jews and Gentiles, he may have spoken Greek. I mean, we, we just don't know for sure what the scene was at any given point. You know, who, even if we have a scene in the Gospels, do we have a head count? You know, do we have an ethnicity count? Well, no. It, it's, sometimes we get more of an indication than others, but I mean, Jesus is is part of a multilingual culture, and in a multilingual culture like you know first century Judea, we can't really assume what anyone is saying at, at any given point is is in this or that language. We can go with the odds, so to speak. So if Jesus walked in a room full of Jews from his hometown or part of Judea dominated by a Jewish presence, well, Aaron makes a pretty good bet. Um, but if the parameters change, well, it could have done something else. You know, incidentally, uh, Jesus getting off into the Aramaic thing for a little bit here. Jesus isn't recorded as using Aramaic except in only a few places. There's Mark chapter 5. There's one in Mark 7. Um, some of these are parallel in Matthew. There's one in Mark 15. There are people you know, who, who have studied this. Jer, uh, Jeremias, I always get his, I don't even know if it's Jeremias or Jeremiah, but I think it's Jeremias, a New Testament scholar, uh, back in the 60s, 70s, uh, 80s, he had but roughly a couple dozen uh, Aramaic words uh, in, in the Gospels in total, so that isn't a whole lot. Uh, there are still scholars today who would suspect or argue that instead of Aramaic as being the native tongue uh, of Jesus, it might have been Mishnaic Hebrew. Um, that's possible. Uh, for those who are interested in this, um, I'm, I'm going to post a, a few articles on this, I've collected some, and um, I'll just I'll pick out a few here uh, from what I have. If if you subscribe to the newsletter, again you you'll be given a link in each each issue of the newsletter. At the bottom, there's a link to a protected folder where where I can put articles that aren't publicly accessible, uh, so that newsletter subscribers can at least you know read them. But there's one by uh, I'm looking at a list here. One by Stanley Porter. Did Jesus ever teach in Greek? It's from Tyndale Bulletin in 1993. Now, what, what Porter argues in this is, yeah, he, he could have taught in Greek. He, Porter acknowledges this is kind of a, a minority view. that Most other scholars would sort of give Jesus fluency in Aramaic or Mishnaic Hebrew, but Porter thinks he would have been trilingual. But, you know, he spends 30 pages, you know, laying out his case that Jesus could have taught in Greek, too. There's one by Grintz, Hebrew as the spoken and written language in the last days of the Second Temple. Another by Emerton, the problem of vernacular Hebrew in the first century A.D. in the language of Jesus. So these are going to get into Jesus being an Aramaic speaker, Mishnaic Hebrew speaker. Again, it's not unreasonable to think that Jesus could have been trilingual. And so we can't really assume much uh, about Jesus walks into a room and says, okay, you know, like which language he's using. You'd have to know about the context. If the context is like really, really, really distinctly Jewish, well, again, Aramaic could be a good bet, but he, you know, if we could time travel, we might have heard Jesus speak in, in Hebrew, you know, Mishnaic Hebrew. Um, we, we just, we don't know. So I wouldn't base any sort of exegetical or theological conclusions necessarily on some of these assumptions, I think we need to try to think about all the possibilities, um, you know, when it comes to this. So it's really hard to uh, to kind of reimagine what, you know, not only what Jesus or, or anybody else would have been 
you know, speaking or doing, but when it comes to literary output, you know, that, that's a whole different issue. So I think it, it makes very little sense to have uh, much more than Matthew uh, and Mark will say two of the gospels possibly written in Aramaic originally. Uh, you know, this, this whole discussion takes us into the Aramaic new Testament issue. So I might as well say something about that here. Um, there is no evidence that the Aramaic, no, no manuscript evidence that, the New Testament, any portion of it was written in Aramaic. There are some who argue for that. Again, Mark and Matthew usually become the target for that. Certainly Luke was not. Luke was a Gentile. He's writing to a Gentile. Why would he write in Aramaic? Paul's epistles are written to predominantly Gentile churches. Why would he write in Aramaic? Hey, I'm going to write you a letter, but I want half the congregation to not be able to read it. It doesn't make any sense. You know, John is much later. He lacks Hebraisms in, in many cases like Matthew. He has little to no literary dependence on Matthew and Mark. Again, if you're familiar with the synoptic uh, debate, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you know, who wrote first and who, the other two are dependent on that one. John is not in the synoptics for a reason. Most of the content in John is not in the other three. So he doesn't have a literary dependence on, on the synoptics. So again, that, that would, would suggest anyway that even if Matthew or Mark were written in Aramaic originally, John doesn't really care. You know, he, he, he comes later. He's not interested in tracking on that material. So Aramaic doesn't really make much sense for, for John and what he writes. Uh, maybe the Targum, you know, maybe he, he might have used some Targums or been influenced by Targums, like in the word theology. In the beginning was the word. You know, we've talked about this a little bit on the podcast before in relationship to the two powers in heaven idea. Where does John get that? Well, he gets it from his Old Testament. And he may have been you know, familiar with the Memra uh, material, Aramaic Targums of the Old Testament, where you have the second Yahweh figure, Memra, the word. That the, Memra is the Aramaic word for word, where you have the word of God inserted into, into certain passages. He may have been familiar with that, so there may be an, an Aramaic influence there with John, but there, there's no reason to believe that, that the gospel or Revelation, you know, were written in Aramaic. Revelation, in fact, is oriented to Asia Minor. Churches in the first few chapters, again, the, this is predominantly Gentile. It's, it's Gentile territory, predominantly Gentile churches. Why would you write in Aramaic? Even the general epistles that are aimed at Jews in the dispersion. Well, where's the dispersion? It's out in the Gentile world. So you're, you're going you're gonna, to you're have letters. Yeah, they're, they're written to a Jewish audience, but chances are they're going to get passed around among groups of believers many of whom are Gentiles. It, it just makes no sense to have an Aramaic New Testament is what I'm getting at. Again, maybe Matthew, maybe Mark, maybe an, an early gospel, something like that. But even if it makes sense for those you know, two books, we don't actually have any manuscript evidence for it. So I, 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 I'm not really sure why in my own mind, why, why people, you know, and I'm not saying that uh, this is the case you know, for Scott, but th I've met some people you know, in, in the course of being online that, you know, really, really care. And I think to an unusual degree about Jesus speaking in Aramaic and the Aramaic, Aramaic being the language of the New Testament. I, I really don't see what, why, what the concern is. Um, but again, I don't, I don't really read that in, in Scott's question. I think um, he's, this is a, this is coming from curiosity, not some sort of ideology, but I've met people again, who are in the latter camp and, it doesn't. It just doesn't make any sense to have an Aramaic New Testament. So I don't think we need to get hung up on at least that part of the question. Okay, Dana has a question about Numbers four, verse five through six in the New American Standard Bible. A porpoise skin is unclean. I'm surprised it's used to cover the Ark of the Covenant. After more research, the Hebrew takash says fine leather. It's not animal specific. Why would Hebrew scholars choose this as an acceptable translation? Well, they they would choose that because the meaning por of porpoise skin is nothing more than a conjecture. I mean, the uh, takash here, it, it, it's, uh, you know, to be, to try to make this succinct and so, some of these things don't really translate, translate well to, uh, you know, to being verbal on a podcast, but uh, I'll, I'll take take a stab at this. This word, this Hebrew lemma, has, for many scholars, you know, they've, they've argued that it has an, an Akkadian background and ultimately, therefore, a Sumerian background. 
the ESV renders it goat skin. Again, uh, Dana mentioned animal skin. Some other scholars like Milgram in his commentary opt for yellow orange, like a color as the meaning of takash and, and both the color and the sort of neutral animal skin idea really comes from the assumed uh, etymology, the assumed, the assumed bringing in of this word from the outside, Akkadian and Sumerian, into the Hebrew lexicon. The, the, here, here's how it goes. There is a term, dushu, okay, and that refers to a stone of a certain color. And so, again, you have to have a little bit of, of Semitic language background here. You say, well, what dushu doesn't sound like takash. Well, that, that's true. But you can have a word in one language that doesn't have all of the consonantal similarities in another language still speak of the same object. I mean, we have this today in modern languages, and it, and it, it often works that way in the ancient world. Uh, there, you know, every Akkadian word, for instance, doesn't share the same consonants as every Hebrew word. Akkadian is Semitic, Hebrew is Semitic, but Akkadian is Eastern North, Hebrew is Northwest Semitic. They're different. There's geography to it. There's different language groups and dialects and sub subgroups and all this sort of stuff. The reason why this seems like a good correlation is you have dushu, and that comes from Sumerian du shi a. That is alignable to a Hurrian word tuk sive. So now you're getting into the takash sort of phonological neighborhood. So by virtue of Akkadian and Hurrian, this is what it would be like the, the Nuzi dialect is Hurrian. You may have heard of the Nuzi tablets when it comes to the patriarchs. Because Hurrian and Akkadian sources align these two things, Dushu and Tuxive, okay? Because they align those terms to speak of the same thing, scholars take that, they notice the, the correlation with the, the Hurrian dialect. And they say, okay, well, that, that sounds a lot like Takash. And let's go look and, and see what that meant in Akkadian. And Akkadian referred to a stone of a particular color. And so some scholars would, would argue that Takash refers to the particular color that resulted from dyeing leather. There you get your animal skin idea. Dyeing leather um, in, in the culture. Now, you notice in all of that, we didn't say anything about dolphins or porpoises. I don't know. I don't know of anybody who would really defend that idea. The, the, the whole porpoise skin, you know, that it probably. I hate to put it this way, but it probably comes from older English translations or, or you know traditions about the translation. Um, however, to, to be fair, uh, Levine. I, I've you know I, I've looked this up in Levine's Numbers Commentary, and he says that quote. Dolphin skins were used quite extensively in the ancient Near East and in certain cults. That's what he says. He doesn't really, he doesn't ever say that, that this term means that, but he happens to discuss that at one point in his commentary. So we don't really know why porpoise skin or dolphin skin would, would be an acceptable translation here etymologically. Again, if, and if you're doing the comparative Semitic vocabulary, it seems that a better option is either to translate it as the thing being dyed, i.e. the animal skin, or the color that results. And so that's where you're going you're to find most commentators land, again, because of Akkadian and Sumerian and the, and the Hurrian linguistic evidence. So again, having said all of that, I can't find any passage where this lemma, takash, occurs in a description of something unclean. A takash doesn't occur in Leviticus at all, for example. So I don't really know why the unclean element uh, is part of the conversation. Uh, maybe if uh, under the assumption that we're dealing with a porpoise skin and that relates to some other animal group, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I didn't, I don't want to sit here and, and search through everything. Um, that, that makes for a really boring podcast, but again, a quick search of the lemma, uh, it, it doesn't occur in any passage that names unclean things. So I'm not really sure uh, why, Again, that's part of the question, but I thought I'd throw that out there. You know, maybe some people thought it was unclean because, again, Near Eastern cults use dolphin skins and then they just made that correlation. Okay, well, I, I could see how you would get there then. 
But the fact of the matter is, if you actually look up this lemma's usage in the Hebrew Bible, it doesn't occur in, in passages that list that. I mean, maybe it has a homograph, I, I don't know um, at, at this point. But again, from what I, what I do know, you know, just fielding the question, um, that's how I would answer it. Marion's question is about Genesis 15, verse 16. What does it mean that in iniquity of the Amorites is not complete? What does complete mean? Is God waiting until a certain amount of time has passed or until the iniquity has reached a point where he will no longer allow it to continue? It almost sounds as if the Amorites have the protection of the unseen realm with a prior agreement that they could sin up to a certain point in time. Yeah, I, I, I would think that's reading a lot into the, uh, the last part there is reading a lot into the, the passage. There's certainly nothing in this passage or in any other passage that indicates that God sort of just winks at sin or, or you know, apostasy or whatever, like, like there's a quota to fulfill before he gets angry. Um, there's nothing like that. But I, I understand the, the, the trajectory, though. Um, I, I think to start off, it's good to, to remind ourselves that Amorites – uh, is a generic term uh, in, in some cases, in some contexts, and I and I would um, make it part of this context uh, relating to giant clans. Uh, I, I wrote about this in Unseen Realm, where there are you know places in Joshua, like Joshua chapter seven, I think it's around verse seven, referred to the occupants of the land as Amorites. You certainly get that in Amos two nine through ten, referring to the the those who were you know, driven out. And, and also specifically the ones who are very tall uh, as Amorites. That's important because it's abundantly clear that there are other ethnic groups in the land. You've got Parasites, Hittites, Hivites, you know, all that, that whole list. Uh, but the Amorites is sort of this, this, again, in certain contexts, this umbrella term for the giant clans. So I think that that's important to, to sort of have running in the background when we think about this. I actually think there are two options here, neither of which is, is about, Again, what I would loosely refer to here, just for the sake of the question, as sort of a, a sin quota or an evil, evilness, if that's even a word, quota. Uh, option number one, I think the easiest parsing of the comment is that it's an expression that means something like, it's not yet time to punish the Amorites. Okay, for, for whatever reason, we wouldn't be given a reason. Not that, hey, they're not quite wicked enough for me to get angry about them. I don't think that's the point. I think it's, God has his own, uh, you know, reasoning, his own timing, which may factor into the second option here. But I think, you know, just looking at it like it's, it's not yet time to punish the Amorites. I, I've, I've not decided yet to act on the Amorites. Now, you could also read it, though, that God's judgment of the Amorites wouldn't necessarily wait until the conquest that we think of under Moses and Joshua, but God was about to initiate it, and it would take a long time, but it would, but Abraham's seed, because since he's talking to Abraham in Genesis 15, Abraham's seed would 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 be the one, the, the vehicle through which the Amorites would ultimately be judged, but it would occur over a long period of time. So the, the second option, I guess I could put it this way, you could argue that it means the Amorites haven't yet been fully punished for their iniquity, or that their punishment is about to be launched and will be in process for a long time. Now, that option would presume, again, as, as I write about an unseen realm uh, in the discussion of Og's bed, that option would presume that Amorite is sort of a, a conceptual play on Babylonian, or the, the, the idea that Babylon was the source of, of evil and chaos. And you get there because Mar 2, M A R dot T U in Sumerian, all caps, Mar 2, which was their word for Amorite, it actually, you know, there's a Sumerian term here at, at, at the base of Amorite is what I'm trying to say here. And Martu is the Sumerian word. Martu in Sumerian vaguely refers to the Aryan population west of Sumer and, you know, and Babylon, sort of that general area. So by, since that was the term there, maybe Amorite comes from Martu and then that links the Amorites to the Babylonian part of the world. And when, when, once you do that, the whole Babylonian complex of ideas in scripture, especially Genesis 1 through 11. So, you know, why is the world, you know, so messed up? Well, there, as I've said many times here, there are three reasons for that. It's the fall, Genesis 6, and then the Babel event. Well, the Genesis 6 event and the Babel event, if anybody's read Unseen Realm, and especially if you've read Reversing Hermon, you know that episodes 2 and 3 are deeply entrenched 
in this idea of Babylon as the source of everything that is contrary to the way the God of the Bible wants it to be. And, and so the, the, there could be this thing going on with the term Amorite. So you might have this, you know, in play that that God is about to act. They haven't yet been, you know, punished for their iniquity, but hey, it's right around the right around the corner in, in terms of you know God's perspective because He's doesn't really care about time, but He's going to raise up the mechanism for punishment through Abraham and his seed, and that's ultimately what happens in the biblical story. So now we know to add another layer here, we know from Deuteronomy two and three that the punishment of the giant clans was an ongoing process, okay, involving Abraham's descendants, Abraham's seed versus the giant clans. We, we know that because if we read Deuteronomy 2 and 3, it's the descendants of Esau that were used to get rid of the giants in the Transjordan, at least most of them. You know, Og of Bashan is still left. And of course, Moses and Joshua are going to take care of business there. But in the process, you know, you've had other descendants of Abraham actually being the agents to address the Amorites. And so maybe when, when God, you know, speaks to Abraham in this way, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. You know, he could either be saying sort of a little bit neutrally, hey, it's, it's not yet time to punish them. We're, we'll get to that. Or some idea that, well, they haven't been fully punished yet, you know, for their iniquity, but we're about to start that ball rolling. So one, there's a, there's a bit of a time differential between the two options, but in, in neither case is it about the Amorites sort of meeting some bar of evilness, you know, some bar of iniquity, so that now they're punishment eligible. They're, they're punishment eligible long before they get what's coming to them. So again, I don't think that's the point. I think that the point is is something about either God's timing or, again, the amount of time, the process through which the Amorites would be judged. Travis has a question, and it is, do you have a view on the eternal functional subordination debate? It seems like an area dominated by New Testament scholars, but I would think the eternal part would have to draw on the revelation of the Godhead prior to the incarnation. So I wonder what you think in light of your work on the two powers idea. Well, I, you know, I, this one's a little hard for me to care about. Um, so I think Travis's suspicion, you know, do, I read a little bit into this. You know, do, do I have a view on it? You know, I, both sides of this are not going to deny the eternality in terms of ontology of the persons of the Trinity. So I don't really care if the subordination of the Son and Spirit are eternal or temporary. Again, the subordination, because... I don't think a subordinate relationship detracts from the essence or the ontology of the Spirit or the Son. And frankly, I don't really consider any arguments to that effect to be at all persuasive. Subordination is really about role relationships between the persons of the Trinity. It's not about essence or ontology. Now, you know, I, I'll try to try to use an analogy here, and all analogies are imperfect because we're talking about deity and a Godhead. So bear with me here. But if you had three human clones created from scratch, as it were, they could have a hierarchical relationship between them, but they'd all be fully human and they'd all have the same DNA. In other words, the roles that each one took wouldn't make one of them ontologically inferior to any of the other ones. And, and this is how I, I view the, the whole thing with the Trinity. I think you, there's a theological problem if you have a difference of ontology. You know, ontology, again, is, the, is what a thing is, okay? If you had a difference of ontology between the persons, if you were talking a lot like that, well, yeah, I have a problem with that because you can't really have degrees of, 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 of deity. You know, the, 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 the persons are either the same in essence or they're not. But that's ontology. Again, subordination is, is really about how they relate to each other. So again, I don't really compare if their relationship to each other is something that grows out of eternity or it was temporary. You know, I, I, I can't really say it in any way. I, I don't really care too much uh, about the debate. Ultimately, I don't think it's something we can know uh, for sure. We're only, we're only going to find out about that later with any, you know, any precision. So I don't really spend a whole lot of time kind of, you know, skinning that cat, to be honest with you. Daryl from Newton, Mississippi has two questions. And his first one is, 
I heard Dr. Heiser mention that the earth was populated with other people while Adam and Eve were in the garden. Could you please elaborate on that? Well, Dr. Heiser doesn't claim that. What I claim is that this is one way that you could read certain passages in Genesis. Uh, I don't really feel compelled one way or the other. Again, it's just this or that passage could be read to it could be read as evidence that there were other other people besides Adam and Eve. But again, there are ways to read the same passages that you know would sort of get around that or explain the language. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be married you know to the views, but you know we want to be honest about what what the the text says and how it could be read. So you know with with that sort of setup, you know this gets us into there are really two views of this. There's there's pre-Adamism that there were humans around before Adam that were, you know, precursors. And then there's co-atomism. You know, there are humans alongside of Adam and Eve. Co-atomism, I don't know, it, it, it might be easier to argue than the other one, uh, but it's all based on circumstantial evidence anyway. Either view is circumstantial evidence. And circumstantial evidence isn't exegesis. But again, that the text could be read in, in, in certain ways. Um, and I'll, I'll try to illustrate that. So the, the argument for other people besides Adam and Eve, let's leave the pre and the co you know, out as much as we can just to simplify. The argument for other people besides Adam and Eve you know, being part of the biblical story or part of the biblical world, let's put it that way, it, at the same time period of Adam and Eve really operates on two trajectories. One is there are passages that suggest there were other people besides Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. Again, suggest is the operative word. They don't state it, but they, they, they can be read to suggest that. Now, I say Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel because those are the only two children. We're told that Adam and Eve had up until, of course, Abel is murdered, then he's replaced by Seth. So we're really only told about Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, and those, those two lineages. Okay, that, that's that's who we know about in the early chapters of Genesis. Nevertheless, we read stuff like this. Okay, here's Genesis 4, 14 through 17. Again, this is the Cain and Abel story. And this is after Cain has, has uh, killed Abel. We read in verse 14, Behold, you know, Cain is speaking to God. Behold, you have driven me away today from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Whoever finds me will kill me. He's Cain's expecting that somebody might find him. Well, where did they come from? Verse 15, Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him, what, a thousand years later, 500 years later, a hundred years later? I mean, it seems like when God puts a mark on Cain to protect him, that the protection is needed right then. So the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, well, where'd she come from? And she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, you know, when Cain built a city, again, we, we read that for the sake of our discussion here as Cain, when Cain built a city, well, did he build it by himself? How could, how could one guy build a city? Or maybe Enoch helps. So now there's two guys. Maybe his son helps. So they have two people building a city. I mean, it, it seems like to build a city or even a, you know, a, a decent-sized town or a village that you'd need help. So when he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. So in, in verses 14 through 17, you've got several, again, suggestions, again, ways that the things in the text that can be read as though they just assume that there are other people around. It, it continues. If you keep reading in Genesis 4, you hit verse 25. Okay, listen to this one. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. Verse 26, so to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. So now who do we have? We've got Adam, Eve, we've got Cain, we've got Seth replacing Abel, and Seth has a son, Enosh. So we've got five people. 
So at that time, ESV has people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now that raises a question of why would why would the verse be translated that way? Because when you translate it, people, it begs the question of, well, why not just say at that time they began to call the name of the Lord? Which of course begs another question, like who are they, who have they been calling on before? Uh, why not just say they began, or why not just be you know said Adam and Eve and their children began to call on the name of the Lord? Now, if you actually look at the text, the translation of people actually derives from a kind of an uncertainty as to what to do with the Hebrew text, because you you, you essentially have a word for at that time Oz in Hebrew, so at that time, and then you have began to call and. The word translated began is third masculine singular. So you could translate this another a couple of different ways. You could say he began, but that doesn't really again make sense because which one? You know, who who began to call on the name of the Lord? But even though you could translate it that way. A corporate translation implies again that everybody in the group began to call on the name of the Lord. And you could say again if if you're if you want to deny that there are other people around besides these five people, you'd say, well, that's the way you should translate it. They began to call on the name of the Lord. These five people here, okay, you could do that. But some would object and say, well, didn't they have a relationship with God already? It, it, it seems to suggest, at least to the mind of some, that they, again, some other collective group, began to call the name of the Lord. Like like it's it's an observation that sort of marks out other people besides the family of Adam and Eve, whom we would assume are already doing this. So there, there's ambiguity in the text, and, and frankly, that, that's just what you get with the whole thing. So we, we read, again, a couple of instances here, just to try to summarize. We read Genesis 4, 14 through 17, then 25 through 26. And so some people look at these passages and they ask the questions that I've vocalized that I've mouthed here as we proceed through the translation. And they would argue that, look, the wording here suggests that there's somebody else around besides Adam and Eve and their kids. You know, so again, it, it's suggestive. It's speculative. It's not exegesis. It, it, these are circum, it, it's circumstantial evidence. It's, it's things that are there in the text that could be read a certain way. So Honestly, there, that's about the best you can do here. But there are some who would look at the text and say, well, I think we ought to read it this way because of, you know, some other thought, some other issue, some other thing. You know, and one of those things, as I put on the blog, could be the whole discussion of human evolution and genetics and DNA statistics and all this kind of stuff that we, we did this series a few years ago about the historical atom and all, that whole debate you know, statistical genetics and so on and so forth. That discussion some in some cases prompts people to look at these passages and say, well, you know, the, the scripture actually could be read in such a way. I mean, le- legitimately, I mean, you, you could read it as assuming that there are other people there. And then that becomes, you know, your, your, your touch point for addressing some of these maybe scientific concerns or whatnot. Again, you're, you're still making a text-based argument. Uh, you're just going with again a, a reading of the text that that could be possible, but you know the other side you know could uh, you know just as well turn around and say no we shouldn't we shouldn't you know look at the verse this way okay that's one trajectory these kind of verses the second trajectory on which this idea is based on might sound a little more arcane but the, there you know I think there is something to this I don't know if it means that there were other people on on earth besides Adam and Eve, although it, the implication is, again, the implication is that it, it could point us in that direction. And that is, is Adam a deliberate analogy to Israel? Okay, are, are Adam and Israel in the biblical story designed? Are these stories told in such a way that we are supposed to draw a link between Adam and Israel? We're supposed to think of one when we think of the other. So. The way this goes, and we actually did, I'm trying to remember, I don't think we did an episode on this. I think I, I blogged about it. We, I talked about um, Seth Postel's work, Adam as Israel. Now, now Seth does not um, believe that there were other humans other than Adam and Eve. But his book actually draws attention 
to the number of correlations between the way Adam is described in his part of the biblical story and the way Israel is described in its part of the story. Both are, for instance, the Son of God. Both are raised up supernaturally. Okay, you, you get the idea. You, you're trying to draw analogies, points of correlation between the two. So was you know, as Israel was a people selected out of all the other people on earth to be God's people, and that's not quite a, a good statement because Israel's actually produced supernaturally through Abraham and Sarah, but Israel becomes elect. They become the body of humanity, the, the, the subset of humanity that, that becomes God's people. They're elect. They're chosen from among all other peoples. God could have chosen people who already existed, but instead he creates a new. He creates Israel from Abraham and Sarah. And some people would say, well, that's just like what, what he does with, with Adam, at least possibly. There could have been other humans around. Look at Genesis 4. And so God just decides to pick Adam as his son, choose Adam as his son and his line as his people. And then that line, of course, becomes part of the people he would select later. There's a lineage that leads to Abraham. And of course, Abraham is the progenitor of Israel. So as Israel was a people selected out of all other people on earth to be God's people, is it the same with Adam? Is he selected out of a larger group? Again, there there are people who make literary cases and, and good ones. I mean, these are good text-based cases for conceptual and literary links between the portraits of Adam and Israel. And so the question becomes, the second trajectory is, well, if that's the case, if we're supposed to think of one and then think of the other, and if we really kind of press the analogy that there were other humans around, certainly when Israel was created, could we presume the same thing of Adam, that there were other humans around? You know, and, and so God picks Adam, and then the biblical story becomes about this one person and his wife and their their children again who knows these are these are arguments by circumstantial evidence and suggestion it's not that you could do exegesis and really you know build a a very strong argument for that idea and that cancels out the other ones you can't really do that but again to be fair there are things in the text that if you approach them a certain way you could come out with this view Timothy's second question and the last question of the episode is, can you explain 1 Timothy 2, verse 10 through 15? <laughs> no, not in a Q&A. <laughs> um, you know, this, this whole passage, this is about women, you know, not teaching and being silent and, you know, in, in church. Um, this is, of course, the passage is related to the larger women in ministry, you know, women in the church issue. Honestly, you can argue both sides pretty well uh, from the text. Now, for, for people who have sort of followed my website, my blog for any amount of time, years ago I did a blog series on the women in ministry uh, issue with John Hobbins. Uh, John and his wife are both pastors. And so I told John, you know, I wanted to do this. And I said, your job is to make me care about the issue. Because, again, my view is this is so far down my list of things to really care about because because I see ambiguity in the text at key points. And that is what allows us to argue both sides well from the text. So I said, John, if you can make me care and make me make, make me feel like I need to to like land somewhere and then diss the other side, go ahead. Uh, but he he failed. <laughs> I still feel the same way about it, but it was fun. Uh, again, I, I, I tend to not get terribly invested in issues where positions get stalled in textual ambiguity. To me, the, they become, by definition, issues of conscience. And that's really, for instance, what I would tell my daughter if I had my daughter come up to me and say, hey, I, I feel God has, is calling me into the ministry. I would say, well, you know, that's between you and the Lord. Uh, I can't honestly you know, say that I'm sure you're, you're doing the right thing or, or the wrong thing. I, I don't know. But do well. And be a blessing. That, that's exactly what I would tell my daughter. Do the best you can. Be a blessing. You know, have a good ministry. This is between you and the Lord. So when it comes to 1 Timothy 2, I mean, this little subset of the women in ministry issue, um, the passage itself has a few workable possibilities, uh, some that might seem better than others, but there's nothing, there's no one view that renders all of the other possibilities fundamentally incoherent and indefensible. 
Uh, so again, you, you, you're dealing with a, a difficult passage that has certain ambiguities uh, about what's in the text. Now, to illustrate, I'll, I'll make one exegetical observation about 1 Timothy 2, 10 through 15, and I'll use that as a basis for a position. In other words, I'm going to pretend here. This is a thought experiment. Uh, for the sake of the, of the question of the podcast. So I could look at the passage and say, well, you know, Paul in this passage really makes his judgment deeply personal. He says, you know, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she's to remain quiet. For Adam was first formed than Eve. Adam was not deceived. The woman was deceived and became a transgressor. You know, if we if we go back into the passage, you know, again, just looking at at that, it looks like, you know, when he says, I do not permit, it looks like Paul is making a, a personal argument. And the exegetical point is that, you know, Paul uses the first person, I wouldn't do X, Y, or Z. And I could interpret that and say, well, you know, that means his advice may be just that, a personal preference based on the rationale that he gives about Genesis. But, you know, Paul conveniently leaves out that the man sinned willfully. He's concerned that the the woman, you know, was deceived and not the man. But what he leaves out the fact that Adam sinned with a high hand, so to speak. He sinned with full knowledge. So if Paul's point is that women shouldn't teach because they fall victim to false teaching more than men, why not flip it around and say men are more dangerous to have as teachers because they can turn around and deceive people deliberately? Well, he doesn't do that. The fact that Paul leaves something so obvious out of the discussion suggests to me that this is a personal preference born of some situation that influenced his thinking. Or perhaps it's the familiar model of Judaism. He was a Pharisee and all that. At any rate, I could argue that the passage can be read as 1 Corinthians 7, for example, is read, where Paul just tells people where he's at. Hey, you know, it, you know I wish that you were all like me or or, you know, I'm going to give my judgment on this. He's trying to give good advice for reasons that may not make complete sense to us, but did make sense to him and others because they were living at a certain, you know, in a certain context there at Corinth or here with Timothy. We may not be aware of, of every, every reason that prompted Paul to say what he said. But my exegetical observation is here. He uses the first person, which means he's giving personal advice. Now, I can do that all day long. I can take some other point of the passage and argue for a totally different view. And this is the problem with 1 Timothy 2. It's the problem with the women in ministry issue. At any given point, I could argue either side of these questions pretty clearly and pretty effectively, again, using the text as my touch point not caring about gender issues, feminine issues, this or that group, this or that ministry that takes this that position. I you know, don't care about any of that. Again, the, the question is what, what is, what can the text sustain? And depending on what you emphasize in your exegesis, you can come down at different points and still build an exegetical argument on either side. And for those who are interested in this, you know, you can go back and look at the, at the, the exchange between myself and, and John um, again, his job was not to convert me. His job was to make me care enough about taking a position. And like I said, he failed, but it was fun. Um, there's just, I, don't, I can't say it any other way. I really don't feel that it's a good use of, of my time and that I, I should really be pontificating too, you know, too heavily on an issue that really there's, there's in this one, there's, there's three or four points. There's three or four passages that will make the issue turn in one direction or the other. And the, the honest thing to say is that it could go either way because there's ambiguity built up in the text. It, it's just there. We, we, you have to be omniscient to really sort this one out. That, that's, that's the most honest thing I can say. If you want to use the prophecy thing as an analogy, let, like the rapture, are you a splitter or a joiner? When it comes to descriptions of the Lord's return, should you, we put them in two piles or one? You put them in two piles, you have a rapture and a second coming. You put them in one, you got one event. Which one is, is the right answer? I don't know. Yeah, I just don't know. I, I can build an argument for either one and have it look wonderful and elegant. But at the end of the day, I have to tell you that I am landing here because I just decided to emphasize this over that. 
And that's what you got with the women in issue issue. It's what you have with first Timothy two. And by the way, we didn't even get to the last part of the passage, the whole thing about she shall be saved through childbearing. Okay, that, that's a whole separate issue. This passage would, would take a whole, I, I would say probably two or three episodes of the podcast to just sort of navigate uh, the waters, you know, through this passage. And of course, since, since this is first Timothy two, the whole wider issue of, um, you know, how you'd argue, you know, the, the, the women's issue in, in either direction, that, that would take probably three podcast episodes, but I, you know, for those of you who that might sound like good news, I would say don't expect that anytime soon because we are about to start into a new book study. And uh, again, I care about that, honestly, the, the book study more than I care about, you know, this issue. At least that's where I'm at right now. Our first one is going to be from Rick, and he wants to know what changed between the Old Testament giving and the New Testament giving. Yeah, well, that's yeah, that's a that's an important question, also a pr- pretty variegated question. I mean, the short answer is the uh, the theocracy went away. <laughs> I think that's probably the easiest place to start. I mean. It, on, on my website, I think for anybody who's listening and interested in the subject of giving and tithing, if you go to drmsh.com and put in the word tithing, that's T-I-T-H-I-N-G, you're going to get to a blog post where I have links to a two-part article series uh, on tithing that I think is really well done. So that would give you the the details of, of what I'm going to what I'm going to say here. Um, not the two articles aren't things that I've written, but I, they're written by somebody else. I just think it covers really all the bases and does a good job of it. You know, once you have the, the theocracy gone, that affects a lot because the tithing system of the Old Testament was meant to maintain the priesthood of, of this, this whole theocratic system that we think of as ancient Israel. You know, when the temple goes out I was going to say out the window, but when the temple, you know, burns down, you know, it, it, it's gone. And now there's still a priesthood around, but there were certain parts of the tithing system that were linked to certain things you did in the temple. Okay, that that's going to naturally change things. Um, you know, when the temple was rebuilt, I mean, it's not quite what it was in, in Solomon's day. You don't have political independence. You don't have political autonomy. Uh, like you did under the days of, of, you know, David and Solomon, a lot of the Old Testament laws about tithing certain resources, you know, just went with a certain lifestyle, a certain way of life that was geared to having a country, having that country run from a city, having a monarchy, having a temple. All of that gets gets shuffled and changed, you know, with the loss of a temple, the loss of a theocratic way of life. Now, you still have, you know, people in synagogues, like in after the temple is destroyed, you have the synagogue system develop. You had people teaching in the synagogues, and, and they, you know, could still expect, I think, both culturally and, and scripturally, um, that the idea of supporting those kinds of people, especially if they, they are still in the role of a priest, even though what they do now is is somewhat limited, again, in the absence of a temple um, or the same you know, kind of uh, system and setup, they, they still you know, have the right to be uh, supported and maintained. You know, this is the way it was just generally in the ancient Near East. This is how priests lived. Their livelihood came from contributions, you know, sacrifices, maybe contributions of land or you know, physical goods, metals, whatever, you know, this is, this is how they lived. Now, in the New Testament era, again, when the, the whole people of God moves away from having an, an ethnic identity and a theocratic identity, so to now we're including, you know, Gentiles in, in the very fabric of the people of God. In, in the New Testament era, according to what the New Testament says, everybody's a priest, priesthood of the believer. So by definition, that just doesn't conform, you know, to the Old Testament system. And this is in part why you don't have a carryover in the New Testament of, of the, the tithing language or the system of the Old Testament. Now, Paul, though, taught that he had the right to this kind of support as a servant of God. I mean, he didn't, he didn't take it. 
he decided, you know, to do, you know, do tent making, you know, to support himself. But he does remind, you know, readers, like in the epistles to the Corinthians, that he, as an apostle, he could have demanded, you know, this sort of thing and would have had, you know, ground to stand on, so to speak. But he doesn't do that. Again, that's in place, even though it's not a priestly model so much like the Israelite culture, the Israelite system, what we we read in the Hebrew Bible, you know, the there's just this presupposition that servants of God just generally should be supported by the believing community. If you think about the Old Testament, there is this sort of system of support outside the direct theocratic monarchical sort of situation. The prophets, for instance, okay, there, there, there's no like, you're not, you're not going to read in the, in the Torah about specific tithes going to prophets. The prophets were something different. They, you know, they were people raised up during the days of the monarchy, the united monarchy, the divided monarchy, again, to, you know, God raising up essentially covenant enforcers. That's what prophets were. They would preach to people about being loyal to God, loyal to the covenant, and all that sort of thing. Well, those, those people, just culturally, it was assumed that they you know, somebody's going to support them. You know, Elijah, you know, had the situation with the widow and the room and board, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Th- there were people in the community that would contribute to recognized individuals that were considered to speak for God. And, and that, that's kind of what Paul's drawing on as well. Um, you had Isaiah, who was sort of a prophet of the, of the royal court. You know, he, that was a little bit different. He's probably getting some support from the monarchy itself, you know, at that point. But there's what I'm pointing to is there's just this assumption in Scripture and by example, the the legitimizing of the assumption that servants of God should be supported by the community. So broadly speaking, that's intact, even if the theocratic, you know, tithing system is not, even though that doesn't survive from Old and New Testament, the general idea does. Uh, this gets muddied a little bit in the New Testament because there, in the New Testament, all the passages that that pastors like to use to convince people that they should be tithing. If you actually look at those passages, it's let's just use you know what happens in the Book of Acts and Paul. Paul is going around collecting money for the saints in Jerusalem. Okay, you, you don't you don't actually have this this weekly giving system. For individual churches, Paul doesn't go into a church and, and, and start preaching tithing for that church. Wherever he goes, apparently, because he brings it up a lot, there's this notion of, hey, you know, you sister churches here that I'm starting and that I, I started or that I'm, I'm, I'm in your presence now, you know, all of this, the gospel, you know, started back with, the, with Jesus and the disciples. And there's this Jerusalem church that's notoriously poor they're under persecution all the time, and it's pretty big, so that kind of compounds the problem. You know, he he takes up collections for them, for a, an altogether different church, and that's actually what you see described uh, in in the New Testament. You don't have a new tithing system for individual local churches laid out. You have this general assumption that the labor is worthy of his hire, but then the actual giving passages are really for a, this one church back in Jerusalem. So you don't have a whole lot of scriptural structure for this. But what, what happens is, well, the Old Testament's in our Bible, and so we're going to preach tithing, even though that was Israel and the theocracy and the priesthood, even though we don't have that. And I, I, I mean, I understand that, but I, I think we're better off, and I think this is what the New Testament actually does, is it teaches the principle of giving. It teaches that the laborer is worthy of his hire, and you should give cheerfully, you should give sacrificially. It's not about a certain percentage. You, sh- you should contribute and give what you can. And you know what you can. You know what sacrificial is. You know what, you know, you, you know whether you're sort of not doing your part or whether you are. And, and the New Testament leaves that up to the individual, but it lays down the principle of, of cheerful giving, sacrificial giving, and the labor being worthy of his hire. It doesn't worry about strict percentages like we had in in the theocratic system. So there really are no New Testament rules about tithing, but there are very clear principles about the Lord's servants being supported. Uh, It's just that we don't have this strict percentage system layout uh, like we do in the Old Testament. Martin in Enid, Oklahoma, ask, was Yahweh's presence absent from the Second Temple because of the Ark of the Covenant was no longer present? 
Yeah, I think that is the conclusion we're supposed to draw. I mean, Ezekiel has the glory, you know, the, the presence of God departing uh, before Jerusalem and its temple are destroyed. Uh, again, we, we covered that in our series on Ezekiel. There's no evidence anybody thereafter uh, in the second temple period when they build, you know, they rebuild uh, the, the temple or they actually build, you know, a second temple. There's no evidence that anybody thought that the glory had returned. Uh, there's, there's no there's no passage that gives that indication. Interestingly enough, though, even though the, the, the question presupposes something that, that, that's correct, you know, the God's presence is, is gone from the temple. Again, it, it's not, you know, just the ark. It's, it's because of the apostasy. But the ark, you know, is, is gone and so on and so forth. The glory departs before Jerusalem, the temple are destroyed. Okay, that, that's, that's pretty self-evident. Evident. But what's really interesting is that the New Testament takes this idea about the return of the glory. It actually takes certain passages that talk about the return of the glory, you know, seeing God in in Jerusalem again, and applies them to Jesus. Now, I'll just give you a few for instances here. In Ephesians 5.14, we read, For anything that becomes visible is light, therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You say, well, what does that have to do with the temple? Well, it's actually a use, a repurposing of Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2. Now listen to that. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Okay, this is Isaiah 60. This is set in a post or an exilic and post exilic era. So here you have a situation where the the future glory, you know, of God is is again going to be you know shining, you know, upon Jerusalem, upon Israel again, and Paul takes that and applies it to Jesus. Arise, Christ will shine on you. You, you just you know you have John the Baptist. John the Baptist is herald. He's the herald of the coming of the of the Messiah. But but there's actually glory language connected to the passages that the gospel uses or use to talk about the messenger that comes before the Messiah. Isaiah 40, verse 5, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. There's a reference to the glory, pretty explicit. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You know, if you, if you go out to Isaiah 40, again, this is, you know, the crooked, you know, places will be made straight. And this is this messianic language. And Mark and other gospel writers quote Isaiah 40, verse 5, and other parts of Isaiah 40 to give context to John the Baptist being the herald from Isaiah 40, who is announcing the coming, the return of the Lord, the return of the glory. And that turns out to be Jesus in the Gospels. You know, you, you get a passage like Isaiah 66, verses 18 and uh, through 19, you know, that you get you know, sort of a similar feel to this. It, verse 18 says, For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and shall see my glory. And I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors to the nations, to Tarshish, to Pol, to Lud who draw the bow to Tabal and Javan, to the coastlands far away that have not heard my fame or seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. Now, look at the elements of that. The time is coming to gather all nations in tongues. They shall come and shall see my glory. And I'm going to set this sign among them, okay? And then they're going to they're going to go from here. They're going to they're going to spread all over to these different nations. Tarshish, of course, ought to draw the interest of this audience. Uh, you know, Tubal, Javan. I mean, the, the, these are places mentioned in the table of nations, uh, so on and so forth. To the coastlands that are far away. Why? Why am I sending them out? Because they have not heard my fame or seen my glory, and I'm going to make sure that it's declared among the nations. If you look at that. And Paul, in a few of his epistles, draws on Isaiah 66, this passage, to talk about his own ministry. And then you look at what happens in Acts chapter 2 with the coming of the Spirit, when the nation, you know, people from the nations are gathered, they see 
you know, the, this, this miracle of Pentecost, and then they go back to their nations and start, you know, spreading the word about the Messiah, you could actually make a good argument that the pouring out of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2 is the return of the glory. And, you know, it's not, it's not, it's different, but it's the same as Jesus, you know, this whole Jesus is, but isn't the Spirit, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, that, that these events, let's just speak broadly, the, the coming of Messiah, you know, God incarnate, and then following his resurrection and ascension, the coming of the Spirit in his place, that this is the return of the glory. I mean, it's very easy to draw that conclusion from the New Testament. So you don't need an ark. You don't even need a temple. Because in the New Testament, what, what's up with that? Well, we're the temple. You know, again, we, we've had the, the full episode we had, like on Ezekiel 40 through 48, the, the part two, we got into all this New Testament temple language. This is where the glory is now. Okay, you know, all, all this, this language about the glory in the temple, it's applied to believers and Jesus. Why, you know, again, why is that consistent? Because we are the body of Christ. I mean, the, the, these terms and these metaphors are used to point to these, these you know, these, these spiritual items, these theological items, deliberately. Again, this is all theological messaging, uh, you know, repurposing the Old Testament. Dan wants to know if the third heaven, also called paradise a couple of lines later, is what we commonly think of as heaven. What are the first and second heavens? Yeah, it's actually it's actually all of the above. Um, you know, we have to remember when we get into this that heaven heaven doesn't have literal geography. There's no latitude and longitude. There's no literal levels or stages as though when you were in one you could measure their size or their distance from each other okay so we got we have to be careful that we don't overly literalize the language when it talks about heaven or these levels of heaven and so on and so forth i mean they're they're all this other place and they you know they're they're spoken of in in these ways to distinguish parts of them, and again, we, we we are forced to use the language of space. We are forced to use spatial language, the language of embodiment and physicality, to talk about a spiritual realm that doesn't actually have those things, because it's not the world of 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 our experience and our embodiment. But the only way we can talk about those other things is to use the language of our experience and of our embodiment. This is just always the way it is uh, in, in Scripture and in our own discussions. So with, with that in mind, the levels language is trying to communicate that the presence of God, God himself, like, like where the presence is in the spiritual world, that that spot, as it were, and realize we can't even speak of God in that way correctly, because that makes God a spatial being. But God is omnipresent. Okay, you see the problem we have of even using this language, but I'm, I'm just going to try to wade through it because that's what we have to do. So the levels language is trying to communicate that the presence of God is the holiest place in the spiritual world. God occupies in Paul's language, the third level. Some, there are some ancient texts from the Second Temple period that have three levels of heaven. Second Corinthians 12, 2 is you know, what the, the question is really deriving from. Other texts have seven levels. You say, well, why is it different? You know what? Well, they're all talking, trying to communicate the same idea, that, that the highest level, the seventh level, or the third you know, level, is, the, the place where God is at, that's the holiest spot, the holiest place. The language tries to parse out where we are in the spiritual realm, where other objects are in the spiritual realm, and then where God himself is in the spiritual realm. And so it has to use this, this level language to do that, uh, again, to, to make sure that God is given the preeminent place. He is the preeminent being on, you know, in this, this plane of reality, the spiritual world. You know, again, it's just a way of establishing, to use a, a Levitical you know, way of expressing it, gradations of holiness. You know, if you think about the temple, the tabernacle and the temple, there were, the, 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 the more inward you went, the greater the sanctity, okay? So that you had, you, you couldn't have non-priests occupy like the first level of, of sacred space. I mean, they could bring a sacrifice up to the to the to the gate or the door of the tabernacle and 
it would be sacrificed, but they couldn't go beyond a certain point. Then priests could go there. But, but, you know, there was a, there was a, a subset of those priests who could go into the holy place. And then there's there's only one priest that could actually go into the most holy place, the holy of holies, once a year. This was this was designed to to teach and to reinforce the idea that the ground gets holier, okay, the closer to God that you are. It's this the, these gradations of holiness. We talked about this in Leviticus about you know what's done with the blood and, and all this kind of stuff and who can go where. It's the same idea sort of transferred into the spiritual realm when you get these levels of heaven. Um, there's a lot of speculation in Second Temple period literature. You get all these heavenly visions and journeys of individuals like Enoch and Abraham and Baruch and you know so on and so forth. There's there's, there's a number of Old Testament characters that have these journeys and then and you get this language you know that as they're as they're on their trip so to speak to to see the presence of god you pass through certain levels these heavenly levels and and it's designed again to teach the idea that the closer to god you get the more sanctified the space is the, the more holy it is i i personally think the three level approach is probably modeled after the temple you have the court the holy place and the holy of holies you got three levels there the seven levels, again, I, again, my suspicion is that it has something to do with the number seven being perceived or thought about as perfection. Uh, and, and you say, well, how do you get seven in perfection? Well, it's modeled after the creation week, that everything is created in six days, and on the seventh day, God rests in his, his temple, which is, you know, in, in, in Genesis, which is, you know, Eden on earth, you know, that, that it, it, it completes the activity. Uh, there, there, this is what, what God wanted to do. He did, and He did it, you know, exactly the way He wanted to do it. So, you've got this this perception, this this idea, this numerical tag, as it were, number seven, that speaks of completeness and and in that sense, a perfection. So, I, I tend to think that that number is used again to convey the same idea. And I think that the number three, you know, as we're speaking of levels, is really drawn more from. Uh, sacred space on the ground, you know, boots on the ground, so to speak, that we read about in the Old Testament. Our next question is from Daniel in Nicholasville, Kentucky, and he asks, does the Sethite worldview imply that one can be children of God by natural lineage? If so, is that the same error the Jews fell into when they boasted that they have Abraham as their father? Or as a negative example, Seth being the good seed and Cain being the bad seed, could we liken that to the extreme fundamentalist idea that a certain ethnic group having the mark of Cain are unredeemable? Yeah, it, it, it's kind of akin to all that. Um, you know, the, the Jews in the Gospels are basically claiming election by virtue of Abraham. You know, again, if you believed that Genesis 6 you know, was another manifestation of an elect line back to Adam, you know, if, you, if you take the, the Sethite view, the human view only, and if you believe that that this is about an elect line back to Adam, then you you know you'd you'd fall into the same kind of thinking. Of course, nothing says that any line was elect prior to God's creation of Israel by virtue of Abraham and Sarah. That's when you get you know you get this election language in the Torah, and it's always about you know Abraham and Sarah's descendants, you know Israel. So it, th- that kind of thinking though can get transferred to other passages, and of course it does. Those who would say that the Jews descended from Cain, to, you know, to, to, to track on the negative example for a moment here. People who are going to say that kind of stuff, the Jews are descended from Cain and they're, and they're Satan's spawn, you know, th- those kinds of people who are just, you know, whacked, um, they're going to be saying things like the line of Cain is unredeemable because, you know, they're linking it to this satanic idea, this sort of, you know, satanic genesis of, in their case, specifically Jews. Now, I, I don't know any fundamentalism. I'm, this isn't to say that there isn't one, but I haven't run into into one that would, would have said blacks were unredeemable. Uh, I, I have certainly run into a few people where the mark of Cain was interpreted as skin color. I mean, that you'll see, and, and of course, you'll read a, a lot about that. But even even people who thought that, they you, you couldn't say that all of those people thought that like the, the the Negro race, or you know, again to use our modern terminology, African Americans, that they were unredeemable. Some did, some did, but it really depended on whether those people thought. And this is actually, you know, nineteenth century kind of stuff. 
uh, even even earlier, seven just let's just say eighteenth, nineteenth century uh, kind of dialogue, wondering if the black race descended from Adam or from some other co-Adamic or pre-Adamic human. Uh, This kind of, again, biblical nonsense and, of course, biological nonsense arises from this crisis uh, in these centuries of having to explain from the Bible, and, and that's in air quotes, explain from the Bible where these other races, these other humans that explorers are encountering, where they come from. Um, and 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 the things like skin color get get drawn into this conversation. Obviously, you know people could visually observe differences in skin color and other physiological uh, differences, but it all of that gets sort of drawn into the same odd and in some cases repugnant you know conversation in these centuries. And there were certain who would have said, who would have landed on this idea that oh, this race bears the mark of Cain and then they're unredeemable or, oh, this race, you know, is, you know, bears the mark of Cain, but who cares? You know, we're, we're, we're not going to evangelize them or whatever. We're not, you know, either, either, well, they might be redeemable, but we're not going to waste our time. And they weren't all like that though. Some, some, you know, came up with really goofy explanations for race, but they still were, were viewed ultimately as descending from Adam, you know, in, in some way. And so, it, it didn't deter evangelistic efforts. So it really depended on whether your quote unquote biblical racial theory, unquote, whether it had, you know, these alternate people groups linked to Adam in some way or not. If you if you if you thought they were not of the Adamic line, then by definition there would be groups that would say, Oh, they're non elect. They're just gonna go to hell, they're unredeemable, or we shouldn't we shouldn't give her up. You, you had that. You had that kind of thinking. I want to read. Uh, I, I this this question prompts me. I have this in in digital here, so it's real convenient. Um, a little part of Adam's ancestors um, that that this question just reminded me of. And uh, I've I've referenced this book before uh, on the podcast. If 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 any of you are interested in the harm that bad thinking about the Bible can do. <laughs> This is a must read. I mean, I, I in my library, I've collected most of the scholarly uh, books on bad exegesis that led to racial theory, and and this is one of the more important books. Uh, it's 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 informative, but obviously, when you think about the content, it can be tragic too. This is from page sixty five of Adam's Ancestors, and it's on the section of of, of that particular chapter that's labeled or, or subheaded. Human Origins and the Politics of Slavery. So here, here's a short excerpt. As early as 1680, the Church of England clergyman and missionary, first to Virginia and later Barbados, Morgan Godwin, wrote at length in support of the right of African slaves and Native Americans to be admitted to church membership in a tract for the times addressed to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Rather sanguine about the practice of slavery itself, he vigorously argued their case in his lengthy 1680 plea entitled The Negroes and Indians Advocate Suing for Their Admission into the Church. It's the end of the title. Godwin was fully aware that what he called the, quote, pre-Adamites whimsy, unquote, was being deployed first to, quote, derive our Negroes from a stock different from Adams, unquote, and then to quote unquote, brutify them. His intention, by contrast, was to, again, quoting from the, the tract, to prove the Negroes' humanity, unquote. It was a strategy diametrically opposed to those Spaniards, and he seems to have had Sepulveda in mind, who had concluded that certain races were not human in order to justify their murdering the Americans, i.e. the Native Americans. For all that, he acknowledged that fantastic and false. These are all in quotes, empty and silly. And again, in other words, Godwin's not buying it. He acknowledged that fantastic, false, empty, and silly, all of that, though the foul heresy of pre-Adamism was its original author himself, had never used it to dehumanize any racial group, but rather had acknowledged the full humanity of the pre-Adamites. Now, that's the end of the selection. So here you have Godwin, the guy who wrote this, who 
acknowledged that, okay, there's this view out here of pre-Adamic races, and he was determined not to use it to dehumanize any group. You know, Negroes and, and, and in his terms, Negroes and the Americans, which we, by, you know, we need, you know, the Native Americans, the, the latter reference there. So this is the kind of thinking. This is 17th century. You're going to get it 18th century. It's going to live into the 19th century. And really, you know, frankly, for those of us who are old enough, 20th century. But the, the, the use of the Bible to classify certain races in a certain way as being less than Adam or peripheral to Adam. And one of the strategies for doing that was this Mark of Cain idea. And, and, and that Go, does go pretty well hand in hand with the Sethite theory. Now, of course, people who take the Sethite interpretation of Genesis 6, they're, they're not doing it so that they can go here. They can go to these wacky racial theories. Um, and, and even back then, they weren't necessarily you know, doing it. But, but you could take the Sethite view. And once you took the Sethite view of Genesis 6, you would go backward, and then you would quite literally demonize the Cainite line. And you would insert the Sethite and Cainite, Cainite dichotomy into Genesis 6. So again, this is part of the Sethite thinking, Sethite view thinking. And, and all of that became fodder. It was and it became fodder for racial theory. You could, you could get there from the Sethite view, but let, let's be clear. Uh, people who take the Sethite view uh, over against the, the supernaturalist view of Genesis 6, they're not doing it to... 99.9% of the time to justify racism. But in the old days, you know, centuries ago, this is where a lot of that, that groundwork was laid. And so I think this is a, this is a, it's an interesting observation, you know, that the, the questioner has here, uh, Daniel. And yeah, you know, you, it, it's akin, it's akin, you know, to, to these other things, but we don't want to necessarily see a cause and effect uh, link to some of this awful stuff that uh, can really be laid at the feet of bad Bible interpretation. Neil has a two-part question. Does Mark yeah. 16, verse 9 through 20, deserve to be treated as scripture or just a footnote? And why is drinking poison and being bitten by snakes listed with things like healing, deliverance, and speaking in tongues as evidence of believers? Yeah, well, I, I, I'm. Let's be clear. I'm not a textual critic, so I'm going to have to, you know, look up, you know, some things to just introduce here as far as an answer to this question. I'm not a textual critic, uh, but I, I, I'll say that. But I'll also say this: I've never seen a good defense of the longer ending of Mark, that is, verses nine through twenty, and and for that reason, I'm I'm in the camp, which most I don't, I don't want to say all, but certainly most textual critics. I'm in, I'm in the camp with them that does not think verses 9 through 20 are authentic. Uh, the only reason it really matters is because of what the question alluded to, that you have snake handling preachers living in different parts of the world, parts of the country. They've made use of this, this material, and they've died or been responsible for somebody else's death. You know, so it, it, yeah, it, it does matter uh, in, in that respect. But again, I, I'm in the camp that really can't find a good defense of the authenticity of verses 9 through 20 when it comes to Mark uh, 16. Now, by way of textual evidence uh, for the longer ending of Mark, again, verses 9 through 20, which is pretty weak, I'm going to read a little excerpt from Omenson's book. This is from uh, Omenson and, and Bruce Metzger, a textual guide to the Greek New Testament. And this is an adaptation of Metzger's textual commentary uh, on the Greek New Testament. So they write this. They have several manuscripts, including four Greek unseal manuscripts of the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries AD, continue after verse 8 as follows, with a few small variations. And here's, here's the, 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 the verse. But they reported briefly to Peter and those with him and all that had been told. And after these things, Jesus himself went out through them from east to west, the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Amen. So you have four manuscripts, what this amounts to, four manuscripts from the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries. So this is 700 to 900 years after 
the days of the apostles. Okay. That after verse eight, they add that little statement that I just read. Okay. And then that's where in those manuscripts, that's where Mark ends. It ends with what we have as verse eight and then this little addendum. Now, all of the manuscripts that have this reading, okay, except for one old Latin manuscript, continue with verses 9 through 20. Now, what that means is that the longer ending of Mark, verses 9 through 20, this is the best manuscript support for it, 7th, 8th, 9th century AD. Stuff that's older is not going to have, they're not going to have the verses in it. So here you are in the, in the New Testament textual, text critical debate about, you know, priority manuscripts, the older manuscripts, you know, do, does it, if they're older, you know, should they be counted as, as better and, and all that kind of stuff. We did a whole episode on this, but you don't really have very strong evidence for the longer ending of Mark. It's, it's centuries, you know, seventh century here is, is what you're dealing with here. Uh, a second source, R.T. France in his commentary. Uh, on on Mark says this. This is a little bit longer, and I, I like France's uh, commentaries. He's done a couple of them. He's, I just like them. He's pretty good. He writes a number of later minuscule manuscripts. And these are these are medieval and be, and beyond. Give the longer ending, but mark it off with marginal signs or comments to indicate that its textual status is doubtful. So even the scribes themselves are, are making little notes uh, in what they're copying. They're faithfully copying the longer ending, but they're, they're putting these little marks in there. The 5th century Codex W, one of the earliest manuscripts to have the longer ending. So now you get, you know, in our, in our text stuff, now you, you move back to the 5th century. You know, it's one of the few, one of the earliest. The other ones are going to be 7, 8, 9. Has a substantial addition of 89 words at the beginning of verse 15. So it's even different than what we have in verses 9 through 20. This is described by Metzger as having an obvious, quote, obvious and pervasive apocryphal flavor, these 89 extra words, which consists of a dialogue between Jesus and his disciples concerning the ending of the period of Satan's power and the truth and righteousness now made available through Christ's death. Jerome records the same additional words and said they were found in some Greek manuscripts. Okay, so that's, that's fifth century. France moves on to a little section on literary considerations, and he writes, most of the content of the longer ending, verses 9 through 20, echoes, usually in abbreviated form, elements in the resurrection stories of Matthew, Luke, and John. And it does that as follows. And then he, he, he goes on and starts commenting about this or that. I'm going to skip to a, a other section of France. He writes, the parts of the longer ending not accounted for in this list are those which go beyond the resurrection appearances as such to describe the subsequent preaching and activity of the church. Thus, in verse 16, we have a summary of a basic baptismal soteriology, which has the flavor of Johannine dualism and possibly draws on the baptismal element in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. In verses 17 and 18, some of the signs which are related in Acts are summarized. And verse 20 is virtually a summary of the whole book of Acts in a nutshell. In the whole of the longer ending, verses 9 through 20, the only element which is not easily accounted for on the basis of familiarity with other Gospels and the book of Acts is the emphasis in verse 18 on handling poisonous snakes and drinking poison. The former perhaps reflects the single instance of, and it was involuntary, snake handling in Acts 28, 3 through 6, but the expectation of these two activities as regular signs is the one distinctive contribution which the long ending makes. In all other respects, verses 9 through 20 have something of a second-hand flavor and look like a pastiche of elements drawn from the other Gospels and Acts. Now, that's the end of, of, you know, France's commentary there. So basically what he's saying is that in the longer ending, which does not have good textual support, everything except the snake handling and the poison, poison you can find elsewhere in some other gospel or in the book of Acts. You can find some sort of example. And, and the only two outliers are the snake handling thing and then the, uh, the poison. And the snake handling thing might 
be an allusion to the episode in Acts 28. Again, it's not clear because the episode in Acts 28 was certainly involuntary, but it might you know, be, be some allusion to that. But then the, the, the poison drinking has no, there, there's nothing you can find elsewhere in the New Testament for that. And, and for, for that, you know, that reason, that, that this, the material you have in verses 9 through 20 reads like somebody else just sort of put it in there, drawing it from all these other places. In other words, it's a very secondhand kind of feel to it. That reason, plus the weak textual support, the weak manuscript support for verses 9 through 20, are the reasons why virtually all New Testament critics, textual critics, uh, do not consider verses 9 through 20 as authentic. It, it's not as bad of a situation as something like 1 John 5, 7, or you know, part of the ending of Revelation, like with Erasmus's text and all that. But it ain't good. It's, there's, it has weak textual support. And I will put a link on uh, the episode page for this to a blog post that I, I found here from the Evangelical Textual Criticism blog. You know, you, you could go up to the Evangelical Textual Criticism blog like I did here and, and just put in, you know, Mark 16. And you're going to find, you know, what that group, and they are just what they sound like, Evangelical Textual Critics, what they say about, um, the longer ending of Mark. And you'll find an essay by Peter Gurry. We've interviewed Peter before on this podcast. And it, it's pretty good. I recommend it. Um, just looking through it here, skimming here. Um, I, I have read this before. But in this essay, this, po- this post, he quotes Dan Wallace. Um, because one of the arguments is that, well, you know, it, the ending of Mark must have been original and, and it was lost because of the way that scrolls were rolled up. And the end of a of a you know the role would have gotten tattered and lost and blah 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 blah. Well, Wallace is somebody who's pretty much spent a career handling these sorts of things, and he says it's extremely unlikely that Mark wrote his gospel, you know, in a particular way where this is going to be you know some sort of explanation. Now I'll just I'll read the excerpt here. This is Wallace now. However, if Mark's gospel is is earlier than this, the end of the first century. Again, which is a controversy in and of itself, you know, as virtually all scholars acknowledge, regardless of their view of the synoptic problem, then he would have written his gospel on a roll, not a codex. And the first generation of copies would also have been on rolls. And if the gospel was written on a roll, then the most protected section would be the end. Because when someone rolled the book back up, the end would be on the inside, not the outside, to get tattered and stuff like that. To be sure, some lazy readers might not rewind the book when finished. Of course, they could get fined a denarius at their local blockbuster, Wallace says, for such an infraction. But the reality is this sort of thing was a rare exception, not the rule. Consequently, if Mark was originally written on a roll, it's hard to imagine how the ending could have gotten lost before copies were made. So again, Wallace is a guy that has lots of experience with scrolls. You know the way they were wound, and, and and so on and so forth, and and you know you have other books as examples too. If this if this was a common event, well then you'd have problems with the endings of other New Testament books too. But you don't, you know it's just it's just this longer ending of Mark. So I'm in the camp, you know, just to wrap this up. I'm in the camp with the you know the textual critics, evangelical and otherwise, who just don't really see a good argument for the long ending of Mark being authentic, and so. For that reason, I don't, I don't feel like I have to doctrinally defend drinking poison and snake handling, because uh, that's the only place you're going to get that stuff, and it's, it's highly suspect. Sure. All right. Let me just read all of this here from Justin. Justin's going to start off our episode with the first question, and his question is, when Revelation 2.13 refers to Satan's throne being in Pergamum, my NASB 77 keyword study Bible had a reference to this possibly alluding to a massive altar to Zeus. Now, when corrupt Elohim, fallen angelic beings are ruling over or deceiving nations, I assume that they aren't actually and honestly representing themselves. Lying is, after all, the native language of Satan. So, If the footnote is true, would we assume that when ancient Greeks worshipped Zeus, they were actually worshipping the original rebel himself, as opposed to some other spiritual being hiding behind the identity facade 
persona of Zeus. We would say that Satan is not omnipresent in the same way that God is. So would this area actually be his territorial headquarters at one point? No, I, I would answer the question no um, for a number of reasons. You know, s- Scripture itself never specifically identifies Satan, you know, with one point of geography. You know, he'd be the, the god of this world. You know, just think of a phrase like that. The other issue is it's really not possible to create one-to-one correspondences like the the question sort of angles for or suggests or or asks. You know, in the case of Zeus, I think there is something to the to the reference uh, you know that that was described there, Pergamum, and then this altar to Zeus. Uh, so then then you'd have to ask the question, you know, well, why why you know is that conceived of or thought of in, for lack of a better way of putting it, satanic language? Uh, and I think there's there's a conceptual reason for it, but it's it's not that we have the ability to identify what you know entity, what god that the Greeks or the Romans or the Egyptians or whoever it was that they were talking about is is this you know biblical figure over here. There's no way you know for us to to make those kind of assessments or judgments. You know, Scripture doesn't really give us th- that kind of information. In the in the case of Zeus. Zeus derives from Old Greek dios or deus, and the Old Indo-European dios, which is Sanskrit diaos. All of those terms mean sky or heaven, and I think that's the the conceptual link. You know that you don't have sky or heaven as a meaning of Satan or diabolos, which is devil. I mean, they're, they're, these are different terms. So that you, again, you, it forbids this one-to-one equation, but. If Zeus was conceived of as the sky god, the, the god of heaven, okay, the god of the heavens, uh, just like Yahweh was, and, and he is also referred to as the most high, I think that thinking about it that way is helpful here. Because by this time, you know, you're in the New Testament period, you've got the association of, of Satan on a number of fronts with being in control of you know, the control of the earth, control of the world, and also sort of being portrayed as this this kind of rival who wanted to be like the Most High, you know, wanted to be Lord of the, of the Divine Council and that sort of thing, wanted to be the Lord of Heaven. And so if you're thinking about Satan in those terms, and then you run into a deity that the Greeks worship called Zeus, who is, is referred to as the Most High or the or the God of heaven. I mean, even his name is, you know, identified with that. That's the connection. In other words, this, the Zeus would be viewed as a usurper or as a, a uh, kind of a conceptual counterpart to the, you know, fallen being in the Hebrew Bible that wanted to be the highest authority. He wanted to be the most high, wanted to, again, be the the God of the council, the God of heaven. So you, you don't have a direct relationship with the names, with the terms, you know, Satan, Diabolos, Zeus, Satan. You, know, you, you, you can't make these, these neat identifications on the basis of the terminology. You can see how, again, in this case, the writer of Revelation would think of Zeus on the, along the same lines as Again, the original rebel who wanted to be the most high, because that that's sort of a title that is attributed to Zeus, uh, the god of heaven. Again, it, you know, this is what what the name means. So there's there's a conceptual congruence, but there's no way to like, you know, fill out a roster, okay, like you would in, you know, baseball or football. This this one's this, you know, this one's at third base, this one's at shortstop. You know, you you, you can't do that. You can't say this this name is this deity over here in the Bible or this figure like Satan. It's just not that easy. We don't have the data for that. Um, you, you do get, the only time you can approximate that in terms of names is when the Hebrew Bible will actually use like the name of Baal in, in, at, a, at a particular location. Baal is often part of toponyms, you know, place names. So, okay, we know who was worshipped there. You know, the, the, there are things like that that you can do, but uh, Satan is not a geographical name. It's a functional name. And it has a, a, obviously a, a long and varied history from the Old Testament through the Second Temple period on to the New Testament. And then to sort of try to strike a specific equivalent in Greek religion to that entity. You, you just can't do it with terminology. But conceptually, you can see why they would think that way about Zeus. 
Chris from Grand Rapids has a question about how regeneration fits with Mike's view on predestination, election, and the fall. It would seem to me that a person's spiritually deadness cannot be explained simply as the product of making bad use of free will or the commission of actual sins after the age of accountability. What gives rise to this universal hostility necessitating regeneration? Yeah, I don't re- I don't quite understand the last sentence, universal hostility, hostility to what? But uh, I, again, setting that aside, you know, I, I wouldn't equate spiritual deadness with sinning. Okay, sinning has to do with acts of sin. Again, you know, you're making decisions, and, and if there's the there's free will element in there. So, you know, I, I don't make them synonyms. Spiritual deadness, in, in my view, is the condition of being estranged from God, the source of spiritual life. Now, Calvinists, of course, make spiritual deadness about an inability to believe, based on the idea that dead people can't do anything. They're dead. But that presses the focal point of the metaphor, a dead body, into an unnecessary service. That is, it takes all the aspects of the metaphor and then loads them into the discussion. Now, that's an intentional but unnecessary use of the metaphor. So I have a bone to pick, you know, with the Calvinists here. The spiritual death topic ultimately hinges on how one defines death. For Calvinists, death is the absence of conscious life. Now, you see what they did there? They loaded consciousness onto the idea of death. They load that aspect of the metaphor of a dead body into the discussion, and other people won't. There's no cosmic rule about how little or how much you use a metaphor, how many of its components, but Calvinists basically won't tell you that because it doesn't serve their use of the metaphor. If you define death as the absence of conscious life, in other words, in other words, if, if, you, if you define death, spiritual death, based on all of the elements of a dead body, dead body obviously has no conscious life. Okay, if, if that's your, 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 how you frame death, spiritual deadness, you know, that, that you, you're you unable to believe because dead bodies can't, don't do anything. You know, they, can't, they can't make decisions. Okay, if that's how you're approaching it, okay, if you define, you know, death as the absence of, of conscious life, then you can say that spiritual death is the inability to believe, which is why Calvinists do that. Or you could say that it's the absence of any volitional impulse. And again, this is the kind of thing Calvinists are, are going to be saying in their theological system. But if we define death as the absence of life more generally, not pressing consciousness into the metaphor and hence into the definition. And then further, we view the source of life as God. We get my definition. Or, you know, it's, again, I didn't make it up. It's just, you know, one I prefer. We get spiritual death is estrangement from God, the idea of separation. Now, all of that is why Calvinism then on the other side defines regeneration as an imbuement with life so as to be enabled to make a choice. See, there's the consciousness element again. But that means that no human can actually be drawn to Christ or God until regeneration occurs. I know they don't want to say that, but I want you to think about it. How is it that people, and I would say every person, can relate to being drawn or attracted to or intrigued by some thought or action that led to a gospel decision? You know, in all of our testimonies, somebody said something that, that drew our curiosity. Or that that you know drew on us emotionally, you know that 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 got us to sort of move down the path a little bit, you know toward toward you know a, a salvation decision. But if you're a Calvinist, you know you have to well that that's God just doing it, and, and your brain's not engaged at all, your consciousness isn't engaged at all because you're spiritually dead, and dead people can't do anything. You're just like you know an, an, you're like a zombie or an automaton or a robot or something. You know that th- they have to do that because they want to define regeneration as as the enablement to believe because of their view of the ordo salutis, the order of salvation, the way you know, they, they want to try to come up with this neat chain of, of things that happen in, in salvation, you know, like justification, you know, regeneration, what order do they come in? You know, the, the Calvinists are kind of absorbed, you know, with, with that kind of thing. So, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to do that, if you're going to, you know, sort of have a person be void of any volitional element prior to regeneration, then how is it possible that anyone can respond to anything in any way prior to being regenerated? Again, that, that, that's my question, because our, 
our experiences, I think all of us that have a testimony of faith in Christ, our experiences are, are contrary to that. Again, it, it, we, we weren't, you know, passive. We weren't inactive. You know, our, our brains were not disengaged. You know, we, we actually heard something and we, and, and we had these little micro responses to it that, that, that God used, you know, so to, to move us down the road, you know, toward an actual presentation of the gospel or actually committing, you know, our, our, you know, our faith. You know, otherwise you have a, a brainless, mindless being. You, you, have, you have humans, you have human beings that are, that are no longer self-aware in a Calvinist system prior to regeneration. Which just doesn't make any sense. So again, back to try to be a little more organized in my thoughts. Again, you can't say that you were consciously drawn to the gospel before your consciousness was regenerated. You know, in other words, the the approach of, of Calvinism I think just implodes because again, you you're no longer a sentient being. You're no longer self aware. So to put it another way, if your consciousness is a te- is detached from spiritual attraction, how can you be drawn? You have to notice things. You have to make decisions. You have to be curious. These are all activities of consciousness. Again, Calvinists want to turn all that off, but then we have humans without self-awareness. It, and that seems self-serving at best for a definition and, and kind of silly at worst. So I, I, this is, again, part of the reason. There are other reasons, but this is part of the reason I think it's a lot more coherent to define spiritual death not as something that involves the shutting off of consciousness or the shutting off of self-awareness, the shutting off of all volitional ability. I think it's more coherent to define spiritual death as estrangement from God and therefore defining regeneration as a new birth, that is being born into the family of God and then being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't cancel out people from freely responding in curiosity, we'll say, about the gospel or responding due to some emotional need or connection that salvation meets. So free will, for me, again, relates to responding to things that draw one to the gospel to make a decision to believe or to reject it. And and I'm saying you don't need to first be regenerated to respond because you're already self-aware. Free will also relates to choosing sin, you know, choosing you know, rebellions, choosing acts of sin. Now, I would need to add that the Holy Spirit, you know, this always gets us into the thing, well, if you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, born in the family of God, you know, what about that series on Hebrews about, you know, rejecting faith later on? Well, I would say we need to add that the Holy Spirit is the down payment of salvation in the sense that his residence in us is proof of God's grace and forgiveness and his promise to enable us to keep believing and serve him. But the Holy Spirit can be quenched and grieved. I mean, the New Testament tells us this. His presence doesn't his presence doesn't guarantee that we cannot reject the faith. The guarantee involved is something like, yes, if you believe the Holy Spirit can see you through to the end. And all those who overcome and keep believing were enabled to do so by the power of the Holy Spirit, not their own strength or their own cleverness. Our salvation is not due to our our strength any more than it was due to our merit. We have to believe. And if we do, the Holy Spirit will remain and keep us. Now, that whole idea is akin to the Old Testament presence of God, which, which could leave a place, you know, left the temple. In, in, in the curses in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you know, God said, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be out of here. You're my, I'm your God. You're my people. That's all well and good. You're elect. That's all well and good. But if you corrupt the land through your moral abominations to, to a certain extent, I'm going to remove you or I'm going to leave. This ground is no longer fit for my presence and I'm out of here. You know that what I'm describing is very consistent with that. So again I I think we have a we have continuity of thought here. Now again if we if we endure at the end if we keep faith the spirit will remain and and, and keep us. You know that if, if we believe if we keep believing the spirit is going to be there you know to to see us through to the end. The spirit of God will not coexist with the denial of the living God in our hearts. See, if you, if you don't take my position, that's what you're left with. You not only have unbelievers in heaven, but you have the Spirit of God coexisting with the denial of the living God in your heart. And, and that's just, that's just a, a theological you know, oxymoron there. Uh, of course, the living God there being incarnate in Christ. So we're, we're talking about faith in Christ here. So, again, to, to sort of summarize this, the Holy Spirit gets the credit for our perseverance, but not the blame for our unbelief. We are never relieved of the need to believe the gospel. 
That isn't how the offer of eternal life works, though evangelicalism has sort of defined it that way. The gospel is not words to be mouthed like an incantation. It is a truth to be believed, and to which we must remain loyal in that belief to have eternal life. Whoever believes in him, John 3.16, is in the present tense. We're either in a state of belief or we're not. Lance from Cape Town, South Africa, has a question, and it is, Christians are seen as priest kings, and there is, if I have understood things correctly, the idea of them ruling over the nations after the new heavens and earth are ushered in and God takes up his residence on earth. Who will rule whom? Why is there a need for such a rulership if all are resurrected Christians, and the earth is full of the glory of the Lord, and sin and death no longer exist? couple of things here. You know, the, the, the question at the end there presumes that rule uh, is somehow describing the restraint of sin or the restraint of something that's ready to burst forth and ruin everything again. I don't think that you have those conditions in the new earth, but that's just a general response. Uh, more broadly, I would say the rulership, it, this is a metaphor. Okay, these are all metaphors. These are ways of of describing the relationship we will have in the new earth with, you know, with Jesus, you know, in, in that place. There's no need involved. Okay, so a word like need is not appropriate. God doesn't need anything. He doesn't need co-rulers. He doesn't need the church now. He doesn't need a divine council. But he uses those things so that his created beings get to participate with him in enjoying and working with him to either further or maintain that which he has made. Again, for our benefit, not for his. And God has no lack. He has no need. So, you know, I think that's the way we need to think about this. You know, God does things in, in, in a way that involves us for our sake, that we get to participate. Rulership is about participation and governance or stewardship with our king. And since the New Testament describes unequal reward for all those who are saved, it would seem that at least part of that refers to hierarchical governance. So I think the idea of hierarchy is there. It's implied, again, by the, the inequality of reward for all those who, who do have eternal life. We're not talking about salvation here. So I think it's, it's inferred or implied that there's going to be some sort of hierarchical participation, that that's going to be part of the reward package if we want to put things like that. But again, that's not about restraining evil. It's not, it's not about filling a lack in God. It's about us getting to participate you know, with the Lord, you know, being made co-rulers, co-heirs, and you know, all this language in Revelation 2 and 3 and, and lots of other places, that, that that's what it's about. So beyond that, we're not given any details about how this works. We're not given any specific job descriptions or anything like that. So Again, when, when I run up against that wall, I don't speculate and call it teaching. I just don't speculate. Uh, I, I try to just take things as far as the text allows us to go and, and just leave it there. Tracy has a question, and it's regarding the line in the Lord's Prayer translated generally as, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Or, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. My question is about the, quote, as. Mm -hmm. I have generally taken it to mean in the same manner as, but I have come to realize that it could also mean at the same time as. Does the Greek provide any insight into which was intended? Both certainly would seem to be appropriate. Such a little word to mean so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think generally to jump into this, the Lord's Prayer appears only uh, in Matthew and this Matthew 6 so we're going to be going with with Matthew 6 verses 12 through 14 uh for this question in the Greek New Testament the passage reads forgive us our debts as and the Greek word is hos there we forgive our debtors there there is no Greek word hos later in verses 14 to 15 about the trespasses so it only occurs in the one spot so since the question revolves around that little conjunction hos uh, I wanted to point that out, that it's it's only in one part of it. So the question suggests a choice between in the same manner, that which would be comparative, or at the same time, which would be temporal, again, to use grammar speak. Uh, the comparative is, 
uh, you could probably argue that the comparative is the predominant semantic for the conjunction hosts. However, grammars uh, do note temporal uh, semantics for the conjunction in certain passages. So the the at the same time idea or or translation that that's legit. I mean, uh, you, you certainly have that possibility. Now, if, if we look this up in uh, BDAG, which is the standard you know lexicon for the Greek New Testament, uh, it will note uh, that host can be a temporal conjunction and it will actually say with the aorist it recommends the the translation of when or after you know in other words there's there's when something happens you know that or, or or after something happens you know then you know you you have that temporal sort of sense now in matthew the verbs are aorist so again you you have a temporal possibility there and you could translate it you know something like now let me just go to to Matthew 6 here and go to the actual example. Forgive us our debts when we have forgiven our debtors or after we have forgiven our debtors. I mean, if you go with when, that that's a little more closely coordinated, the, you know, the, the both sides of the forgiveness. After is, I mean, after implies a little bit more chronology. This happens, then that happens. And when is like this, uh, you get this feeling of, simultaneity or, or something that approximates simultaneity i mean but there's no way to, to be any more granular than that so you know back to the question does the greek provide any insight into which option which of those semantic options was intended uh about what all you can say is both certainly would seem appropriate I mean, you could go with either you know the comparison or the temporal idea but there's no there's no way to really say, well, this is this is the the case here, and, and and we can build an argument to exclude the other. And I have to be honest, I don't really see the need to choose. A certainly, lesser forgiveness isn't in view, uh, as though Jesus' words could be construed to mean that one's forgiveness is not of the same extent or the same quality or the same genuineness. So, if you were opting for in the same manner, let's go back to verse twelve. Forgive us our debts. In the same manner that we have forgiven our debtors, well, that that's 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 implied. I mean, that's not something that can really be excluded because to argue that it should be excluded would would leave you with this possibility that Jesus is is asking you to pray, Lord, forgive us our debts, in in not quite the same way or to a lesser extent than we have forgiven our. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. It's very obvious that. Without even thinking about the conjunction, we we want you know Jesus is suggesting we have a one to one correspondence here. We God's going to you know be inclined to forgive us as we have forgiven our debtors, you know, and, and that's how we should be thinking about the situation. So you know the the comparative idea in the same manner idea that seems kind of intuitive. Now when the comparison is God's own forgiveness again, that's what's being asked for in the prayer. Then it makes little sense to turn the question into Father, forgive us. To a halfway extent, so it, it just it just seems intuitive. Now, adding to that, a, just a little thought: Matthew six fourteen. If you go two verses later, seems to provide a chronology, so to speak, by virtue of the conditional particle. So, verse fourteen says, "This is ESV: For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father all, will also forgive you." So, if there is the Greek word "on," and it's just what it sounds like, a conditional particle. And that is typically followed, and in this case, it, this is the case, it's followed by a subjunctive verb form. Now, in the verbs up in verse 12, you know, one is an imperative, forgive us our debts, and the other one, you know, as we have forgiven others, that's indicative. You know, imperative is the mood of command, indicative is the mood of reality, it just sort of states something that is. And down here in verse 14, we have the subjunctive. The subjunctive is the is the grammatical mood of unreality. That is, it describes actions that haven't happened yet, like future, or that that you know may or may not happen based upon conditions that are set. And that's what we have here in verse 14. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. There's there's a contingency there. So you know if that's the case, then you act, you obviously have a chronology. One thing has to happen before the other, and so you don't really have at the same time there. You you do have a chronology there, and you could you could take that chronology that's clearly presumed in verse fourteen, and then read verse twelve in light of it. 
but you would still have a, a temporal use of the conjunction. It may not mean at the same time, but there's a time element there. So either way, again, just to recap here, the it allows us, you know, the host can be a comparative semantic in the same manner. It can be temporal, either at the same time or, or some sort of chronological time. Uh, both of those are operable here. Again, I don't see the need to choose. I think the only thing that you could eliminate is, is simultaneity only because of verse 14. Again, if you wanted to, to look at verse 14, you have an obvious condition. This has to happen before that does. And then you would be reading verse 12 in light of that, uh, that temporal situation. All right. Skip from Columbus, Georgia, has a personal question for you, Mike. And he wants to know, how do you, as a Bible scholar, stay grounded in the Bible and the truthfulness it teaches on the gospel of Christ and the whole nine yards of evangelical <laughs> reform doctrine of the Bible, knowing what you know about the Bible's historicity, etc.? without going over the deep end and completely losing faith because of doubts about such things that cause many scholars, it seems, to become so liberal in their thinking that they completely abandon faith in the God of the Bible and in the Bible itself. Mm -hmm. How do you keep the faith and maintain a balance of a scholastic, deep knowledge of Scripture and that of a simple, childlike, saving belief in what you are reading? Well, I'm, I'm, the short answer to this, and this might sound a little bit harsh and possibly a little bit simplistic, but but again, I've I've been a believer for 40 years, and just trust me, this keeps popping. It's it keeps rearing its ugly head with great regularity. The short answer would be the problem with so many uh, other scholars and just people who who think in general is that they lack imagination and they are content with either or fallacious thinking. That just seems to be embedded, you know, kind of in the human condition. The longer answer, I'll try to unpack that. What I mean by that statement is that many scholars can't seem to think about the phenomena of Scripture without using the vocabulary, the institutional structures, and the approaches handed down to them in their past by whatever religious context they happen to grow up in. They just can't seem to escape it. They can't seem to frame the phenomena or the discussion in any other way than this caricature they have living in their head. And I, I don't know why, but I, I just don't suffer from that problem. <laughs> I, I'm not sure why. I'll confess. I don't know why that is. It, it just sort of is. But maybe examples will actually help here. Let's just take a, a topical example. Um, and I'll, I'll just relate some things about this you know, in, in my own personal uh, experience. So let's take the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, okay? So let's just jump in with a series of questions here, just so that you know, you know how, how you know, some scholars, again, they, they can't escape from thinking about it in certain ways, and then I, I'm going to suggest that, that that's not a good thing. That, that's a lack of imagination and an embracing of either or fallacious thinking. So question, why does Moses have to have written all of the Torah, all the Pentateuch? Why? Well, why does that have to be the case? You know, now if you're the fundamentalist, you know that this is where you're going to land. You know, fundamentalists and others, you know, who sort of have inherited that tradition, whether they realize it or not, go through some really odd machinations to make that idea work. Uh, without getting too granular here, when I was at the the, the Missler conference in Coeur d'Alene, you know, several months ago, I saw an example of this again. Where for some reason the, the speaker feels compelled, you know, to, to justify mosaic authorship of every portion of the Pentateuch, and so he he whipped out this this colophon argument about how Moses would have been using cuneiform tablets, and how the cuneiform tablets, you know, had evidence of of colophons, which is a way of ordering material, and Moses would have seen that and imitate. It's all speculation, and 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 frankly, it's just unnecessary. And 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 there are some. There are actually some primary text problems with it too, both in the Torah itself with colophon language that doesn't work there and outside in the cuneiform world. But, but the, the point is, why do we feel compelled to go search high and low for, for what is really kind of a strange argument to justify this idea? Why? Why is the idea so important? Why must we say this? Second question, why couldn't Moses 
or why could Moses not have written any of it? Now, this is the this is the the polar opposite of the fundamentalist. This is where you're you're critical, you know, lib, quote unquote liberal critical scholars are. Moses didn't write any of this stuff. You know, this crowd. Now, catch what I'm saying here. This crowd is just as fundamentalist, but in the opposite direction. They cut themselves off from thinking critically and creatively about their own set of ideas. I'll give you a couple of examples here. When I was at the University of Pennsylvania, one of the things I did, we Penn, you know, Penn had two libraries that that people in my field were supposed to use. One was in the museum. If you if you're kind of bent archaeologically, that's where you'd spend your time. The other one was the Semitics reading room, which was in a different building. So one one night, you know, before class, you know, I, I decided I'm going to go up to the Semitics reading room and, and do a little thought experiment. So I went up there, and you know, they've got thousands of books there. I, I had a couple of hours to kill, and it was early in the semester, so I'm not burdened with assignments, you know. And, and I, I went up to the room, and here's what I here's what I wanted to know. I had been at at uh, seminary. I'd been I had two or three years of seminary under my belt, so I was I was pretty well familiar with evangelical publishers you know who they what what outfits were evangelical publishers so my my the little game i played that evening was i'm going to go through the stacks in the semitics reading room at the university of pennsylvania in the glorious ivy league and see how many books published by evangelical publishers i can find i found one one and i can tell you exactly what it was it was rk harrison's old testament introduction now what that taught me was that, well, it generated some questions. Are you, like, not aware that these other publishers exist? Surely the librarian must be aware. Well, who orders the books for these things? Well, that would probably be the faculty. Is the faculty unaware that these, these, these other, you know, scholars have an evangelical commitment and publish through these publishing houses? They're writing good books. After all, they've got their degrees from Harvard and Penn and all these other places. They surely can't be unaware of that. So are they afraid do they do they want to filter the knowledge? Do they want to limit exposure? Do they want to just eliminate ideas that they don't like? The answer to all those questions, the answer is somewhere in there. One of those is yes. So it, it, it taught me very early on that there was a knowledge filter here. It just worked in the opposite direction. You know, the fundamentalists don't want you to look at the stuff that the liberals say, and the liberals don't want you to look at the stuff the fundamentalists say. Again, those are, those are, I'm using the two polar extreme, you know, terms here. So, you know, the liberals would, you know, they, they want to come down on this, well, oh, it's JEDP, it's documentary hypothesis, Moses didn't write a word of this. I mean, you know, maybe Moses didn't even exist, you know? I mean, they're, they're just all the way in the other direction. Then you have the other, the other people that are just like, oh, Moses has to write every word. We're going to come up with some cockamamie theory to get him, you know, to be the author of every word. And, and my question is, why can't you have some of both? Why can't you have the use of sources? Why can't you have non-Mosaic authorship with Mosaic authorship? Why, do, why is it either or? That's a fallacy. That is fallacious thinking. Okay, and and that's why I I have again I don't know where it comes from. It, I'm just sort it's just sort of in my head, but I have carried that everywhere and in every topic and with every question. I want coherence. I don't want either or fallacies handed to me. I don't have to accept the way you frame a topic or a question. Is there a cosmic rule? that says the way you articulated the question is the only way it can be articulated? The res or is there some cosmic rule that says the way you answer the question is the only way it can be answered? No and no. So guess what? I don't need to play by those rules. And I have found, again, you have as much fear and knowledge filtering on both sides of basically any issue. And again, I don't know if it's like, is this my role in the universe here to just point this out? It's so obvious. But uh, again, you know, it happens for different reasons. So I, I look at the, these topics and say, well, why can't it be something to know? Why can't it be a little bit of both? Why can't we have some imagination here? Why? You know, why do we need mosaic authorship? Why is it a hill to die on? I mean, who says so? And and in a lot of cases, you know, you have a, uh, you know, so many will will affirm obvious things, obvious points, you know, data points about the, the topic, and then extrapolate to the completely unnecessary. 
you know, like, well, without Mosaic authorship, the Bible's a crock. You know, I hate it now. My faith is in vain. Well, that's just kind of an extreme reaction. I mean, why, why is that a reasonable conclusion? Now, on the other side, if, if Moses didn't write, you know, X, Y, Z, because we have sources, then he didn't write anything and he, and, and he, at any time. And it's all made up. And maybe Moses wasn't even a real – I mean, it's just this total polar, you know, reaction. And I look at it and say, well, why can't we affirm the obvious? Hey, there's editing here. Hey, you know, Moses, if, you know, if we presume, you know, Moses was, was literate or was alive, you know, raised in Pharaoh's house, like the Bible says, he would have been literate. You know, what, what is there to prevent him from writing stuff down that would get edited later? The, the answer is nothing prohibits him from doing that. Nothing prohibits the, the Torah from being a little bit of both. You know, and, and is there something theologically wrong with all oh, well, the, the New Testament says that it refers to the Torah as the law of Moses. Yeah, it refers to the book of Daniel, you know, as, as Daniel. It refers to the books of Samuel as Samuel. Okay, it, what else would you call it? Because it's a book that is associated with the time period of Moses and the events of Moses' life and the law that began during the Mosaic period and, of course, lasts long you know, thereafter. It, it's got these associations with it, so you wouldn't call it the book of Joshua or the law of Joshua. I mean, it, it's, it's a normative expression. Law of, and I put this on my blog, you know, law of Moses, the simple Hebrew construct phrase. The construct phrase has semantics. It could be the law that originated with Moses. It could be the law that was possessed by Moses. It could be the law that's associated with, with Moses. It could be the law that's about Moses. All of those things can be true, and none of them require that Moses wrote every word. It, 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 these things just don't get thought about very well. And this is why I said in my short answer, we've got a lack of imagination and a willingness to embrace either or fallacious thinking. And I don't suffer from either. And a lot of people I know don't suffer from either. But too many people I know seem they, – they, they, they come across like they're trapped. Either they want to be trapped or, they, or they're like you know, trapped in a victimized way in, in one mode of thought. And I think for, on the critical side, I think they're just uh, – again, I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's something between an apathy and a disdain for the opinions of others. And, and they don't they don't really see the need to even think about these things. I'll give you one more illustration. Okay, when, when I my my doctoral program at the University of Wisconsin, we're sitting there in Pentateuch seminar, and one of the criteria for these the source you know hypothesis JEDP the documentary documentarian view is that you know the 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 documents J E specifically J and E uh, you know and to some extent some of the others d depend on the the vocabulary choice for the names of God. The names of God is one of the criteria. So the, the J source uses Yahweh, the divine name. Jehovah is how the Germans would have said it. And the E source uses L words, L Elohim, L this, L that, okay? And, and so when, when we see that the various names for God, then that indicates a separate hand and a separate source. Okay, got the basics? So I actually asked in class, well, you know, we know that the, the, that the Septuagint, you know, which of course you know had a Hebrew base, and the Hebrew base is, was was different than the Masoretic text in places. We know that the Septuagint didn't have the divine name. You know, it doesn't have the word kurios because that's where the Septuagint consistently translates the divine name, kurios, Lord. We know that the Septuagint in in 110, 115 places, it apparently had a different. You know, thing a different name for God than the divine name in the Torah. Maybe it had an L name or something like that. I said, doesn't that kind of mess up the neatness of the sources for the Hebrew text of the Torah? That, that you can just say when you when you encounter one, it's one author, and you encounter the other, it's the other author. Because if we throw in 115 differences, doesn't that kind of muddy the waters there? You know, shouldn't that make a difference? It doesn't, doesn't that make the argument weaker? And the answer I got from my professor in a doctoral program was, eh, it's probably just a lazy translator. That the Septuagint translator was just sloppy. <laughs> Again, you've heard me say this on the podcast before. That day was one of the reasons why I, I said later in the same class, <laughs> it's a wonder I got out. Uh, I said later in the same class that I thought, 
that every doctoral student in biblical studies should be required to take a course in logic because that was just not that was not an adequate response it just wasn't that is not a coherent response i'm sorry but it's not it's not a data driven response and critical scholarship is supposed to be about data well that answer was not about data that answer was I'm too lazy to have looked. And even if I look, well, I want I I like this approach so much, I don't care about the data. So uh, again, I, I I could you know throw in a few more of these, but you know, back to the to the basics of my response to this. You know, what what again it's it's nothing mystical. I I I just I just think that we need to be able to think about topics and questions and answers to questions in ways that don't violate clear thinking, you know, clear logic, that account for outliers, that are not content to just dismiss parts of our arguments that don't work, that are not willing to accept either or fallacies. And, and to me, that, that, that makes it fun because then you have to engage the material. You have to think about it. And, and here's where the role of imagination and creativity, I think, helps. And imagination, not like you're just making stuff up, but you're trying to reimagine how, in this case, how we got the Torah. Well, how might this have worked in real time? You know, could Moses have had a role? Could other people have had roles? Could it have been done over long stretches of time? You know, if, if, you, if you try to put it in real time and reimagine how this would have worked, does or are you able, if you do that, are you able? To, to come up with a more comprehensive view that accounts for the data in all its disparity. That's what I'm looking for. So I just don't feel pigeonholed. I, I don't feel like I've got to do one thing or the other. Again, there is no cosmic karmic, if I want to use that word, rule that, that says there is a set of rules for how we must think or not think about Scripture. And I just, I just know that. Again, I don't know why I really know it. it it just seems sort of self-evident to me but but there it is you know that that lives in my head all the time and and again if that's what's living in your head let me just throw one other element since again you know i i i'm a theist i believe in god i'm a christian you know all these things you know the, the, these basic ideas that ha whose coherence has been defended quite capably for millennia you know, I'm not going to overturn any of those apple carts, and neither is anybody else. Trust me, people have tried for thousands of years. So, given that assumption that we have, you know, God in the picture, thinking creatively and and trying to think big picture about how these things might have happened in real time, that requires a providential role for God in all of it. It just requires it by definition. So then, God becomes part of your thinking to answer the question: How might this have happened? You know, how, how, how would this have looked, you know, in real time? How would God have pulled this off? You know, using people. Again, the, the listeners here are going to know me, you know, well enough, I would assume at the time, or at this point, that I don't believe the Bible is a divine book. One adjective is not sufficient. I believe it is a divine human book. Both adjectives are necessary. And to strip the humanity out of Scripture is to undermine the doctrine of inspiration. To strip the human out of it, you make the Bible vulnerable to all sorts of criticisms. One adjective is not enough. You need both. And if you can't find that view in a theology textbook, so what? Too bad. Get a better book. You know, think about it. There's no cosmic rule that the way this is articulated in, in the book that my pastor recommends, you know, whatever. There's no cosmic rule that that's where the inquiry ends. So uh, I think we just need to be a little more, a little more willing to think. Maybe, maybe it, it'll just appeal to you to have a little more fun with it. You know, it, it, don't get trapped. Just don't get trapped into 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 fallacious thinking about scripture and about what scripture says. I think it, that would that would serve you a long way. And it again, I, I, that rambled a little bit. I'm going to wrap it up here. That, that rambled a little bit, but I'm hoping the the illustrations have a little bit of explanatory power to answer the question. Yeah, I've even been asked, Mike, uh, how getting this deep into the Bible has affected my faith uh, from friends of mine who get getting their MDev. And, and and we've all heard stories of people going through seminary and stuff and kind of questioning everything. And I'm kind of mm -hmm. like, uh, 
you know, if you're studying the Bible and you start to lose your faith, well, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. The problem is in the Bible. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't know. It just seems odd to me because, you know, the more you dive down, the more questions you have, right? So for me, it seems to strengthen it and not confuse it or lose it. So I don't know. I don't yeah. Know. I, I'm always, again, I'm always left with the question, well, how, again, how would this have worked? You know, like, like, you know, how, how did God influence the writer to do this? What was the writer trying to do? Because the writer is under, you know, none of us live, you know, newsflash, none of us live lives of autonomy. <laughs> okay. We're all influenced by, you know, people, by, you know, again, if you're a theist, you're influenced by God, you know, all, all these things. And so the, the biblical writers are the same kind of, of people and, and God you know, has an interest in, in what they're doing, uh, especially, you know, in, in something you know, of this magnitude. You know, where, where is God in, in these set of circumstances? What did the data tell us about how this might have worked? And, and to try to, again, reimagine it. You know, imagination is not the enemy of biblical stories un, un, unless it, it, you're using imagination to just junk the, the truth propositions of Scripture and substitute your own. You know, when I talk about imagination, I, I mean you know, creatively thinking about the data that you have in front of you. I think we need a little bit more of that. Yeah, I'm amazed because— um... You know, I believe the Bible is a living word. So you read it one day and it tells you something, you know, one day and another, another day. But I get on some of these blogs or whatever, and I see people have discussions. And if you're not in our Facebook group, you need to get in there. We almost have 2,000 people, Mike, in our Facebook Naked Bible group uh, talking about some of these great topics. But um, I'll go into some of these other groups or around the Internet looking at And I mean, you talk about Christians reading the same thing and having the exact opposite viewpoint. You know, they can read something or study something and they come away with something completely different than another person. And it's crazy how us Christians can't agree on some of the most simplest things. And it's just, we're all over the map. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, there, there's there, some of that is, you know, there, again, I don't, and this is not meant to sound critical there, but there, you have a lot of sheep without a shepherd. And what I mean by that is they haven't, they may not have a lot of direction, but they haven't quit, and so I'm I'm on their side. You know, I, I I wish they had, you know, more direction, but at the very least, they haven't quit. So that it's it's a positive thing in that respect, but negative in that, you know, they're just they're just trying to do it on their own, you know, and and you know that's why we do stuff like the podcast, to be honest, you know, it, to try to try to give a little help there, you know. But then you've got situations where people have sort of been, you know, funneled in one direction. And when their knowledge filter, the knowledge filter they were taught from very early on doesn't satisfy at some point, then they, then they are tempted. And some of them just, you know, go all the, you know, all the way opposite uh, to just junk the whole thing and just say, well, I, none of this matters. None of this is going to, is going to help me and be, be any sort of guidance to me. I'm just going to wing it. You know, I mean, I mean they're going to get rid of it. Or I'm going to wing it, and and whatever pops into my head, that's what scripture means. Or whatever the next person, you know, who, who maybe I I like something they said, I'm going to just go with what that guy said. You know, you have all these forces, you know, kind of operating. You don't have anything that that um, he, well, I shouldn't say anything, but you have a tremendous lack of of discipline when it comes to method. Um, you've got people who are charismatic and they make certain arguments and they get followings just because they're charismatic and. And the, you know the, the the people who follow them, you know, want to follow them because they didn't like the the last person they were following, or they had no direction at all. And you know, it's it's, it's kind of a mess. But at the end of the day, I, I I'd still rather have that than people just quitting, you know, altogether. Our first one's from Ghostman, and he wants to know what is the meaning of Ecclesiastes three twenty one. Yeah, and for those of you who don't have your Bible memorized <laughs> completely, <laughs> Ecclesiastes 3.21 in ESV says, Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth? Question mark. Again, this this rhetorical question. You know, I, I think in a nutshell, the, the point of the verse is that human beings are mortal just like the beasts. Okay? If you go back you know, to verses 19 and 20, you know, the couple of preceding verses, you read, you know, something to the effect that all of them, both human and animal, all have the same breath. Everything is meaningless, you know, says the writer, Kohelet, uh, Ecclesiastes, the preacher. 
all go to the same place. In other words, they all go to the grave. Everything dies. All come from dust and to dust all return. Then we get this statement, well, you know, who knows if whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down to the earth. So the, the, the real question here is the author is, is wondering if people, if any people wind up being taken out of the grave, you know, out of Sheol, because everything goes there, everything dies, which is pretty self-evident. And this verse is part of the whole discussion in the Old Testament about Sheol, because, you know, everybody dies and everything dies. So on my website, you know, years and years ago, boy, it's, it's I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, whenever it was, uh, I went through a, a series on Sheol and the human dead versus the non-human, you know, spirits, you know, that are in, you know, Sheol and who's in Sheol and all that kind of stuff. And so we, we, you know, discussed broadly, you know, this whole topic, but this verse in particular is part of that, that complex of ideas. And, you know, what you get as you read through the Old Testament is you get this notion born of reality that everybody dies. And then there's this sort of question like, well, well, then what? Because even in Sheol, you have this conscious life going on. You know, I'm, you, people would, would say, I'm going to go be with my fathers. Well, you know, that reflected the idea that you would rejoin, you know, your, your family members. People were buried. You know, we talked about Old Testament view of the afterlife. And, and again, I'm, I'm one that doesn't think that Israelites thought there was nothing going on or soul sleep or anything like that because they would be, they, people would be buried with things that they used in life uh, under the assumption, you know, that they would use them in the next life. I mean, Israelites weren't any different than lots of other cultures in this respect. Uh, people just anticipated to have some sort of existence. But if you were a Mesopotamian, you would sort of view this existence as kind of cadaverous, you know, nothing really good. If you were an Egyptian, uh, you viewed it a little bit differently, depending on which era of uh, Egyptian history and you know, the theology that went with it was in. Uh, sometimes the positive afterlife was just for the pharaoh and whoever he granted it to. But it, eventually it, it widens you know, to, to more people. And, and Egyptians were you know, quite noteworthy for their positive outlook of the afterlife. So you know, Israel's part of, part of this mix. It, when it comes to the biblical writers, uh, again, there's there's – in some passages, there's a question. Well, you know, like we don't really know what's going to go ha- going to go on. And in other passages, it's actually positive that there are Old Testament passages. And again, in that series I did on my website, uh, you could you could look them up. But there are, there are you know Old Testament passages that have a positive view of the afterlife because it's anticipated or at least hoped for that the righteous, you know, those who have a a, a right relationship with Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, would be removed from Sheol. Yes, everybody goes there, but you know the righteous are going to be removed from it. So that the you know the writer of Ecclesiastes is sort of in that mix. Um, Ecclesiastes is 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 kind of a an unusual book to begin with because there, parts of it are really cynical and pessimistic, and other parts of it are, are optimistic. And so scholars always discuss Ecclesiastes with the question, well. Is it a pessimistic book or is it an optimistic book? And it, it's it's some of both. Uh, and again, th- this question kind of reflects that. I want to read uh, something from uh, Provan uh, about this particular passage. He wrote a commentary on Ecclesiastes. It's in the NIV application commentary series. So, you know, looking up Provan here, he writes: the one place to which all the living go is Sheol. The, wor- the world of the dead. For example, Job 30, 23, the place appointed for all the living. In other words, all the living are eventually going to be among the dead. They're going to die. It's translated in the NIV simply as the grave in Ecclesiastes 9, 10. The Old Testament often speaks of death as if it were a final ending to human existence, a place of separation from God. And he gives a few Psalms here, Psalm 6, 5, 88, 10 through 12. Uh, it's a place of separation from God that the righteous as well as the wicked will experience as darkness and chaos and from which they will not return. Again, everybody dies. You're not going to – there was no sense that when you died, well, maybe you'll be undead at some point. You know, that, that, that wasn't a question, just like it is for us, you know, on, on one level anyway. Other texts, however, tell us that the wicked depart to Sheol, Psalm 9, verse 17, Psalm 30, 31, 17 implying that the fate of the righteous 
is ultimately, if not immediately, different. A point explicit in Psalm 49, 13 through 15, where the righteous are ransomed from Sheol's power. And he has a cross-reference, his cross-reference here to Psalm 16, 10, and 11. Job 14, 13 pictures Sheol as a place in which God might hide Job until his wrath has passed. The passage envis- envisaging a later time when God will remember him and the dead will be roused out of their sleep. That's also Job 14, 12, verses, uh, and also verses 14 through 17, the same chapter. And of course, the, the famous Job 19, 25 through 26, that's the I know my Redeemer lives passage. In passages like Isaiah 26, 19 and Daniel 12, 2 and 3, moreover, there are clear references to resurrection from the dead. Uh, that's the end of uh, Provence quote. So in other words, there are clear references to being removed from Sheol. Now, the writer of Ecclesiastes here is sort of expressing either a non-committal ignorance or a pessimism. You know, that, that's reflected by his words. Well, who knows if so on and so forth. Provana elsewhere says, the writer cannot be certain what will happen after death. It is unseen. He rests content with that which, in the grace of God, he has come to see. Namely, that death renders pointless during life the quest for gain or advantage over the rest of creation. So, it's the end of the the second quote there. So, Provana is saying, you know, the, the writer, at the very least, he sort of saying this in the context of the fact that everybody dies and death is ultimately going to sort of be the the great leveler and so why should we waste our lives you know after ill-gotten gain and taking advantage of other people so on and so forth Uh, because he's going to end the book with this is the conclusion of the whole matter fear god and keep his commandments but during the course of of ecclesiastes you know he asks questions like this and expresses either pessimism or you know, some sort of cynicism. Now, another way to look at this is, or at least uh, you know, part of, of the discussion of this kind of statement in Ecclesiastes is the whole issue of progressive revelation. Why would we assume, this is important, because you know, as people are listening to this, they might be thinking, well, shouldn't the writer of Ecclesiastes know that the righteous go to heaven, and why is it even a question? Well, it, it, it's a question because not every biblical writer sort of would have known known same time uh, this is if you think about it what you know we're, we're fond as evangelicals of, of sort of touting the bible as this book you know, collection of 66 books were you know written over you know a couple of millennia and all this kind of stuff well it is it is all that but all those people obviously didn't live at the same time why would we expect that all biblical writers had the same grasp of some point of theology if they all lived over the course of a couple millennia, why would we expect that they all had the same knowledge pool in their heads to draw from? That's an unrealistic and frankly an unbiblical assumption, but it's a common one, you know, for the average you know church person because, well, their, their writings show up in the Bible, so they all like believe the same thing, right? Well, you know, maybe when you when you meet, if you could assemble them all in heaven, well, then there'd be agreement. But in in real life, in real time. There are doctrines even within the Bible itself that develop, that grow, that get that get accrued to. It's not just one knowledge dump in Genesis one, and then everybody sort of knows the same thing, you know, throughout the course of human history and and all that. Again, with th- this question again, like so many others, sort of dovetails and is influenced by what I have contested uh, on many occasions to be a deeply flawed view of inspiration. The one that one that sort of eliminates the humanity from it, and in this case, there's just no reason to expect biblical writers to have the same grasp of of really any given subject at the same time, especially you know when they lived in, in such a broad range you know chronologically revelation information from God is given over time it it's a self evident thing, but it's it's something that again evangelicals often don't think about at all. But it's true. Material is added to theological threads. Part of our job as Bible students is to trace the threads. Anyone living after the time of the writer could provide a better answer because they had more revelation. People living further down the road, like let's just say in the New Testament, are going to be able to answer certain questions better than certain people in the Old Testament, just by definition, because revelation is given 
progressively. Uh, as just a, another example, or, or I guess a related example here. In the Mosaic era, you know, the dead, you, you see this phrase, the dead go to be with their fathers, again, this afterlife notion with loved ones. That's different than the wording here in Ecclesiastes 3.21 about going up. Okay, remember Ecclesiastes 3.21, you know, who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. Well, we know that everybody, everybody's spirit goes down into Sheol, but the question is, does the spirit of man you know, go upward? That up language is different than I'm, I'm going to die now, I'm going to go be with my fathers. You know, because you know, people were, were, they had different ways of expressing the notion of an afterlife, but here you have this directional element that sounds to our ear more like you know, heaven. So, and, I, and I think there is this sort of uh, God attachment to the upward language as opposed to just a general afterlife you know, with loved ones kind of feel that you get in, in the Torah, for instance. So you have certain ideas that in parts of Scripture are going to conform to the upward language, other ideas that are going to conform to the, again, you know, positive afterlife uh, expectation, but not necessarily this upward orientation. Fox, uh, in his commentary on Ecclesiastes, Michael Fox was my advisor at Wisconsin, he writes this. He says, the writer is aware of the belief that at death the soul goes upward to the heavens rather than down to Sheol. So he's aware of the idea. This idea is not Semitic in origin, but it was found in popular Hellenistic religion, which held that the soul arises to the ether, the heavenly seat of the gods. Now, I would, I would actually quibble with that because of the Psalms language about being with the Lord. You know, having the Lord take you out of Sheol. Well, if the Lord takes you out of Sheol, where is he going to take you? He's going to take you to be with him. And he's in the heavens, and so that would be upward. So I, I don't think, I think Fox is giving in a little bit too quickly to this Hellenistic idea. Now, as the writer of Ecclesiastes portrays things, Fox says, the sage, again, the writer has heard of this notion, but he doesn't know for sure if it is true, and he refuses to be comforted by the conjecture. Again, I think it's a, a bit overstated. Uh, is it is it really a lack of comfort, or is he just being sort of cynical, uh, or 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 is is he just saying, "Hey, I don't know." Again, th- those are those are three related but different things. So I read Fox here because that he's kind of the the, the broad consensus kind of position on this. But Provan again is a little more positive because of, of the language in the Psalms. And again, it stands to reason if God is going to take you out of Sheol. He's going to take you to be with him. And that is a pre-Hellenistic, and it is a Semitic idea. So I wanted to throw that in to address, again, the, the consensus thinking. Consensus thinking, uh, I would say, is, is not terribly coherent, at least in its consistency. Now, as time goes on, the two ideas of positive afterlife, you know, in, in some sense— you know, being not being left in Sheol, that idea and then this—, and this upward with God kind of orientation. Those two ideas are fused in the Second Temple period, in the New Testament, and their joining is logical from the Old Testament. Again, what other source of ongoing life would there be but with God? So here, this is a good case, and I think you have instances like the doctrine of Satan, uh, you know, a few other things in the angelological and demonological sphere that the Second Temple period literature and the New Testament will say things that they'll, they'll essentially take data points from the Old Testament and then connect the dots. But the dots are not connected in the Old Testament. They're connected later. But, but the connection points, the data itself, the data that themselves are quite consistent with the Old Testament because the Old Testament is their source. And the connections that are made are coherent and logical. It's just that you don't find the connections. You don't find the picture, the mosaic in the Old Testament. You find it later. And I think this is kind of an example of one of those uh, sorts of topics. Okay, Mike, this next question, and I've been working on my Croatia pronunciation, is... Uh, <laughs> you need to work a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ante. <laughs> it's Ante from Croatia. I hope I did that okay. right, sir. So, All right, he's got two questions, and his first one is, can you give a few examples where Jesus uses Jewish doctrines developed in Second Temple period that are not explicit in the Old Testament. Well, that, that, that's an interesting juxtaposition, juxtaposition in light of what I just said. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you do have broadly 
I brought up Satan again. The, the, the full picture of Satan is going to be different, uh, you know, in Second Temple and New Testament. But but to be more specific, you know, to to the question, examples where Jesus uses Jewish doctrines. Again, I would I'd quibble with the wording. I mean, Jesus isn't looking to use Jewish doctrines, but he he's he's going to be part of 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 the world, part of a world, you know, that that has connected these dots. And the, the dots come from the Old Testament, but they're not connected in the Old Testament. They're connected later. So I think that's a, even that is a helpful way to think about it. But here's a, here are a couple of examples. The phrase in Matthew 25, 41, about the lake of fire being prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, that is, is an idea, this, uh, the association of this place of torment, place of punishment, <laughs> you know, that might you know be eschatological across the board but to associate it specifically with the devil and his angels as though the devil has a bunch of angels that work for him okay that's not something you're going to find in the old testament you're going to find the devil the satan figure you're going to find other fallen uh you know divine beings that would be on the same team as it were with satan but you're not going to find verses that actually specifically connect them like satan is the captain and here's his team you're also not going to find uh, this description that specifically the afterlife uh, place of punishment, the one that's sort of made permanent, you know, this this lake of fire thing that we see that at the end of, of the final judgment you know, where they're cast into it and, and there they go. You're not going to see the underworld really cast as you know, a lake of fire. There, there, are, little, there are little glimpses uh, of things like that. You certainly get the idea of punishment where Satan is, is cast down to the underworld. You certainly get that. Uh, it, Jewish tradition, which is built off of, again, not only Old Testament, but also uh, Second Temple stuff, like about the, the, the fallen sons of God of Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Since the Apkalu, which is the original Mesopotamian story for those four verses, since the Apkalu wind up being imprisoned in the abyss, that's where that idea comes from. And the writer of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 sort of assumed you knew the backstory. He doesn't discuss the backstory. It gets discussed a lot later. In the intertestamental period, Second Temple period, all that you get in the Old Testament are the Rephaim, which again are are part of the the, the, the giant you know thinking in Old Testament uh, theology. You see them in Sheol, but you don't ever have a verse where they're like working for Satan, like "What's my job today, boss?" You know, you, you never have this explicit association. You do have this place that's that that if you're left there, if you have no hope of escape, that's bad. Because who's who are your neighbors now? Who are you living with? Well, you're living with the, the, the original fallen, you know, rebel of Genesis three, the Satan figure. You're also living with the, the spirits of the giant clans, which are, are demons in Second Temple thought. You, that's really not great, you know. I mean, can I can I find a better neighborhood? Well, the answer is no, because if you're left in Sheol, that means you're you're one of the unrighteous. So again, you you have all you have these ideas, you have these data points floating around in the Old Testament, but they're never put together. And later on in the Second Temple period, you get the dots connected, and the dots derive from the Old Testament, and they make sense in light of what you read in the Old Testament. They're just not connected the way you're reading you know, them here in Matthew 25, 41, or in a Second Temple passage. It's the same thing for exorcism of demons. You don't have this in the Old Testament. In fact, you barely have the expectation of the Messiah being someone who would exercise demons. We did a whole episode on this on the podcast. It's episode 87. Where does this expectation come from that the Messiah would be someone who would cast out demons? When you have like zero reference to, to exorcism in the Old Testament, it's built off one or two you know things that you find in one or two Old Testament passages and that get you know, applied in this way. You know, certain little points of language get applied to the idea of the, the, the son of David, the Davidic descendant, having power uh, over over demons and over over evil spirits and things like that. So it, it there's an idea. Again, Jesus obviously in the Gospels, you know, does exorcism on a number of occasions. You have the sort of the, the kernel thoughts and the data points in the Old Testament, but you have no sort of explication. Uh, of those things, of the idea. You have no, no, nothing that states these connections in the Old Testament itself, but then later on, you do during the Second Temple period on into the New Testament. So there are things like this, again, that develop. And I'll go back to my question, to the previous question. Why would we ever expect 
all of the biblical writers to know exactly the same things at the same times, you know, or, or, or having lived so far apart. And, you know, again, why would we have this expectation that everybody knows the same thing? Well, the, the short answer is because that's what we're taught in church. Okay, that's not the correct answer. It's not a coherent answer. Again, we, we just sort of make this assumption that everybody knows the same thing. And, th- and then when, when they know it and they write something, it's, it's like all written at the same time and everybody has a Bible. You know, folks, I, I, I hate to, again, try to disabuse listeners of this idea, but it wasn't until the modern era, post-printing press, and even then, you, you know, you got to go a few centuries afterwards. It's only in the modern era that you could pretty much assume that the average person, despite their station in life, would actually have a Bible. That is not true in the ancient world. And so these assumptions that that we we look at biblical characters, we look at biblical writers, and, and we sort of expect them to just be able to look something up or just to automatically know it because they're a prophet. Well, they, they know every, that, all that stuff that somebody else wrote because they're a prophet. Well, again, that, that doesn't make any sense. They don't have the information downloaded into their heads. Most of them will never you know, pick up a, a, anything that you could call a Bible. It's, that's, this is why prophets exist. Prophets are the oral covenant enforcers. They, this is why you have, quote, schools of the prophets in the Old Testament, so that they can share information. Uh, you know, they they can take what is written, and it's not a whole lot, and then they can you know be taught by the prophet. They can pass that on because prophets need to be succeeded. Uh, this is how it works. It's not like our time when you can just look stuff up and everybody's got a Bible. It's just not the way it is. All right. His second question is: What would you, as an Old Testament expert, say? What are the best arguments from the Old T Old Testament? For Jesus being the promised, prophesied Messiah, besides stating that it is messianic mosaic, and compare it with what usually Christians say, and what are the most effective scripture to share with a religious Jew, and what are effective with the atheist? All right, let's just take one at a time. I mean, this might be disappointing, but, you know, honestly, I honestly don't know what else Jesus would have to do to, to validate his status as Messiah. In other words, me as an Old Testament expert, I would say, go read the New Testament, you know, and, and align what Jesus actually does with the Old Testament scriptures. I could add the incarnation because the incarnation is absolutely essential to the messianic profile because only God could fulfill the covenants that God made with man. So the only way to make that happen is if God becomes a man because humans are going to fail. Covenants that are made with humans, if God doesn't become a man and fulfill them himself, they're never going to get fulfilled because humans fail all the time with regularity, unceasingly and unfailingly. So the incarnation is sort of a wild card element here. But honestly, what else would Jesus have to do? You know, I'm just being bluntly honest, because I, I this is kind of a familiar question. Well, how do we know Jesus? Well, what else would he have to do? And sub-question is, who else did that? Who else did? Who else fit the profile other than Jesus? And Jesus fit the profile really well. So what's missing? I would suggest to you nothing's missing. There's plenty of information there for you to draw the accurate conclusion that he was the Messiah. If you know what he did in the New Testament, you you check back on the Old Testament. So if you run into a person that just, well, I don't know, know, their their problem isn't really Jesus. Their problem is, is, I'll be so audacious to say this, they probably don't know what they're looking at if they read the New Testament. They, they probably haven't spent enough time actually reading it. And then once they read it, actually cross-referencing the Old Testament passages. And then it, it gets a little tougher sometimes to conceptually understand what's going on between the connections of how a New Testament writer would repurpose an Old Testament passage, You know what, what he would see in there. That, that takes a little bit more work. But typically, this is the kind of question that, that again, I'm, I can only speak for myself, my own experience. This is the kind of question you get from people who just don't want to believe it. And and they they don't really put a whole lot of effort uh, into, you know, reading both testaments evaluatively and then asking the other question, well, who else fits the profile? The answer would be, well, really nobody. And then if you throw the incarnation in there, well, then it's really nobody because the incarnation is essential. So if we're talking about the way it's presented for most Christians, they, I think probably the incarnation might get, uh, I won't say skipped, but but sort of not fully appreciated for for the necessity of the incarnation. 
Now, the other questions, something to the effect of, you know, what, what's the most effective passage to share with a religious Jew, uh, I guess, to convince them Jesus was the Messiah? I, I, would, I would go to the two powers stuff, honestly. It's, it's one of the reasons why I've camped on it. In other words, a, a religious Jew has to be prepared, or at least has to, has to understand how his ancient compatriots, his ancient you know, forefathers, could have accepted the worship of Jesus and not feel that they were violating the Shema, which is the fundamental tenet of Judaism. You know, the Lord our God is one. You have to show them how that worked, how that, how that often worked and could have worked in the ancient first century Jewish mind. So you would want to introduce into passages that reinforce what scholars call Jewish binitarian monotheism, because that, that's really what was going on in the first century. There were a lot of Jews prepared for the notion of a binitarian, you know, two powers, binitarian godhead. And all of the Christians were doing, the Christians weren't inventing anything new. They were just saying, we believe that the second power is Jesus of Nazareth, and, and here's why. Um, so that I would take uh, a religious Jew to that because they they're they're going to balk at the notion of, you know, if I convert to Christianity, I'm, I'm somehow dissing or, you know, giving up denying the Shema, and they're really not. So they they need to understand what first century Jews were thinking. As far as the atheists, atheists don't care about scripture, so there is no passage. Why would we assume that that I'm going to quote a passage of scripture to an atheist that's going to make any difference at all? Uh, I, I would say with an atheist, you need to get atheists to probe their own views and their own ideas, seriously probe them for their 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 weaknesses in terms of coherence. Um, you know, tell them why you don't find atheism persuasive. Tell them, you know, or ask them, hey, why, why is it, I file this under, are you an honest atheist? Okay. I would recommend, you know, having these these conversations about how honest an atheist they are. And, and here's what I mean. Why is it? You know, if I'm sitting across the table from an atheist, here's what I really want to know. Why is it that someone with exactly your education went to your school in your field, educated by the, the same professors you know you you were and 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 your faculty? Okay, you have, you have you have people who were educated by the same people that educated your faculty who don't buy atheism. They don't find it persuasive at all. Rather, they find theism and Christianity very persuasive. So, so what I want to know is, have you really thought about how this isn't an intellectual position? That it, it's really not about who's smart and who's dumb, because I can, I can, you know, you, you can, you can show people you know, hard sciences. There are thousands, ten thousands, of people in the hard sciences who are educated at the same universities. They have the same PhDs. They're published in the same journals. They write or co-write for the same publishers. You know, they, they, they go to the same conferences. They belong to the same scientific organizations. Their papers are cited just as often as somebody else's, and they are Christians. Okay, why is that? Can you explain that to me, Mr. Atheist? I want to know if you realize, if you've come to grips with the fact that there are many people just like you and the people who taught you that find your atheism completely unpersuasive. Why is that? If you really think about it, they've only got a couple of choices. They have to say, well, all those other people are deceived. All those other people are lying. Well, good. You're an, you're an atheist and you want to depend on, on you know, empirical research. So where are the studies for that? Can you show me a study that, that, that proves empirically, scientifically, that all of these other people are deceived and all of these other people are lying? Can you show me that? Okay, they obviously can't. And what, what you want to do is you want to you get them to start thinking about, well, why do, I really, why do I adopt this position? And oftentimes it's because they've met one Christian or maybe 10 Christians that are just jerks. Uh, the Christians have done them wrong. They have some, some problem of pain, just more broadly speaking, and they're blaming God for that. And, and that's when you can, you know, Lord willing, with, with the pain issue, you can, you can, you know, help them to realize, well, lots of other people have gone through exactly the same thing. And that's not to excuse it, but it is to say that, you know, you, you, have, a, you have a group here, you know, that, you know, sort of becomes your, your peer in, in, in this regard. You know, people who have suffered exactly the same thing and they know it's horrible, but, but they process it a different way. So the question is really about processing it. Why do they, why do they process it this way and you process it another way? You know, atheism, I, I think, 
it, what you're what you're trying to do is you're trying to show the atheist that at the end of the day, their position is no more intellectual than anything else than theism or Christianity. They're they're winding up in their position for some other reason, and and maybe the best you can do is just have that conversation with them, and then if they were burned by Christians, you know, then then you need to be the counterexample. You need to have you have the best relationship with that person you can possibly have. You need to affirm them in any way that you can uh, to, to help defy the stereotype or sort of undo or at least be, be a living apology for what happened to them. Because typically it's about pain and it's, it's about anger you know, with, with the atheist. But a lot of them are, just have never really at all taken the time. They just assume a position of intellectual superiority and they've never actually thought about the kind of questions you know I just brought up here, but but quoting a scripture, then that's not going to do anything. In fact, that's what they expect. That's what they expect, and they're they're just going to dismiss that. It's only after they've thought and processed about why they're making the decision that they do that if they if they you know can can at least you know cross the road to theism, then, then things like appeal to, to scripture might might be something that's really useful. But at, from the gate at the outset. We have no reason to to suspect that that's going to move them at all, but and I'll admit, you know, we don't know what's going on in their heart of hearts. You know, maybe in the, in the Word of God, you know, God can take His Word and use it in, in some specific way, but to just sort of randomly quote something about them to defend yourself—that's what they expect. They expect you to defend yourself. They don't expect you to really politely insist that they defend themselves and their thinking. And if, if you have a sincere one, if you have an honest one, they should not be afraid to do that. And you just take them through, the, through, through questions like the examples I just gave. Chris in Baltimore, Maryland has a question about John 3.13. The King James Version reading has, quote, Son of man who is in heaven, end quote. One, is it possible this is the correct reading? And two, if so, is this a reference to the Son of Man of Daniel seven? I'm not quite sure. I'm I'm following the question. Um, let's just look at it this way. I don't know of any other readings that don't say Son of Man, like that that would say something else. For instance, Son of God or something. Uh, Son of Man, just that part of the phrase is textually secure. Now there are additions to that. You know, the Who is in Heaven is one of those, and then there'll be other. Uh, some manuscripts will have that; others won't have that. Um, something like Metzger's textual commentary, you know, will address that. Um, I, l- looking at the textual evidence, th- who is in heaven again is, in terms of manuscript data, probably uh, a, a little better, a little better off, you know, man- in terms of manuscript data than the alternative than not having something there. Uh, I don't think it's a specific reference, though, to. To Daniel seven, uh, you know who is in heaven. You know it, it. It it could be. You know in John, you know Son of Man who is in heaven, the human one who's in heaven. I mean el- elsewhere, Son of Man, you know, is pretty, pretty generic. If who is in heaven, you know, is is the correct reading, it might be an allusion uh, to that figure. But uh, again, there there are other there are other ways you could you could look at it. You could just say, first of all, you could deny the who is in heaven part. Then you're just stuck with Son of Man. That's very generic. You know, even if you have it, Son of Man, you know, who is in heaven, Jesus may not, you know, you, I'm not saying I read it this way, but people could read that and say, well, you know, Jesus is not really identifying himself with, with that or something to that, that effect. Uh, I think it's, it, it, it's possible that it's an allusion to Daniel 7. What I would really want to sort of feel better about it is some reference to the clouds. Uh, that that sort of thing. Now you could say, well, come, you know, in heaven, clouds. You know, it, it's kind of six of one, half dozen of another. Okay, but but you have passages also from John, like John six forty one, where you have the you have the Son of Man who you know, has come down from heaven. Okay, well, uh, again, that that's not really people wouldn't really process that as a fulfillment. Of Daniel seven because you're missing the everlasting kingship stuff, you know, giving, you know, being handed dominion over the nations of the world and all that, and it, it's the same thing here in, in John you know, three thirteen. So, I, I would say that there's some possibility in in 
in these more generic passages that maybe the, the Daniel 7 is lurking in the background, but I certainly wouldn't uh, say that the writer is sort of viewing this as some kind of tight identification or, or we're moving toward fulfillment of that idea. I think that does come later. Uh, Jesus gets more explicit uh, when he's on trial uh, before Caiaphas. He, there's a more secure quotation of Daniel 7 there. So that's the way I would approach it. I would say well, there, there, there's some possibility here. There's, there's some things I wish I'd like to see that would make it a little bit tighter. But I think it's, a, it's at least possible. Samuel from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, has a question that was prompted from episode 70 on an answer you gave, and he wants to know what happens to the Holy Spirit if -hmm. someone turns their back on God. Does the Holy Spirit leave? Yeah, I would say, um, okay, he referenced the earlier episode. We've done more recent things that are in the same area, you know, same theological topic as this question. So I would say, you know, just generally, it'd probably be a good, a good thing to do to listen to some of the other episodes. But for this one, let's just say this. I would say that the, the New Testament says the Holy Spirit can be grieved and quenched. Again, the Holy Spirit indwells us to mark us. And marking us is, is how I take the sealing language of certain passages, sealed with the Holy Spirit. I think that refers to being marked. Uh, sort of marked out from others. Not, I don't take it in terms of, of having some irreversible status on you. So I think the Holy Spirit indwells us to mark us as believers and to sanctify us and assist us in walking with the Lord. His presence doesn't guarantee that people will not turn from belief. Else the writer of Hebrews and other writers in the New Testament would have no reason to be concerned. The very fact that they're concerned that people not turn from the faith tells you, or at least it ought to tell you, that the sealing language of the Holy Spirit is not about making it impossible for people to turn away from the faith. Certainly the New Testament writers are not reading the language that way because they are concerned. So either, either you know, we, we should, as it were, walk up to them and say, hey, you know, Hebrews guy and, you know, Paul or whoever else it is, don't don't worry. Don't don't you guys realize that that once you have the Holy Spirit, that that turning from the faith is impossible. So you don't need to worry. It's very obviously not what's that's not what's going on in the New Testament. And it's 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 I would say it's painfully obvious. Anyway, in, in Ephesians four thirty, you know, get, given that little backdrop, in Ephesians four thirty, grieve not the Holy Spirit. We have to presume, and and again just reading it sort of gives us the impression that it is possible that the spirit can be grieved further. And this is a little digging a little bit deeper. The grieving language of the Holy spirit might come from Isaiah 63 10, because the language is the same there. They rebelled, they grieved his Holy spirit. And the rest of the verse says, therefore he, the Holy spirit turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. This is Israel in the wilderness wanderings, you know, where, where God gets angry uh, you know, at the Israelites for their reaction. You know, they, they just, they grieve the spirit, they turn away, you know, they rebel, all this kind of stuff. Well, again, if that could happen in the Old Testament, and if Ephesians 4 is quoting this passage about grieving the spirit, well, that, that says something. It, it, it's possible that the grieving language does come from that passage, and if so, then the Holy Spirit can act in judgment against a person who abandons faith. You know, that, that's just kind of scriptural math there. First Thessalonians 5.19, quench not, you know, quench not the Holy Spirit. This is the same verb lemma, the, the one translated quench, as in Ephesians 6.16, where, where the fiery darts from the evil one are extinguished. Again, same lemma. It would seem that belief and the ministry of the Holy Spirit positively to a believer are intertwined. They are interrelated. That's another way of saying, if, if you want the ministry of the Holy Spirit to work out in your life, you need to believe. So we're all we're back to square one again. Okay, you need to believe. If this is a concern to New Testament writers that believers forsake their faith, they turn against and away from the God of Israel, from the gospel, against the gospel. That seems to be a, a very transparent concern in the New Testament. And for that reason, if that is a concern, and it's not hard to find, I mean we we truck through a number of passages in the book of Hebrews. If that's the case, 
then what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, the Holy Spirit could judge them. He could be the agent of judgment. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean, and it didn't mean in the Old Testament, that the Spirit of God never has a positive you know, ministry to that person. He certainly did with the nation of Israel. Why would we expect in, in, you know, on, the, on the other side, in the New Testament, for the Spirit of God to not also try to draw them back? Again, we talked about that in Hebrews as well. That, that one of the ministries of the Spirit of God is, is to, to work in the heart of a person to help them to believe, to keep them in the faith. But the Spirit can be quenched. The Spirit can be, again, grieved. We don't really like to, to talk about these kind of verses. Again, it's, it's largely because of the theology that sort of we have in our, bra- in our background that makes us look at these passage, passages and sort of conclude that turning from the faith wasn't a real problem. That would have been news to the New Testament writers. Otherwise, why are they writing about it? And in the case of the writer of Hebrews, why is he hung up on it? Well, the answer is, you know, the context, the persecution, the, just the hardship. This was a real concern. It was not a fabricated concern. It's not a theologically misguided concern. It's in the New Testament. And by virtue of it, you know, the whole idea of inspiration, I would say it's a valid concern. So the bottom line is that, again, the writer of Hebrews, other writers are either genuinely concerned about people abandoning the faith, or they're not, or they're, or they're dumb, or they're just theologically inept. I don't think they were dumb or theologically inept. I think this is a real concern. So if people cannot turn from the faith, these concerns are illegitimate. The writers are making some sort of theological error. I don't think they're in error. If they can, if people can turn from the faith, then the presence of the Spirit is about something else other than guaranteeing that people can't turn away. <laughs> Again, this is, this is very simple, step-by-step logic. You know, thinking about what we read in the text, I'll repeat it. If people can turn away from the faith, and that seems to be a, a big concern for certain writers in the New Testament, if they can turn away, then the presence of the Spirit is about something else besides guaranteeing that people who profess Christ can never reject that belief. It's pretty evident, again, the writers are really concerned about it, so it would seem that we should take their concern seriously. We don't want the Spirit of God, who is, again, working to keep us in the faith. We don't want the the Spirit of God to have to judge us, uh, to have to chastise us, be the agent of chastisement. You know, maybe that's for our own good, because the Spirit of God will, as he did in the Old Testament with the Israelites, who were cantankerous and rebellious uh, across their history. The Spirit of God did, you know, act on occasion, you know, as, a, as a, an agent of judgment, but he also acted, you know, on other occasions as the agent that, that God would use to draw them back, you know, through various means back to himself. Why don't we just get into our questions of the week? And Good idea. Our first two are from Marion. And the first question is, could Dr. Heiser explain what the exact sin of Nadab and Abahu was? Does strange fire mean coals from somewhere other than the altar? Was it because it was not Aaron offering the incense? Was it incense supposed to be burned on the incense altar? Well, this this is a pretty easy one. I'm going to suggest to Marion that uh, episode 73 in our Leviticus series, specifically the episode in Leviticus 10, uh, answers all those questions. So I don't, I don't think I can sort of condense that in two minutes and improve on it. So that that's my answer. Go listen to episode 73. Only if every, eventually, Mike, we're going to have every answer to every question. <laughs> right. Just go listen to certain episodes. So I like that. Right. All of right. Of course. Question two is what is Mike's opinion on the lost chapter of Acts found in Constantinople? Well, I, I had never actually heard of this uh, lost chapter of Acts found in Constantinople. So I looked it up. There, it, it was discovered and published in 1871. This supposed lost chapter. There are zero peer-reviewed articles on it. There are also zero dissertations. That's a bad sign. <laughs> in other words, this has all the trappings of some sort of paleo babble kind of document that no scholar since 1871 has thought enough of to actually do any study on it. 
So again, that that's a bad sign. But you know, for the sake of of you know learning about it, I did do you know some looking online since I, I don't have anything peer reviewed to go to, and we'll put this link uh, on uh, the episode website in case people want to see this. But again, this manuscript found again in the late 1870s purports to be uh, the Acts 29, a missing chapter of the book of Acts. There are some really good, uh, at this link, there's some really good questions to ask. And again, these are the kinds of things that just make the whole thing stink. You know, where's the original manuscript? Now, the the writer of, at this particular website notes this. The manuscript, if it existed at all, was found in the possession of a sultan in the late 1700s or early 1800s at the earliest. The information about the manuscript was first published in 1871, almost 150 years ago. There's nothing in terms of research databases or whatnot that show that the manuscript has been seen by anyone else in the last 150 years. The actual, you know, like original manuscript, or what purports to be the original manuscript, that's a bad sign. That means that scholars can't take this original manuscript, presumably, of course, written in Greek, if it's, this was Luke's hand, and a copy of something produced by Luke, like the rest of the book of Acts. There are literally millions, millions, I'm not exaggerating, millions of Greek manuscripts from the period, uh, not just of the New Testament, I'm talking about the, the, the like Koine Greek you know, fragments, fragments of, of Greek material from the first couple centuries before and you know, go on into the early Christian centuries overlapping with the era of the New Testament uh, that have been found and cataloged and scholars work on them, put them into databases and whatnot. And to see that nobody knows where this one is, is highly suspicious. Another question he asks is, where are the references in ancient literature to a lost chapter of Acts? Does anyone ever talk about a, a, something at the end, is this, this chapter uh, being lost? Or does anyone ever talk about how it, you know, Acts should not end at chapter 28? And the answer is no. Nobody even suggests that anything has been lost from the end of the book of Acts. So, again, another really, really bad sign. Now, if you do any reading on this, you'll find out that there are things in this presumed lost chapter that are used to promote the idea of British Israelism. And that pretty much is the death blow. This has, again, all the marks of a manuscript contrived, made up, to enforce an idea in the 19th century. Remember, this was supposedly came out in 1871. Uh, this is one of those eras, 19th century, early 20th century, where this idea of British Israelism, you know, that the, the, the British Isles, you know, the people there are vestiges of the lost tribes of Israel, that kind of thing. This is one of the eras where this was a big deal. And so, again, this has all the marks of something made up just to promote this idea. So, what do I think of it? Not much. Jared's question is about episode 103, the Moses and the Bronze Serpent episode. And Dr. Heiser talks about how, as he often does, Genesis 1 through 11 is a polemic of later Babylonian creation and flood stories. And therefore, most likely 1 through 11 was written during the Babylonian exile. I was telling my wife this, and she asked, why couldn't it be the other way around? I didn't have an answer. I've heard from nearly every scholar that Genesis is a polemic of the Mesopotamian stories, but I honestly don't know why. Couldn't mm -hmm. someone just as easily say Genesis 1 through 11 was written first and those stories are polemics of Genesis? What are the reasons this is not the case? Because the Babylonian material is demonstrably older by a long shot. You know, let, let's just take broadly speaking, you've got Creation stories from you know that are Sumerian, others that are going to be Akkadian. Uh, all of this you know it sort of gets lumped together. It's Mesopotamian material, whether it's Akkadian from the Babylonian period or whatever, some other period than Sumerian. So the Sumerian, uh, Mesopotamian, Sumerian, Akkadian stuff about creation stories that have parallels or not you know yeah, parallels is a fair word in some cases, but that that somehow have a a literary or a conceptual, you know, worldview uh, correspondence to stuff in, in Genesis 1 through 11 is centuries, even millennia older. 
than the biblical material. So it can't work the other way around. Now, if we narrow that to, let's just say, Enuma Elish, the Babylonian um, creation story that, that is essentially written to glorify Marduk. Now, if you believe that even if you, even if you believe that let's say that Genesis Genesis one through eleven was written by by Moses, so let's just give it a round number fifteen hundred BC. That would be nine hundred, you know, to you know maybe a thousand years earlier than the Marduk story. Okay, that would that would be the case. Now that still doesn't help because a lot of the details of the Marduk story are older than that. It's just that in this particular creation story. The details are are changed and manipulated to make Marduk the greatest of all gods and, and all that kind of stuff. So there are still threads, even in that later text, that predate the biblical material. If you're with most scholars, and I, I've said before, I think Genesis 1 through 11 was either probably a combination composed and, and heavily edited during the exile specifically to respond to the theology of the captors of, of you know, the, the two tribes there held in Babylon. If you believe that, then the creation story, Enuma Elish, again, the Marduk creation story, and, and the Hebrew Bible, specifically this material in Genesis 1 through 11, uh, is really coming into being at roughly the same time. So it would be very, you're not even really helped by that, because then you have to assume, and this is my, sort of my second trajectory on this, why would we assume that an elite scribal class of Mesopotamians feel it's worth their time at all to respond to something a captive Jewish scribe is writing? You only do polemic if you think something is a threat to you. The, the, you know, if if you're the Babylonians and the Jews are your captives, you know they're not going anywhere without your permission. And who's paying attention to what they do religiously? We're living in Babylon. You know, it's not like the Jews have have either the ability in, in terms of production or the permission to write something down and then distribute it throughout the empire. And then Babylonian scribes look at that and go, "Oh boy, we need to respond to this." It doesn't make any sense. They're not going to care one whit about what a bunch of captives are writing about their own theology and their own history. So, you know, looking at it in reverse just just doesn't make any sense. You know, you have you have the chronological problem with the material from the get-go, but even if it was contemporaneous and some of it is, but but not a whole lot of it, uh why would an empire power like Babylon care about responding to the literature of a captive people? You know, there there'd be no there'd be no need. We're not afraid of your god you're you're sitting here in Babylon. Our God conquered your God. Why should we care what you're writing? So it it just doesn't make sense, either chronologically or sort of in the circumstances of the day. Our next question is from Jack. This probably seems like a weird question, but when Jesus was being tempted in the desert and was offered all the nations in return for Jesus worshiping the tempter, why would this not have fulfilled the mission? In Jesus's mind. He would be, quote, sacrificing himself to rescue the nations, which at the time, if he didn't have foreknowledge of the entire plan, would seem to have accomplished his goal. Well, according to what we read in the New Testament about the temptation, Jesus wasn't sacrificing himself. You know, he wouldn't have been sacrificing himself. So I think the premise of the question um, sort of undermines the question. Uh, the the, the trade off is worshiping Satan. It doesn't say the trade-off is well. Let me put you to death. You know, we're, we're, we can't read the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You know, back into uh, the, the the account of you know what's going on with Jesus and Satan in the desert. And I'm, I'm not saying that the questioner is, but that's a sort of a familiar analogy uh, to a lot of modern people because of the popularity of of C.S. Lewis and that particular book. But but Satan never demands Jesus' life. He he doesn't demand the death. Uh, the, the trade-off is worshiping Satan, and, and and I would say that you need a death. You can't. Be, the, the Old Testament has lots of resurrection talk, and the basis of the resurrection uh, is at stake here. You you, you can't have. You, you need the first fruits of the resurrection. You need death conquered. Okay, and and if we have the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world that suggests that he has to die, and then to conquer death, he has to be raised again. So there, there are a number of theological ideas at stake here. 
that just bowing down to Satan without having a death and a resurrection, it just doesn't accomplish what needs to be accomplished. You know, then you have like typology of sacrifices, you know, the, the blood sacrifice thing. I mean, there, there's that element as well. So honestly, it just doesn't fit. There's another issue here, though, that we don't want to overlook, and that is the mission of Jesus wasn't only about reclaiming the nations. Okay, we, we can't just funnel the mission uh, of, of the incarnation, the whole plan you know, of God, about to be about reclaiming the nations. We have a number of problems that, that the Messiah has to fix, one of, it, one of which is the death problem, the estrangement from God problem, and the loss of immortality for humankind. So without you, you can't have death defeated unless you defeat death, and you can't defeat death unless you die and then conquer it. So we, we have the, these sort of theological and conceptual elements uh, to, to think about when it comes to the mission. And then when it comes to what, what the trade-off is, this whole thing about worshiping Satan, since it doesn't involve you know, the death and the resurrection, it can't be viewed as satisfying um, you know, the, the whole point of the mission. All right. Our next question is from Jad. In Genesis 7, 19 through 20, there is mention of the floodwaters exceeding the heights of the mountains by 15 cubits. Is it possible that this statement is another example of a polemic by the biblical authors against the gods and their high places? Whenever I've been involved in discussion with fellow Christians about the flood event, this verse is often cited to justify the flood as a truly worldwide event. How should I understand this text? Yeah, I, I don't think you can get a polemic uh, here. You know, that if, if we're this is this is peripherally, I would say, really peripherally uh, related to you know time of authorship. You know, you, you could say that someone later, you know, writing later, either either Moses, but even that's a, a hard sell because what, what you need is you need a proliferation of high places in Israel, in, in Israel, so that people know what in the world's going on here. Um, but but that's really not the referent of you know the the, the mountain tops. There's no indication. That there's any specific top that you could say, oh yeah, that X Y Z God from Babylon lives there, and and, and the author's shooting at that deity. There, there's nothing in the passage like that. Uh, people, you know, there there wouldn't have been any high places at the time of the flood. There isn't, you know, the worship of other gods at the time of the flood. So that is rules it out. And if you're going with what the later writers would have known about high places, you would expect them to sort of plant something. Uh, in there that would would help the reader identify specifically uh, that feature, because as the reader reads this, the reader is not assuming you know that there's any worship of, of other gods at the time either. He would have to, he, the reader would have to be directed to something specific and then mentally associate that that something specific with a deity current, you know, that's part of their current knowledge base. And there's just nothing like that, you know. I, it, but having said that. I think there's a problem generally, or at least a conceivable problem, with using the reference to you know water over the you know the, the mountains by 15 cubits, using that to to justify a global flood. I mean, on, on my website, I, I posted my little you know thought experiment that hey, you know, and the reason I did this, I think, is evident from the first paragraph. You know, it, we, we should not th those those listeners out there who prefer the global flood, you know, fine. What, I wrote what I wrote on my website to make this point and, and really only this point that it's wrong for you to presume that the local regional view has no biblical argument. It actually does have a, have a pretty good biblical argument. It's not that hard to make a biblical, a text based argument for a local regional event as opposed to a global flood. And so I, I wanted people to know that because if for some reason, you know, it becomes like impossible, you know, to believe in a global flood at some point, you know, in the future, that shouldn't trouble you about the Bible because it's very easy to make a text-based argument for a local regional view. And it, going back, you know, to this this wording here, you have to ask yourself, you know, questions like, okay, fifteen cubits above above the mountain tops, okay, the, the, the high mountains. Well, how high is high? You know, it doesn't matter how, how, how much the water overwhelms it. If you have a hill that's a thousand feet tall, like in a, in a regional event, and that's over covered, you know, by 15 cubits, well, that's impressive, but that's not like you're, you're doing, you're talking about Mount Everest. Okay, how high is high? What's a mountain? 
because the same word for used for mountain in the flood account can be used for hill elsewhere. Again, I, I point these things out in the process of that you know article. So uh, a lot of people will take this language and sort of assume they have this compelling, you know, this deeply compelling argument, but they really don't. And, and they, they fail. They get distracted, I think, unfortunately, from addressing the arguments of the local regional view, which, which they have to do. A lot of people who take the global view of the floods don't think they have anything to refute. They do. Uh, and and the, the issue, issue of context is, is really uh, significant because if we look at the flood account that you know, the, the, the whole earth, you know, quote unquote, you know, the, the whole earth, coal uh, arets, you know, is, is overcome with water. Well, all a local regional view person has to do is say, well, look at the context for that. Look at Genesis 9, 19. Here's what it says. These three, talking about Shem, Ham, and Japheth, sons of Noah, these three were the sons of Noah, and from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. It defines whole earth as the peoples, and of course, the lands that extend from Noah. In other words, it's the nations and the table of nations. And that table of nations has nothing to say about Australia, China, North America, South America, Central America, Canada, either polar region. It has nothing to say at all about most of the planet. Instead, it's a region. It's the you know, central, eastern, Mediterranean. You throw Tarshish in there, you get the whole Mediterranean. And then what we know is the Middle East, you know, Tigris and Euphrates Valley, you know, on up into, into Asia Minor and Turkey. So is it conceivable you know, that, that, that there was a flood that encompassed a, a huge portion of that region of the world? Because that's how the biblical writers in Genesis 9, define, quote, the whole earth, unquote. So that, that's what you, as a, as a global flood uh, proponent, you have to deal with that kind of argument, which is another, you know, really why I put it up there as well, um, to show people that, look, this is not a hill worth dying on, the, the, the flood issue, the flood debate. And it's incorrect for global flood believers, proponents, to just presume they have no argument, they have, they have nothing to refute. It, this is so. This is so self-evident. I have nothing to refute here. It's actually incorrect. You know, there there is there are a number of things here to think about. So I don't think it's a really good use. You know, of, of that idea there, or this this cubit thing over the the tops of the mountains, because it's it's just the description itself is malleable. It, it requires definition. And if you have an argument that requires definition, it's not that great of an argument. Our first one is from a mic, another mic. I have a question about an observation that is right up the alley of Mike's expertise. So here we go. Is the quote already but not yet pattern that seems to be relatively common just a matter of the basic Hebrew verbs? being either perfect or imperfect. Obviously, completed actions are perfect, but the ones still in process are imperfect, already started, but not yet complete. The part of the process started becomes the already, while the final completion is the not yet. Is this just an example of a natural tension that will always exist to some degree when one translates between languages with different grammar and syntax? Well, I would say on the one hand, you can't express already but not yet things uh, either in Greek or whatever. Um, let's use Greek for our example, or, or of course English. You know, translate them into English without using certain you know tenses, proclivities of the language. So, so there's a relationship between the grammar and naturally the ideas. That are being expressed. You know, there's, you know, it, it, you can't really do one without the other. I, I would, I would say that we shouldn't go so far though as to say that the ideas themselves completely and only derive from uh, the the language proclivities or the language um, conventions, and not not from some you know bigger sense of of um, you know what's going on in the flow of not just you know history, but really in the flow of the plan of God on a on sort of a, a meta narrative scale. So I would say that the two things, the grammar and the ideas, they're related, but they're not 
completely equivalent. That, that's how I would approach this. Let me try to think of a good illustration here. So what, what I'm trying to say is that the theological ideas come from what the grammar expresses, but you know, and so it's not like this English Greek struggle or disconnect. I mean, the ideas are going to flow from the ideas are going to you know derive from what the grammar allows and what the grammar expresses. The grammar creates the categories or the ideas, and it's left for for us to discern what the pairing means. So you you have semantic issues and you have grammatical issues. By way of example, that you know some other something else other than eschatology might help illustrate this. How about sanctification? We have statements like in 1 Corinthians 6.11, you have been sanctified, versus other statements in the letters of Paul that say, "May you know, where, where he, he requests a hope or, or a wish, may you be sanctified in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. So on the one hand, he's, he's looking at a, at a bunch of believers, and good grief, it's the Corinthians, okay? You can't get more kind of messy than that. And he says, you have been sanctified. And then he looks at another group and said, may you be sanctified. Now, you also get this, this notion in, in Hebrews chapter 10. And, and if you look at Hebrews 10, 10 and verse 14, and frankly, I think verse 14 is, is even a better example because you actually have both grammatical issues in the same verse there. But I'm going to read verses 10 through 14. Let's go back to verse 9, get a little context. This is, again, the conversation between the Father and the Son here about providing salvation. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will, the Son says to the Father. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. Here's verse 10. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then you get you know, down to verse 14. By a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So in verse 10, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus. And then the same offering in verse 14 produces this idea of still being sanctified. So you could say, well, is that only, do we only think about that as already but not yet because of the grammar? Well, the grammar is certainly indispensable. But you can think about it in terms of real life and, you know, again, certain accomplishments of Jesus. Jesus did do a certain thing. He did die on the cross. He did rise again. He you know, ascended to the right hand of the Father, all that stuff. So Jesus does things. He accomplishes tasks. He accomplishes the will of God. And that results in something. Namely, when we are joined to his body, we are in Christ. We are sanctified because he is sanctified. We are identified with him. But yet in, in, our, in our own life, we are still progressing. We're still growing. We're still being conformed with the image of his son, as Paul would say, uh, those, those ideas. So there's a progression here. And, and the progression is linked to the same sacrifice as the already element. And, and we, can, we can sort of know this by experience. You know, we, we, we take a point of theology and we say, well, this is great that God says this about me, that I'm, I've been sanctified, okay? This is, this is wonderful. But then we, we look at our own lives and go, boy, I don't, don't feel very sanctified today. I don't look like it. I didn't look like it 10 minutes ago. You know, you know, I didn't think this way when I sinned or I did this, that, or the other thing. So we know, you know from real life that, that this is – the Christian life, again, is – is being lived out in real time. We are still people. We are not superhumans. We are not. We, we didn't absorb the nature of God in all of its ex- exhaustiveness, so that we never sin anymore, never have any proclivity to sin. But there's nothing like that. that that's true, and we know that by experience. So in the in the bigger picture, again, we we know we we have a good sense. There's already something in the mind of God going on about us when he thinks about us, but then there's still this something else, this this not yet aspect that is sort of where the rubber meets the road. And we can we, we know that that's true, not by mere intuition, but there's there's there is intuition, but there's also our own life experience. So the grammar helps us express that and express why it is that God can look at us one way and our life our life experience be something that seems to be at odds or seems to be out of sync with the way God looks at us. So there, there's, there's, there's a bigger picture here. There's, a, there's an experiential element. 
to what's going on. So the grammar is is intimately part of expressing that, but the theological ideas uh, again aren't exclusively about verb forms and grammars. Another illustration would be, you know, died to sin. You know, Paul will will, will speak of believers as having died to sin, and then he then he'll later command believers to die to sin. Well. You know how how do we get that? Again, it, it's a, it's a differentiation between what we are in the mind of God and and what what the scripture writers are are trying to teach us. They're trying to teach us to look at us how God looks at us. God looks at us a certain way because when we believe in Christ, we are united to Christ. We are we are part of His body. We become the body of Christ. We are in Christ. All these all these metaphorical kind of statements, and that tells us how. God's estimation of us, not not on our own merit, obviously, but because of something Jesus has already accomplished in real time. And then there's the 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 living out of it, you know, our our experience in life that doesn't quite you know sync up, you know, with with the other parts. So there's a God perspective based on the already accomplished things uh, that that Jesus did, and then there's our own perspective from our own life experience. And so the scripture writers tell us why this disconnect is there and how to process it. So grammar is an important part of that. But I, I think there's, I don't think thinking about the grammar really uh, enables us to think completely or exhaustively about the issue. Uh, I think we need a little bit more than that. So that sort of the, the, the sum is greater than the parts in, in, in some respects. Our next question is from Elizabeth from Pecos, New Mexico. Now, West Texas, we say Pecos, so I'm going to go with Pecos <laughs> just for the New Mexicans. Are they New Mexicans? Is that what we say? I know. What, what are New Mexicans? I guess. Are if you're, new, from new Mex- you're, new if you're from New Mexico. Well, Elizabeth, I'm not from New Mexico. So <laughs> maybe Elizabeth can authority. email me <laughs> and let me know what the proper uh, term is. But her question is, As Dr. Heiser reveals the book of Hebrews to us, there came up a discussion in regards to wisdom as feminine. So in Luke 7, verse 31 through 35, Jesus himself states, quote, but wisdom is vindicated by all her children, end quote. Is it fair to say that Jesus, the son of man, is referring he is one of wisdom's children? Is it possible that the father God and Mother Wisdom begot the Word, whom created all things, as one of her children. Well, if we if if we went back to the prior sentence, that this idea that Jesus was one of Wisdom's children. If you define wisdom as God Himself, as you know, another aspect or person. You know, I'm using Godhead language here deliberately. Um, and and we're still talking about God. Well, that that would be another way of talking about Jesus as the Son of God. Okay, that, then you'd be okay. But but following it up with Father God and Mother Wisdom, as though there's some sort of cosmic cohabitation here between two distinct entities. And the key word there is distinct entities, uh, two ontologically distinct entities, and then producing Jesus. Then then there's a problem, and and the problem really comes from reading gender terms in the translation proverbs 8 to luke 7 whatever it is proverbs 8 is is the origin point for a lot of this uh when we have um wisdom as being god's agent of creation proverbs 8 22 and following and wisdom being referred to in feminine terms so when we read that in translation we think of wisdom as a woman and that that is the way in proverbs that wisdom is cast you know we we have the uh you know, wisdom as a woman, and then we have the the woman known as folly. You know that, that, that these two are co- contrasted in Proverbs to teach you know certain precepts, certain uh, ethics, standards of ethics and morals. Now you have to ask yourself, well, why is how do how do we parse that? Why is that done? Uh, I I actually have a paper on this that's freely accessible online. If you go to www the divine council, that's t h e d i v i n e. C O U N C I L dot com, the divine council dot com, and look for the the paper entitled Jesus and the Wisdom Figure of Proverbs eight. Part of the issue is that this language, this feminine language, should not be confused with gender, okay, biological gender, so that we don't have a a, a dad and a mom, okay, when we talk about God and wisdom, 
we, we don't we don't have that. We don't have th- this cosmic cohabitation that produces Jesus and all that sort of thing. The the the, the gender the, the reason the translations are the way they are is because languages inflected languages th- those are languages that have like verb endings and noun endings and then you have to. The endings have to match up for subject-verb agreement grammatically. Anybody who's had Spanish or German or French or you know Greek and, and Hebrew, for that matter, uh, will, will know what I'm talking about here. Is uh, you know English is not a is not a gendered or an inflected uh, in, inflected driven language. English is largely driven by word order, as opposed to a set of endings and whatnot. But other languages, lots of other languages require grammatical gender for all words, all nouns, and what are called finite verb forms, so that you can match up a noun with the verb. You can tell what is the subject of the verb as opposed to what's the object of the verb. To do that, languages use grammatical gender. It has nothing to do with biological gender. My favorite illustration of this is in German. In German, das Mädchen. It's it's a term that means little girl is neuter. It's grammatically neuter. Obviously, little girls are girls. They're not neuter, hermaphroditic, whatever. <laughs> okay, it, it's just a good illustration. But German, like Spanish, like French, like whatever, words for hammer, words for wall, words for straw, words for glass, words for you know corner, words for car, they all have gender. It has nothing to do with biology. And so it, we have to realize that this is just a, a classification system that languages share, and this is how, how they do it. Gender, number, is it singular, plural? Some languages have a dual, where you do it, you, you have a pair, not, not more than two, not one, just two. Uh, you have that separate uh, numerical category. Gender, number are, are the big ones. You also have case you know, systems and whatnot. But these are all classification features of a language. It has nothing to do with biological gender. So if you, if you realize that, you can read Proverbs 8. You can read statements about wisdom and other passages and know that we're not talking about a female entity. Okay, we're talking about a, a, you know, a personification of a concept. Okay, in this case, wisdom. Wisdom cast as a woman by the writer for, for literary and rhetorical reasons you know to communicate certain ideas they're not hinting at not trying to get us to think about biology and mothers and fathers and children in that sense the sense that we're usually used to thinking about so again the divinecouncil.com look at the paper of jesus and the wisdom figure of proverbs 8 and again that would that'll serve a little bit better a little bit beyond uh, this this answer at least in in our episode here Becky from Massachusetts has her next question. The ESV reading of, of Deuteronomy thirty two seventeen is, quote, They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded, end quote. What is the significance of the phrase, quote, new gods that had come recently, end quote, especially the recently mm-hmm. part? Yeah. Well, I'll get to that, but let me say at first, the ESV translation of Deuteronomy 32.17 is awful. It's one of the few translations that will have something like, they, res- they sacrificed to demons that were no gods, plural. Now, you think about that. Oh, the demons, okay, they're not gods. And then the very next phrase is, to gods. They sacrificed to gods they had never known. Well, are they gods or are they not? It's a self-contradicting translation. And it's a very poor translation. I suspect that whoever did the translation felt uncomfortable with divine plurality here. What you actually have, and I wrote, I have a published journal article on this that I, I, I don't think it's freely accessible. It might be. You might be able to find it with Google. Um, it's, it's the title something like, it's Deuteronomy 32.17, or does Elohim in Deuteronomy 32.17, should it be translated gods or something like that? But anyway, what the text actually says is they sacrificed to Shadim, demons, in this English translation, not Eloah. Eloah is, is singular. It's only, always, always and only singular. So you should not be translating it with a plural. 
It should say they sacrificed to demons, not God, to gods they had never known. Now, that makes perfect sense. It doesn't contradict itself. So just, let's just adding that, the ESV here is just not good on, on this particular verse. And most, I think mo- I think it is fair to say most other English translations will, will do much better uh, with the verse than that. Now, about the, the newly, you know, the, the, the recent you know, gods that they had recently, they had never known, gods had come along recently, so on and so forth. You know, we have to, again, put ourselves in the historical situation. Israel had a relationship with Yahweh first. Then later, they went after other gods. So the phrasing here refers to the chronology of the story of biblical Israel. They're brought out of Egypt. They journey to Sinai. They enter into a covenant with Yahweh at Sinai, the God of their fathers. They start journeying to the land promised by the earlier covenant the one made at Sinai, and the and you know, the promise is made to the patriarchs, and then they apostatize. A lot of Israelites go off and start worshiping other gods. Either you know, once they get into the land, you know, when they have the, the the conquest episodes, the end of Joshua, especially the beginning of Judges, you know, comments on this that that God you know forsakes them because they intermingle with the population they should have driven out, and they start worshiping those other gods. So. This is what it has in mind. This, this eventually, this, this beginning relationship with Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, the God of their fathers, and then they drift off into worshiping new gods, gods that just had come along much more recently in their history that they're not part of their ancient past, and they apostatize. Now, I, I want to add one other thought here. This question is a really insightful question in in another respect, and that is, think about the wording. And the wording and the story of biblical Israel pretty much requires that Deuteronomy 32 had to have been written after the conquest, okay, after or subsequent to the end of the conquest, the beginning of the book of Judges, and therefore not by Moses. Because you can only... You can only have make this comment about Israel going after other gods, gods they had not known until recently, after it happened. And that didn't happen in the Mosaic period. The only alternative, you know, would be to say, well, maybe they were think maybe Moses wrote this and he's thinking about an apostasy in Egypt. Well, we don't we don't have any biblical record of that. What we do have is a biblical record of Israel being taken out of Egypt, brought to Sinai, covenant with God, the God of their fathers. Yeah, we don't we don't read about any mass apostasy while they're down in Egypt. And then they journey to the promised land. They don't, you know, carry out you know, God's directions completely, they intermingle with the populations and they wind up worshiping other gods. Okay, for, for Deuteronomy 32, at this point of Deuteronomy 32, to make sense, that's hindsight. That's the kind of thing that you get in hindsight in, in Israel's history. So part of this you know, Song of Moses, I think, at least at this verse and maybe, you know, maybe some of the other parts, very clearly, are looking back on something that happened post-Moses. And I say this is insightful because this is the kind of thing you run into elsewhere in the Torah and, and really in other parts of the Bible, too, where we, we assume that it was written during a certain time by a certain person, even though it's, it's not really claimed. I mean, there's no reason that we have to take the phrase law of Moses and presume that Moses wrote every word of this. You know, we, we've had this discussion before on the podcast, and I'm, I'm what used to be called a supplementarian. I think that you know, Moses, you know, there's a, there's a core to the Pentateuch that Moses either wrote or had dictated or, or something. It's specifically connected with the lifetime of Moses, and then it gets accrued to by other people in the prophetic tradition. And, and ultimately, again, we, we had a question a couple of Q&As ago about Genesis 1 through 11, um, again, that which, which I view a lot of that work either, either editorially or maybe in some cases compositionally done during the exile, specifically to poke the Babylonian gods and their religion in, in the eye. You have things like this happen in, in the Torah. All law of Moses means, you know, Torah Moshe, it can mean the law that originated with Moses. It can mean the law that was produced by Moses. It can also mean the law that is associated with Moses. Moses is the central character for most of the Torah. And so it's very natural to think of it as the law of Moses. It could be, you know, the the, the, the law that you know, not only is associated with Moses, but the law that, you know, refers, you know, it, it is what it is, in, in, you know, in reference to the character of Moses. I mean, there are different ways to understand the semantics, realize, 
that this is a, in, in Hebrew, this is a simple, what they call a construct phrase, an X of Y relationship between two nouns. The construct phrase has its own semantics. There are 12, 15 different categories, different ways of thinking about how noun of noun relationships work, you know, what they're trying to say, they're different semantic categories, not just one. So, you know, th- there's no reason to think that or, or require you know, that, that Moses had to write every word. Even with Jesus, Jesus, you know, quote, you know, quotes passages and, and attributes it to the law of Moses. Well, what else would he call it? By Jesus' day, it's the Torah. It's the law. That's what it's known as. If he, if he calls it something else, they're not going to know what, he, what he's talking about. He also refers to, you know, uh, other books that, that don't really even have stated authors. They just get named after the main characters, you know, Samuel, you know, that, that sort of thing. Uh, again, we, we, have to, we have to make sure that how we think about Scripture Actually, it's going to sound kind of crazy, but oftentimes the way we think about inspiration, the, the, the Bible itself gets in the way of our theology. Okay, we, we, we need to you know, put the brakes on that. We, how we think about inspiration and how we think about issues like, like this, like authorship and whatnot, it, it, our conclusions actually need to conform to the Bible itself, to the scripture itself. You know, we, we, we can't formulate an idea and then kind of ignore stuff that we run into. And, but what often what happens is we do formulate ideas, and then we run into passages like this, and we make, make the passage stand on its head so that we can still keep our, the way, our idea the way we think about a certain topic. And, and that, that isn't being text-driven. So we want to try to be text-driven. That's what we do here uh, at the Naked Bible Podcast, or at least we try. And I think this question, again, brings us to one of those points where we really have to think about what we're looking at. Sure, let's go. All right, our first one's from Stephanie, and she has a question regarding generational curses. In the book of Deuteronomy, it talks about the curse of the law and about blessings and curses. As Christians, are we still bound by those laws? Do we have to renounce what our parents did and our grandparents and so on? Yeah, I'm not quite sure from this question exactly what curses uh stephanie's talking about because you know cursing shows up a number of times in deuteronomy so if we're talking about curses tied to the land uh i would say well that's really not sort of in view because the the whole concept of the people of god isn't really tied you know specifically to the land and or uh israel failed you know, in those regards, and they were cursed. I'm thinking of, now I'm thinking of a passage outside Deuteronomy, like in Leviticus 26. It was very clear, if you do this or that, I'm going to drive you from the land, and that happened. You know, that was the exile, and so on and so forth. So if she's talking about that kind of stuff in Deuteronomy, you know, the Leviticus 26 kind of stuff, there's not really much of a connection. But I'm going to, I'm going to assume she's talking about Deuteronomy 5. Um, This is one of those generational curse passages that you know, is is a bit more, you know, sort of not attached to the land. It's a bit it's a bit broader. Let's put, put it that way, or at least you know, not linked to that specific idea. So, on that assumption, I'll just let me read Deuteronomy five. We'll start in verse eight and go through verse ten. And again, I'm just guessing that this is probably what's what's uh, behind the question. Uh, that passage says, "You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth." A sidebar: There's your three-tiered cosmology again. Verse nine: You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So that's the end of the passage. And you get this this third and fourth generation phrasing in this passage. So I'm guessing that's where this comes from. So to the question, you know, are we still bound by the, these laws? Well, in, in one sense, sure. We're not supposed to worship other gods. You know, we're not supposed to bow down to other gods. Uh, the third and fourth generation thing, uh, I think, though, is is kind of really what's driving the bus here. And I would say that Again, in, in my understanding, again, I'm not alone here, it's just in the academic understanding, third and fourth generation, that language is there 
because that essentially amounts to the lifetime, the lifespan of the person who commits the the crime, so to speak. So biblically speaking, um, you know, generation is actually not a terribly consistent thing to nail down in the Old Testament because the term is used in different contexts with different time spans, the longest of which would be a hundred years uh, for a generation. So if you have this family heritage, if you want to take the long number, you know, it, it's probably not, you know, something that's in the picture anyway. But when it comes to sort of human lifespans, human, you know, lineages, that sort of thing, uh, you, you're dealing with a generation being roughly 20 years. And that's, that's defined in terms of just life, life experience, where biblically speaking, people would get married, you know, when they're early and you know, when they're younger than 20 years. They would have children, and those children would grow up again. They'd get married in their teen years, in the twenties, you know, whatever, and have, you know, babies and so on and so forth. So a generation, you know, practically speaking, was roughly twenty years. And if you have third and the fourth generation, that's sixty to eighty years. Chances are the person who commits this offense is going to be dead by the end of the fourth generation. So this is another way of saying, you know, that I'm going to visit. You know, there's there's going to be an effect of, of this sin. God is going to visit you know, the, the sin of the father, really as long as he lives, the rest of his life, and, and his children are going to be affected by it. So third and fourth generation is is pointing to a finite amount of time, even if you take the one instance I can think of where the term generation is, is sort of uh, attached to uh, to something that would be longer than 20 years. In, in case people who are listening are interested in, in, in what I'm thinking of there. It's the Genesis 15 passage where God is, is conversing with Abraham about what's going to happen to his descendants. They're going to go down into Egypt and be you know, in bondage there for 400 years. And, and you have the, if, if you look at the passage, you have four generations uh, mentioned there. So we do the math, four divided by four, you know, 400 divided by four is 100 years. But So it, that, that's probably a, a broad general statement, because if you actually even go look at the generations involved uh, in national Israel from Abraham's time all the way up there, it, it's not very, a very precise number. So, you know, what, what the exact meaning of that is, again, is debated by scholars. But when it comes to actual physical, genealogical generations, people typically in the biblical period got married before they were 20. So we use round numbers. So third and fourth generation is basically the natural lifespan of the person who commits the crime. So, you know, in that sense, you know, we've got, you know, a situation where, okay, let's just say that that's what, what's going on here. Is that fair? You know, why, why, is, you know, why is God looking at it this way? Why, why does the passage say God's going to visit the iniquity? of this person, you know, on the, you know, to the third and fourth generation on the children. Part of this is, has to deal with sort of the Middle Eastern, you know, ancient Near Eastern outlook uh, that scholars would refer to as corporate solidarity. And the idea there is that society, basic unity of society was not the individual, but it was the family and the extended family. Uh, so you have instances, both positive and negative in the Bible, where a person will do something, you know, like a sin, and the you know their their descendants will suffer uh, because of that, and you have the opposite as well, where if somebody does something good, then socially, just societally, their descendants will reap the benefits of what their ancestor did. Uh, the, the positive example, one of the, one of them anyway, would be uh, where you know when, when David is basically trying to to lobby you know Saul that you know, I'm going to go out there and kill Goliath. You know, he gets promised a bunch of things, and his his aunt, his descendants are included in the benefits that will accrue to David if he gets rid of, rid of Goliath. So you have this sort of social sense that if you, in, in David's case, if you do this, you know, life's going to be better, you know, for your kids and their kids and so on and so forth. So you, there's this corporate idea going on in the ancient world that, that's very common. It's not just with Israel, but it's to other civilizations as well. At the time. Now, for, for this question, though, I probably my favorite commentary on, on Deuteronomy is Tigay's. I've, I've quoted it before, and I, I'll just read what, what Tigay says about this idea because there are other places in the Torah, in Deuteronomy, in fact, that are clear that there's individual responsibility going on, that, that 
you know, the, it's the idea that even though we have this sort of corporate mindset, basic unit of society, and there's, you know, corporate solidarity and all that, it isn't necessarily the case that, that God is holding other people guilty for what somebody else does. So, I mean, there's a difference between suffering the effects of sin and being considered somehow a guilty party of something that happened before you were even born. So we have to balance out how we look at this language with other passages in the Torah and specifically in Deuteronomy. So Tige has a nice summary of this. He says, effective as this approach, approach may have been, again, this, this corporate thing, Deuteronomy 24, 16 forbids its application by judicial authorities. Uh, and he quotes the verse, parents shall not be put to death for children, nor children be put to death for parents. A person shall be put to death only for his own crime. That's the end of the verse. So that's very, it's a very clear statement of individual responsibility. And Tige continues, he says, but experience showed that people often do suffer or benefit because of the actions of their ancestors. Cross-generational punishment by God is partially mitigated in the Torah itself. In the Torah, only Exodus 34, 7 and Numbers 14, 18 state without qualification that God visits the sins of fathers upon children. In both versions of the Decalogue, that means both versions of the, of the Ten Commandments, the list of generations to be punished and rewarded is qualified by the phrases, quote-unquote, of those who hate me and, quote-unquote, of those who love me and keep my commandments. And our passage, Deuteronomy 5, 9, and 10, is one of those, one of those qualifying passages. The phrases most likely refer to descendants, meaning that cross-generational retribution applies only to descendants who act as their ancestors did. In other words, God visits the guilt of the fathers on future generations that reject him and rewards the loyalty of ancestors to the thousandth generation of descendants who are also loyal to him. In other words, God punishes or rewards descendants for ancestral sins and virtues along with their own if they, the descendants, continue the deeds of their ancestors. So that's the end of the TGA quote. So in other words, we can't just sort of lift Deuteronomy 5, 9, and 10 out and say, whoa, you know, you, this one of your ancestors did something before you were even born and you're going to suffer for it now. You know, God's going to remember that sin and is going to hammer away at you. Again, you have these other passages in the Torah that make it pretty clear that individual responsibility is 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 important, you know, to God. And so you you, you couple that with these qualifying ideas from other passages to say, well, essentially, if you walk the same walk, if you walk in the steps of your ancestors who did this thing, you're going to pay for it. You're going to suffer for it. Um, so that's a little bit different than suffering the residual effects, say, of a you know broken marriage or you know, maybe alcoholism or something like this, some, some sins that we're familiar with that have a long-lasting effect on people's lives, or at least could. That, that's a little different than, you know, God, you know, holding you, you know, guilty for something that happened before you were ever born. What Tige is suggesting here is that that really isn't the case. You know, the, there are these qualifying passages in the Torah that, that sort of make, again, following in their footsteps in, in a behavioral sort of way part of what's going on in these kind of statements in the Torah. Greg has our next question. In one of the podcasts, Dr. Heiser briefly mentioned the documentary Patterns of Evidence, which discusses an alternate <laughs> timeline for Egyptian history. The producers also mentioned that the histories of surrounding nations are tied to the Egyptian timeline. Sounds like serious implications if the producers are correct. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's true. Uh, this this is a question that is really, really complicated. It's really not possible to give, you know, any sort of detail in a format like this to this question. Um, even I, I'm, I'm going to give it some broad brush strokes here, but even that is really not going to be adequate. If, if people out there in the audience are interested, and Lord help you if you are in, in ancient chronology. <laughs> I say that as somebody who used to really be into this subject and, and sort of it became the pit of despair for all of the all of you who have sort of watched The Princess Bride. Uh, it is a it is a quagmire of obtuseness, complexity and difficulty and really no resolution. 
So if you're, but if, if nevertheless you're still interested in ancient chronology, please subscribe to the newsletter. I've put four or five uh, articles in the protected folder for newsletter subscribers by two authors, one of whom is Roll, R O H L, and the other one is John Bimson, B I M S O N. And the articles essentially talk about redating the Exodus chronology. And, and there you're going to get all the nuts and bolts. But I'm going to try to broad brushstroke this uh, as best I can. The, the, the issue is you do have serious problems in what is called third intermediate period chronology when it, when it comes to ancient Egypt. Egypt, for you know, some of the listeners may know, you have like Old Kingdom, New Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, all that stuff. Well, between those kingdoms, you have intermediate periods. And, the, and Flash, or I guess, you know, quick crash course on Egyptian history, you have kingdoms when you have one pharaoh and everything is sort of solid and stable in society. You have intermediate periods when people are competing to be pharaohs and things are just chaos. So that's how Egyptologists break Egypt's history down. So during one of these, the third intermediate period, which a, a lot of that overlaps, with the divided monarchy in Israel, there are really significant problems in third intermediate period chronology. And this is actually where David Roll, uh, this, he dealt with TIP uh, chronology, third intermediate period chronology in his dissertations. So he, he sort of camps out here. And, you know, I, I've read a, a number of articles by Roll on this, and I, I think he's right. There are serious problems here. This is not the neat picture that other Egyptologists like to, to portray. Uh, so I think he's got a point. Now, the, the short version here is that you have missing names in king lists. There are gaps in the king lists for TIP chronology and, and other other issues as well. So if you look at it the way Roll looks at it, you can compress the third intermediate period by a couple hundred years. Now, that means when you compress that period, all the rest of Egyptian history compresses with it. The, the timeline shifts forward in this case, since the third intermediate period is a late period. And if you do that, then the synchronisms between Egyptian history and biblical stuff change. Because you're moving the timeline. For anybody who's seen patterns of evidence, they try graphically to illustrate this. And I think do a, a pretty nice job of it visually. But, but if you compress the chronology, everything shifts. And this is what Roll is, is essentially arguing. Now, people who don't like Roll would say, well, you can't do that because there's a clear synchronism between one of those pharaohs in the third intermediate period, Pharaoh Sheshonk. And a biblical reference to Pharaoh Shishak during the time of Rehoboam. So you can't just shift things. We have a secure anchor. Well, that's not really the case. <laughs> uh, one of the Bimson articles in the protected folder will show you in excruciating detail why the military campaigns of Sheshonk do not align in fundamental ways with the invasion of Shishak described in the Bible. They're, they're markedly different. Um, you know, just by way of a few examples, you've got, you know, in, in, in the biblical account, Shishak and Jeroboam, the king of the north, were allies. But in the Egyptian account, Sheshak attacks the northern kingdom and doesn't attack Jerusalem. But in the biblical account, Shishak attacks Jerusalem. I mean, th these are just fundamental disconnections between the military campaign stories of, in Egypt, Shashank, and in the Bible, Shishak. People have sort of just assumed these are the same guys because their names are kind of similar. But when you actually look at the descriptions of what, you know, happened with Shishak's invasion and Shashank's invasion, th they are just... I want to say miles apart. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but there they are significant differences that really just can't be reconciled. And so if you don't have that synchronism, and that's really the, the only quote-unquote secure one you have where the Bible overlaps with the third intermediate period, then you can shift the, the Egyptian chronology all you want. 
again, you know, again, within the bounds of evidence. And this is what Roll does. He, he shifts it, he compresses it, and that moves the timeline, which then, in turn, produces other synchronisms that today Egyptologists and biblical scholars don't see there because they're still playing with the old timeline. So you have Egyptian texts that seem to talk about the plagues. You know, you have Egyptian texts that seem to correlate, you know, with certain parts of the Exodus story. And nowadays people say, well, that, no, that, that we can't use that as evidence because it's 200 years, you know, too early or 200 years, this or that. But if you compress the timeline, then they line up. And so this is Roll's argument. Again, this is very broad brush stroke. If you want the nuts and bolts details, please subscribe to the newsletter. You can just read all that to your heart's content uh, and just get lost again in the vortex of ancient chronology. But, you know, my uh, personal opinion is there really are problems on the Egyptian side with this. And, and I just don't know how you surmount the disconnections between the Shesh, Sheshank and Shishak problem. I mean, for Egyptologists, it's easy. Well, the Bible's wrong. The Bible just got the details all screwed up. You know, and for some biblical scholars, that's where they go too. You know, it either, again, they have no qualms with trying to figure this out because they, they want the synchronism. They need the synchronism to sort of make the picture what it is, regardless of their confessional commitment or lack thereof to any sort of sense of inspiration and biblical historicity and coherence. Uh, for, for those of us that we, that's just not, you know, like the first default position, oh, the Bible screwed up. And, and Roll, I mean, I don't think Roll is a Christian or anything like that, but Roll doesn't like arguments like that. And good for him because they're cheesy. You know, they, they cheat. They take the easy path. And, and he's taken a real close look at TIP, Third Intermediate Period Chronology. And, and I think he's right. I think, I think there really are problems. The problems need fixing. Now, my disagreements with Roll are going to be because Roll, quote unquote, fixes this problem, then he wants to try to, to fix ancient chronology problems everywhere. And not just the Near East, but like everywhere all over the Mediterranean to have like one coherent system. And, and he winds up pressing the case too far in a number of respects. And he says goofy things. He says some truly goofy things. And, and I, that's really unfortunate because it makes him an easy target. Uh, it, it, it becomes a convenient thing to say, well, look at the silly thing he said over there. I'm not going to, you know, I, I, I don't have any reason now to listen to him when he talks about the Exodus chronology. That's just really unfortunate because just because he might, you know, do something that's just sort of a little weird or a little wild or, you know, doesn't really work well in one area doesn't mean that he's wrong everywhere else. But that's kind of how the mainstream looks at role. So it's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. Nick wants to know if there is still potential for us to sin in the new heaven, new earth. Well, you know, I've said this before, since, since our glorification doesn't mean that we become God or become Jesus, then we can't say that we, that we are clones 100% of them and possess with exhaustive completeness their perfect nature. So that still means we're lesser, even though we're glorified. So. In theory, and this is the way I always put it, in theory, that means, well, sure, we could, you know, we could have a hiccup. You know, we, we, could, you know, we, we could commit some flaw or some wrong or something like that. You know, I, I'm only led to say that because we don't become Yahweh. There is only one uncreated creator. I mean, you, we don't become him. We don't become Jesus as though we are Jesus. But we do become as close, as, as, as like Jesus as we can possibly get. So you can say that we still aren't God, and therefore, you know, we, we aren't ontologically 100% the same. We don't have 100%, you know, God's nature and, and the nature of Jesus. So we're still lesser, and yes, that means that there's a, a possibility of rebellion. You can say that, but possibilities are not probabilities in any really meaningful sense in, in this case. Now, uh, I would illustrate it this way. It's possible like I've said on Coast to Coast AM in a number of, of settings, it's possible, you know, that, that I could be the next American Idol, that I could be president, that I could win an Academy Award, that I could win a Nobel Prize. All those things are possible, but they ain't going to happen. 
Okay. <laughs> They're just not going to happen. The possibility is so infinitesimal that it's basically meaningless. And that's what we've got going on here. Ken asks, if salvation in the Bible is strictly loyalty to Yahweh, are modern believers of Judaism with loyalty to Yahweh saved while not embracing Jesus as the Messiah? No, they're not. Uh, to refuse Jesus is to reject Yahweh incarnate and to reject the plan of salvation that Yahweh came up with. So if you reject Jesus, you are rejecting the plan of Yahweh, the wisdom of Yahweh, and saying you, you got something better, or you like the old plan, you know, which, by the way, wasn't works to begin with. But you don't get to make the rules. You don't get to prefer one thing over the other when Yahweh says, this is my plan, this is the way of salvation. You can't reject his plan and be saved. You don't get to swap something else in. If you could, that sort of makes all the preaching of the apostles meaningless and kind of dumb, you know, really, really just pointless, hopelessly self contradictory. So, no, this is what Yahweh decided. Yahweh, again, came as a man in Jesus Christ, died on the cross, rose again, ascended to the, to the right hand of the Father, and all that stuff that the New Testament, including, of course, the book of Hebrews, talks about. And if you think that you can just sort of trade that in for something else and, and, and say that, that you're still being loyalty, you're being loyal, you know, I'm, I'm, Lord, I'm rejecting the plan that you've given me, but I'm still loyal to you. That's just not coherent. Our next question is from A. Shep WB. In the Acts podcast, Dr. <laughs> Heiser said that idols were thought of as a house or dwelling place for those particular gods they were fashioned after. In Zechariah eleven seventeen, it says, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean, dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. What is this verse trying to say in regard to idle shepherd? With my new understanding of what an idol is, it almost sounds like the idle shepherd will be indwelt by one of the divine council. Yeah, that... You know, the, the text really doesn't mean anything like that. There, there's, a, there's a translation problem here. Idle shepherd is uh, apparently, well, it's, it's not apparently, it is the King James translation, which is pretty awkward and I would say pretty poor uh, in this instance. Now, I, I look, I've looked at the new King James, and the new King James actually doesn't have what the uh, – the regular King James uh, has for here. The new King James is like basically every other translation and they'll, they'll translate the Hebrew word uh, as worthless or something like that. So the, the word translated idle in, in the, the question in, in the reading of Zechariah eleven seventeen that was in the question. Uh, and, you know, again, is reflected in the King James, that Hebrew word is allele and that term can be used and is used elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible for something that is weak or feckless or defective or useless or vain or worthless. For example, Job 13.4, uh, let's just read that passage just to give you one example. There are others. As for you, you whitewash with lies, worthless physicians are you all. So worthless physicians, the word worthless there is allele. So again, it has this idea of uselessness. And, and think about the context, Job 13.4. Again, it's not talking about idols that are masquerading as physicians or divine council members that are sort of possessing or inhabiting physicians. It's not talking about anything like that. It's about physicians were useless in helping Job. They, they were worthless. They were, they were defective. They couldn't help him. They were totally ineffectual. And so that's what's going on in the Zechariah passage. A shepherd that deserts the flock is by definition useless because he's not doing the job of a shepherd. He's abandoning the job of the shepherd, so he is useless. So I don't think this has anything to do with the divine counsel.